like a, a lightish red. And welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And, uh, yeah, we're here live for To Kill a DJ. For the next six hours. Yep. Move that closer. <laughs> and, yeah, we're going to be here for all six hours of gaming news. Everything you care about tech-wise. And why not a puppy? That's right. We're giving away a puppy. No, we're not. <laughs> On Nerd we Talk, had a we puppy. find a way to dispose of a puppy. If we had a puppy, don't you think I would be keeping it? All right, then. So, yes, it's our annual To Kill a DJ show. Oh, Pixie's here to tell you annual, everything I don't that know. means. Uh, so, To Kill a DJ is a charity thing that we here at WLRA Radio do um, twice a year, raising funds for uh, Hope Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. It's a great cause that um, helps provide for the families of uh, kids who are sick and in need. Uh, up in, was it Willowbrook? Up in the Chicagoland area. And it's pretty great. We uh, we do some pretty good fundraising out here. Um, so, much like how marathon runners will take funds for however many miles they run for charity, we, uh, we do a similar thing for however many hours that we're on the air. And so we'll be on the air for six hours, starting now, this will until be the first 6 p.m. tonight central. This will be the first time that we've managed to do one of these that isn't either silly early in the morning or silly late at night. Sure, silly. That's the word you used this morning. Well, I'm going to get bleeped if I use the other ones. Yes. Yes, you will. Uh, and also hit in the head with something blunt. I'm not, I'm not used to being back on the radio. So if you hear a sudden drop out of the sound, you'll probably know what happened. Yeah, where's that dump button? <laughs> <laughs> We're preemptively preparing for these things. Moving on. Preemptively preparing for you to be an idiot. Well, yeah, that's why you invite me on these things. Oh, yeah, I suppose. And I'm the only one silly enough to drive up for this. Everyone else is doing social obligations and having a life. <laughs> Tuesday's my day off. This is my weekend. So We're here for radio stuff. If you ask him if he's doing anything later, the answer is probably not. I'm fully planning on drinking later. Can I join you? Probably. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Tune in for a much more interesting show, the Nerd Talk After Hours podcast. Man, we should totally record that. Right? I've got my recorder in my pocket. If, we've got enough bat if I've got enough batteries, we could totally make this a thing. So now, non-making this up, tune in later for the Nerd Talk After Hours podcast, available on our website. W uh, sorry, um, at nerdtalkshow.com. Uh, if you don't want to sit here for the whole six hours and listen to us yammer on, uh, that's also the place where you will go to find pre -recorded, the pre-recorded um, final version uh, once we've taken this through post. and Right, the version that someone actually bothered to edit. Uh, yeah, once we remove, like, our little PSA commercial breaks and stuff. Our musical choices, which I fully intended. Or your musical choices. Audience. If you'd like to call in, say hi, make a music request, uh, you can give us a dial over here at 815-836-5000. And I will totally pick up the phone. And you can say hi. We're not playing And Kanye if you promise you. not to swear, I'll even put you on the radio. But no Kanye. Nope. Not a thing. I suppose the uh, blank deadpan stare doesn't gag doesn't really work on radio. Nope. No, it does not. So yes, continuing. Um, what do we have coming up on the show today? Well, we actually managed to play through a relatively still relevant game. Um, I finished Tomb Raider. That's less relevant since the last show. Yeah, uh, but we skipped a show last week. It's true, we did. Um, because we were kind of working on this new Relevant game that we're going to be talking about. Yeah, uh, coming up in the next hour, we're going to be reviewing Bioshock Infinite, which... Yep. Everybody here at Nerd Talk has played, but nobody is here for You might have noticed it's back to the dynamic duo of Pixie and Sen today, because Snake is sick and Pyro has work and school obligations. It so. always comes back to the reliable one. <laughs> You reliable? I just have nothing else going on. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's not like you're smart or funny it's, or interesting. No, you're just not at all. I'm just steadfast. I'm convenient. <laughs> you're just available. Reliable wins in the end. <laughs> you're just available. You're just kind of there. Sound guy who knows everything and buys us all equipment. Never around when you need them. 
other reliable funny guy in uh, Indianapolis. Sick. <laughs> Sick from caring for his mother. Ha ah, ha. Nope. Goes with the guy who works an easy job and happens to have weekends on Tuesday and Wednesday. And so I was like, well, I don't have class at this time. Hey, you want to show up and be us on the radio for like six hours? You're not doing anything with your day other than, you know, scratching your junk, right? <laughs> yep. Contemplating putting on pants. Takes hours. Well, you have to choose pants. I know the, like, leather doesn't breathe, but... Yeah, I hate to tell you, being a male, the choice is either shorts or jeans. Hmm, which do I wear for my casual day off? Doesn't take long. <laughs> the problem is being motivated enough to put them on. All right, then. Nerd Talk, where we discuss pants habits of the average male. And by average, you mean you? Yep, I'm very average, to me. Yep. So, yes, um... So I guess we're on to uh, what have we been working on lately? Well, um, I've been arranging for travel. Uh, yeah, it's kind of big, isn't it? Five of us are going to be going to Las Vegas. Uh, Paul, who you might remember, was on with me and Pyrosim last December for our review of the Hobbit movie. Um, Paul will be there. Pyrosim will be there. Snake will be there. You, Sen, will be there. And I will be there. And we're all going to be in Las Vegas um, starting this weekend for NAB show for the National Association of Broadcasters Convention. Uh, but if anybody wants to do a Nerd Talk meetup, we'll do that. Tis a thing. Yeah, I think I think you said you would buy a, a beverage yeah. for... Flat out said, if anyone walks up to me while I'm in Las Vegas walking the strip and is like, Hey, I listen to Nerd Talk. I'm a fan. I will buy you a drink. Like, I am not kidding at all. There, There is no irony in that statement. I promise I will not try to weasel my way out of that. I will buy you a drink if you walk up to me and identify yourself as a Nerd Talk listener. People that, listen to WLRA, you don't count. Really? Why I'm would sure they not that, count? I'm sure there's people sitting in the lobby right now who are going to Vegas who are like, I'll just find him there. But if they listen to this show, that means they're listening right now. They count as listeners. I, I guess. But you have to show me some cred that you've listened to old nerd talks. Um, first review. If you can tell me the first game we reviewed, you're good to go. Oh, I'll give you a hint. It contains this soundbite. Mommy! Why did, why did the soundboard come up? No. Because I have the power. Uh, I'm regretting this decision already. I had queued that up for when we came back from our next break, but I'm so glad the opportunity uh, cropped up right now. Yeah, if you can identify yourself as a Nerd Talk listener, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> That's funny. So then, uh, so what have you been doing lately? Um, Let's see. Lately, gaming-wise, I've been back on Mass Effect 3, which has been a thing. Uh, I know we talked about the uh, the recent Citadel DLC that we reviewed uh, over the course of two sessions in previous weeks. But actually, I've been playing the multiplayer lately. I've been Yay. having a lot of fun with that. Uh, still haven't unlocked a lot of things that I wanted, but I think that's part of the point. Yeah, it, to keep you playing. <clears throat> yep, it, it is rehearsed masochism. But uh, totally unlocked the Geth Juggernaut class. Which, which you love and is so broken. It is the only actual tank class that has appeared in that game. And it's and beautiful in that the a bunch of the enemy classes that can instantly kill you, like, say, the Banshee, you can just stand in front of and they do nothing. Yeah, Banshees, Brutes, Praetorians, none of them can insta-kill the... Uh, the juggernaut. So you just stand the in front of The downsides being you can't get behind cover. I can't take cover. you cannot I run. I can't run, which is hilarious because when the objectives that are like, yeah, go to this end of the map and uh, grab this thing. All right, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> <clears throat> like when it's extraction, I have to start walking towards the point immediately when the two and a half minute timer is called. Otherwise, there's a good chance I can't make it <clears throat> if I'm on the far side of the map. But yeah, it, it seems to have helped our group dynamic that you've got one guy who can just walk up to the big enemies, uh, gain their attention, and then just stand there getting mauled by them while I drain their health. 
that seems to have worked out for what we're doing, especially w- with someone who plays as a, as a biotic, someone who needs the enemies in a fixed position to leech from them. Mm. Like it's definitely improving. Um, I've noticed it's not the most popular class online. Like I run into them occasionally, but overall, I still see a lot more uh, vanguards than I do these juggernauts. Yeah, no, I uh, I definitely appreciate having you around to tank because I play as the much squishier biotic classes, which yeah, having a wall to just I cannot go. take a hit at all. I you, was just like, I can give you shield bubbles and I can like incapacitate the enemies and do crowd control, but well, old Mass Effect was kind of oh no, the Banshee is coming, we're all going to die. New Mass Effect is oh look, the Banshee's coming, but Sen's now standing in front of it. While it can't actually hurt him and we're fine. And it's just like, I'll just run around here and shoot her in the face. <laughs> we'll just wait until he picks Seems it Seems like up. a pretty good strategy. <laughs> right. It, it's definitely more effective now that there is a tank class in the game. I'm kind of hoping that they add more uber classes for the, the other types. Like, I would love to see the uber vanguard. Mm-hmm. No, I, I definitely think Mass Effect got what it deserved for its multiplayer. like I th- We're still playing it more than a year after that game came out. Yeah, so. and we're confirmed that the DLC is over now. Yep. Like, that was the end of it. They're done with the events. We we caught the last major event of the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say it had a great run. Yeah. No, I still like playing it when we can get, like, group, groups of people together. I really, really, really hate playing with pickup groups. Yeah, I can agree with that. Just, like, there there should be a way to just permanently disable the game so that you never have to hear a random person's microphone. Like, you can manually go in and always turn off other people's microphones. I just want that to be default on. I want to have to actually decide I want to hear what a person has to say before I, or when the game starts. Oh, it's not only that, but, like, the differences in skill level, and it's a lot easier to coordinate when we're all, like, on the same page. But, right. um... Uh, running four of the same class doesn't work well. Exactly. And everybody wants to play what they want to play as, where it's like, I could go with this or this, depending on what's needed to fill the role. Mm-hmm. Type of thing. Yeah, I- I was enjoying it. I, I liked my return to the Mass Effect universe, and I'm likewise having fun in the single player. I'm more motivated now to do a full run-through of all three games, specifically as a female engineer, which, according to the recent infogram that they released during uh, during PAX, not only was Male Shepard more popular by roughly 30%, I think was the final statistic. I'm going to see if I can pull this up really quick. Uh, typing on the microphone. Just, you know, you can turn off your mic while you're doing that. Well, I meant typing while we've got airspace going on. Ah, well, geez. Here we go. Found it. The Mass Effect 3 infogram. 82% of players played as Manship. 18% females. Uh, Default Manship, isn't it? No, it it doesn't say whether you customize them or not because they couldn't get that data. But uh, the data that they could get was who was playing male versus female. But well, I suppose by necessity the male one is default. So yeah, it, they were that. they were running background readers on the game. Like that's something you had to agree to. It was mm-hmm. in the options menu whether you could share data with EA. But uh, those who did, yeah. But you also can't like get the like bonus stuff for participating in the multiplayer challenges if you right. don't. Right. This so. is kind of sad. Sixty-four hmm. percent of players did not get to meet Rex in Mass Effect Three. Over half of the players did not have Rex in their game. That's a big deal in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they got. Um his brother. Yep. Uh, let's see. Liara was the most popular squad mate at 24%. Second being Garrus. Third, Vega. That's kind of surprising. Uh, next, Edie, then Tali, and then in the last two slots, Ashley and Caden. Which, geez, Caden was only 1.5%. I guess people really didn't like Caden. 
I think most people killed Caden in one. Yeah, that's probably a thing. Guilty. Um, 58% of players let Garrus win in your little shooting contest. I guess you being the opposite one. Or was it Pyro? No, Pyro didn't. Pyro was just like, no, I'm better at this. Um, and the I think this statistic we already knew, the most used single-player classes, by far, 43%, the soldier. A lot of you people just apparently wanted to shoot things. Uh, more like a lot of people couldn't be bothered to change any of the default settings. Well, that too. Um, yeah, the soldier, the most common played class. I'll let you guess, what was the least common class? Are you just pulling up the infogram? Now you're cheating. No, I'm not, actually. Oh. I'm chatting with our fans on Facebook. We have fans? Remember? You silly people. <laughs> Someone's been listening to you for the last four years, I guess. Right? Silly people. Um, so yeah, most, the, sorry, the least common played class in the game... The engineer. I was. Uh, were, I thought I was supposed to guess. guess. <laughs> no, I decided not to. The engineer. Uh, that was totally going to be my guess, though. I'm and her lying. wonderful friend, Phil. The drone. Phil the drone. He names his drones. I do, because they're handy. It's good to be able to say, Phil is off taking out dudes on the far side of the map, rather than my pet drone. You could just say drone. It's nope. takes as much effort, really. I prefer to give him a little personality. Because sometimes and he does I, better than my teammates. And then I have him to blame for stealing my kills. Phil does steal a lot of kills. Like, he's just good at that. And yes, the, the final statistic I'm going to go over, the... Uh, by the way, uh, Snake wanted to let you know he is listening. Cool. I assumed he was going to. He told me to tell you to watch your mouth. I've said worse. <laughs> I, I can always make that excuse. True, but I don't think you're going to top yourself from this morning, which shall not be repeated. <laughs> Nerd talk and their fan. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. We've got to have some fans besides, like, my dad. We used to have a listener in Egypt, but then he came back. It's true. So yes, the final statistic I'm going to share, the number of shepherds who followed the Paragon path versus the Renegade path. A lot of you guys apparently uh, goody two-shoes because 64.5% of players ran Paragon rather than Renegade. But those Renegade choices were so much more satisfying. Like every time that little red star came up, I'm like, oh, something good's going to happen. The prompts are great. The dialogue responses are not. Yeah, the dialogue responses are just, oh, Shepard's being a jerk again. Hmm. See, this is funny. Your university's web blocker blocked the website that the image came from, didn't block the image itself, which I'm currently looking at. Way Must to go, be programmers. hosted somewhere else that isn't blocked. Way to go. Moving on. But I am trying to find... There we go. Publish so one. yes. Been playing tons of Mass Effect, having a wonderful time lately. Uh, other thing I've been working on, I started a new Skyrim game. Oh? Yep. Got bored enough to Tripping run some... the Wayback Machine? Got bored enough to run some Skyrim and realized I've been playing that game wrong. Oh? So previously when I loaded up Skyrim... I was expecting... How does one play it wrong? Well, I had been expecting to be run through a very solid story from start to finish. Kind of like you would get from a standard non-sandbox role-playing game, or from the game we're going to be talking about later. Like, whereas uh, Infinite ran you through a very controlled story with set events, Skyrim didn't have that, and so I felt I was just thrown into this world with no real... Direction. Yeah, no direction, and so I'd get bored after like an hour or so and not come back to it. Welcome to my experience with every Elder Scrolls game ever. But then I realized, this is a role-playing game, in, in the deepest sense of the word. 
your job is to create a character and then play that character's life. So you're asking yourself, what would this character want to do? What's the motivation for this character? Where would My they character would want to throw cabbages at the preacher. And oddly, you can do that. You yes, can totally I, I do know, that. I was making a reference to an Achievement Hunter video. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Um, my character, for instance, the, the new character I created was a dark elf uh, magic-focused character. Well, this character heard about the college in, uh, in Winterfell. Of course she's going to want to go there. More magic. And that's what I did. So the first step of my adventure was... Well, so you're not treating it like a tabletop, like yeah, D&D style that's exactly thing. what I'm doing. I'm treating it like it's a role-playing game session where my and character like, has her own Our listeners are like a thousand faces meeting palms. Yeah, I mean, that's... Of just, uh, how did it take you this long? Because it's not the experience I thought it was going to be. Mm. You know, I, I wanted to be... At the time, I, I wanted to be I think maybe there should adventure. be some kind of, like, tutorial thing to kind of prod you in that direction. Yeah, that this is your character's life, you should be thinking about that. Yeah, because I was expecting a more lead narrative as well. And it's not in any way. Skyrim's just like, have fun. Like, after the first, like, little tutorial mission thing. And then I'm just like, I don't really know what to be doing. It's here's the world. Do what you want. So, like, my character has this grand story about she showed up on the doorsteps of the Mage College and was accepted into uh, studying there and ended up over the course of a month or so saved the college and became the new uh, archmage of uh, Skyrim. Bit fast for a month to go from student to, to archmage, but but yeah, that that's a really great story and could have been a, a game in and of itself. I mean, it, it feels kind of wrong that, oh, you're on this grand quest to save Skyrim. No, nah, I'm going to go to school. But but the uh, the oh el- please while you're DMing your player characters get distracted by weird stuff all the time. Well, yeah, you had Rengrave. Rengrave forcibly sent you on side quests. Mm. Where are you doing? I'm taking the ship and doing this, but we're on it. Yes, we're the player characters. I don't care. I'm Rengrave. Ah, uh, that character will never die. No, I think you're going to be doing drunken impressions of that sky pirate all over Vegas. I'm going to need a hat. This is why he doesn't have a girlfriend, ladies and gentlemen. No, there are lots of reasons for that. (laughs) Most of which include my own sanity. (laughs) Moving on. Because you impersonate a drunken sky pirate. Never mind. (laughs) Life is good, people. Life is good. Sure. Let's, Moving on. let's go with that. What are we moving on to? What have you been working on? Um, well, I I just finished Bioshock. Yep. Was it yesterday? Day before? Day before. Day before. Your 360 decided to die after that. I was building up to the story. Way to deliver the punchline in the middle of the joke. Steel and Thunder since 2008. My co-host is a jerk. Anyhow. Yep. So I I finished Bioshock and I was like, okay, I didn't need another game to play after that. I'm going to play some Borderlands 2. Um, my controller isn't being very responsive and I'm like, well, it's not giving me the thing like it needs batteries. I'm, I'm rebooting stuff, rebooting stuff. And all of a sudden, um, you know, I, I get to playing Borderlands 2 and uh, game starts freezing. I'm like, ah, great. This is stuck. Guess I'll reboot it. Restart it. And Red Ring of Death. So this is the second time this specific console has Red Ringed on me. I had sent it out to Microsoft to be fixed once already. I bought the thing refurbished uh, at a retail store in 2007. So it is... Well, actually, this month it will be... It will have come into my possession six years ago. As of like a week from today. All right then. That sounds like you got a good lifetime out of it. I think somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. But um. So yeah, that's uh that's a little bit sad, but I'm like, well at this rate, it's gonna keep breaking on me every like two years or so. I might as well just get a different one. 
So I think a friend is going to give me theirs because they had upgraded to the slim and still have their old bulkier unit lying around. Fair enough. So yeah, I am without an Xbox 360 at the moment. Unless someone wants to send me one. <laughs> I don't think my fans are that uh, have that much disposable income. Or like me that much. Dear Rich Fan, would you like to hire your own personal podcast? If so, please contact us. Nerdtalkshow.com. We'll, we'll do business. I have no idea what that means. Yeah, why not? I've made uh, I've made some PSAs in my day. I could I could probably do commercials. It's the same same vein. Stop offering them services. We just want them to give us money. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> you strange, strange if, little man. If you sound too useful, they're going to want stuff. Anywho, so. I was going to be playing more of The Walking Dead because it was, I don't know, is it still on sale? It was the last time I checked before, pro shortly before my console died. But, um, I had... How many chapters did you actually make it through? I got through all of episode one, which was free. Okay. And then episodes two through five, is it? Um... Episodes two through five are all fifty percent off, and so I managed to buy all of those for like ten bucks. And so I was like, "This thing won Game of the Year last year. I'd give it a shot." And it's pretty intense. All right then. It's a pretty intense narrative. So I didn't want to, you know, be playing a downer immediately after uh, finishing Bioshock Infinite. So I went to my. Borderlands 2 game, because I figured that's, you know, a light little playful romp. <laughs> with with zombies? Playful romp with zombies and psychos and everything else in gaming? Like, playful romp doesn't describe our gaming habits very well. Borderlands is pretty playful, I would say. There are people with meat cleavers trying to forcibly remove your face and who will, in fact, talk to you about it as they try. Yeah. Looking at you, psychos. Yeah, that's a thing. Just checking. Well, I would I would say more so uh, Saints Row would fit the description of that. But, um... Yeah, no. I, I'd, I'd say that's probably the most lighthearted thing I had on my console at the time. I didn't have Ilo Milo installed, really, so... No, we that that I believe was installed on my on my 360. Interesting little thing that it was. I, I think it was meant for a much younger audience than us. Potentially, but yeah. Dude, you have a cough button. You could use that instead of yawning directly into the microphone. Is there a yawn button? Cough isn't descriptive enough. That's what it's there for. <laughs> we get a nice new soundboard and you just totally shun all of the fancy new features. Got this for you. Where's the wheel button? I need to push it. <laughs> it's right there next to the solution hammer button, which I'm about to put through your forehead. We didn't grab it. It's probably still in the office. Because, you know, most normal offices keep hammers in the drawer. You can with the amount of construction this place does. It's true. Basically, stuff is under construction all the bloody time. I'm kind of surprised that, like, student construction isn't one of your required classes. You spend a semester helping the university build stuff. But then they'd be out of jobs, I suppose. No, no, then they could just complain that the students took their jobs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. This is, you just restated exactly what I said. Were you listening at all? No. <laughs> I give you a computer in here, and then you use it to surf the internet and ignore me while we're on the air. Actually, I'm using this as one of my rare times to actually update my uh, Facebook stuff, because I rarely ever log into this thing. And so I'm trying to figure out how to reset my uh, my privacy settings. Not that 
critical or anything. But yes. So, I guess we can get into what we are looking forward to for our uh, upcoming trip. NAB 2013. It's 2013, right? Yes, that is yes. the year. Woo! Did you forget what year it was just I now? I don't pay attention most times. You don't pay attention to the new year? Only when I'm, like, filling out bank deposits. Sigh. Anyhow. So, what are we planning on doing when we get to Vegas? Other well, than obviously attending the convention. There's going to be lots of parties that we have admission to. Maybe I'll actually go to those instead of napping. Yeah, maybe we'll get to one of those parties this year. Like, the Sony party looks pretty cool. Just saying. Uh, there's one sponsored by HP. There's, yeah. A printing party. HP makes computers, too. I'm not sure if you're aware. That's right. Hmm. I wonder if there's a door prize. I could use a new one. And commence face meeting palm. What? Swag bag? Here's a computer. It's a very large swag bag. And you'd just be like carrying it like uh, the entire walk back down the strip. I'd be more like on, I'd be more like looking for so a pawn far, shop. We are staying is so far away from like the actual like civilized and fun parts of the strip. Well, yeah, that was the point. We're staying in possibly one of the worst hotels imaginable. The one that last year, I quote, we needed a new room because our previous one smelled like illicit substances. Not that you should know what those smell like. No, you can probably guess what those smell like. But yes. No, no, no. It's not the worst possible hotel. We didn't stay at the Excalibur. You're right. That place looked really trashy. I'm the just saying. Ho- the hotel where if it burned to the ground would probably be doing a service to humanity. We walked through there and we're like, this is kind of gross. I actually feel better about where we're staying. Right. I, there was a distinct film of terrible taste that just got left on you for walking through the Excalibur. Also, that great big billboard for, with that guy's hairy gut while he ate a taco didn't really turn no, me on No, he was place. eating a burger. He had the word taco printed on his shirt. Oh, sorry. My bad. I must have repressed the memory. Come on back. Let that flow on in. You making fun of my accent? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. But yeah, that the the silliness of Vegas, like, there's some distinctly nice parts, like walking through the malls attached to some of the casinos. Really spectacular. Gotta say, the, uh, the, uh, the mechanical person display that they had between the, um, the Greek-themed casinos. The, like, the Chuck E. Cheese with the Greek gods oh, thing gosh, that they did. Yes. Oh, um, my. Wow. That... That Shoot, was what was the name of that one? Undescribably bad. I'm gonna have to look this up now. Do do we have to? Well, moving on. But yeah, there. Some of the malls were incredibly nice. Like Caesar Palace. That was what I, it was. I can honestly say I've never tried on a single article of clothing that was worth more than every car I've ever owned put together. I, I, I recall putting this thing on and asking the, the sales clerk, who didn't leave my site when I, I was trying this, how much is this item of clothing I'm wearing, this very soft but very paper-thin jacket that I'm trying on? Oh, $11,000. And you were like, I would just put uh, that Nope, down. I specifically just froze in place, not moving, and just like, please take it off of me. I'm worried about tearing it. Well, Pyrus and I just kind of laughed at you. <laughs> yep, just stop moving entirely because if anything happens to this coat, there goes every credit card that I've got mm. to pay for it. And then, like, the credit card companies companies will own your children for, like, the rest of their lives I'm while sorry, you try to pay they for it. They can probably take them. But, yeah, the, I don't know. There were definitely parts of Vegas that were nice. I enjoyed walking through the Aria. 
That was a, a beautiful was casino. Very, yeah, very fancy pants. A couple, a couple of people I know were all like, hey, this is a thing, and it's a similar name as something from Vegas uh, or from uh, Mass Effect. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, we I was already like, tried how did that. you not know that? We already walked through playing the Mass Effect th- uh, theme music. It's true. I did queue up the uh, Presidium theme music on my iPhone at the time. You think you're dorkier than us? We've already dorked that place. We have dorked all over that place. They're going to need to, That like, needs to be a sound... That needs to be a clip. Pyro uh, get on that. Pyro will totally get on that. We have dirt, dorked all over that place. Like, it's probably covered in congealed dork. Because we visited two years ago. I'm just saying, you're going to need something stronger than bleach to get that out. I, I am kind of wishing, though, that we were staying somewhere nicer just for, you know, the pool. Because the pool at the, casino, at the uh, hotel casino we are at is possibly one of the worst places in Vegas. It's very cold. It's To be it fair, it's outdoors ter- and in April, but still. Yeah, it looks terrible. There's, like, you, you think of Vegas pool resort and it's like, yeah, there's fake palm trees and people walking everywhere and bars every like 15 feet nope this place was boarded up barely accessible there's like a cold pool a lukewarm pool and the hot tubs and that is it and the only person we actually ran into out there were a bunch of people swimming in the cold pool and one guy who had apparently been there for like four weeks yeah, he was from L.A. We chatted with him in the hot tub because there was just the one and it was crap for space. So we were just like, well, we want to be here. Guess we're socializing with this dude. Hi, that dude. <laughs> Hi, that dude. If you're actually still listening to us. And not like destitute in Las Vegas in a gutter. <laughs> no, can't argue. That might be a thing. It's Wait. been two years. His luck had to ride out at some point. Uh, it's it's going to be nice to be back, though, because, you know, this time everyone in our group is over the age of 21. Yeah, I think both Pyro and I were underage at the time. You were both. I was the only one uh, of age there, which is why when I actually did go uh, for a drink in Vegas, we had to go to the bar that was in one of the malls so that Pyro could get in. I also recall when we were at our uh, hotel's restaurant, we had to wait an extra 45 minutes to get into the section that allowed minors. Which was mostly children. Yep. Fun meal, wasn't it? It rather wasn't, and also the food was not great. It's the last time I've eaten at one of those. Uh, do we even want to say the name of the restaurant? Like, no, I, we're, I was, we're just actively avoiding this? I'm, I'm avoiding it just because, well, we're planning on being there in a week, and I'd rather not make that a miserable week if this come, comes back to them. You don't want to trash talk the place before we get there? Yes. That's what afterwards is for. Yes. <laughs> we can do a post-show thing about all of the fun adventurous things you know because the last time we we uh went to vegas you walked in the room and went ah, it smells like college in here yeah i remember this and i just had to go downstairs and be like we ordered a non-smoking room because that's how you fix it oh man good times but uh yeah, I don't know. Do we want to try to visit the the local game stores out there again? Uh, that I just distinct- we will I, have access to a vehicle. I distinctly remember good experiences. Here's the question, though: Does said vehicle feature five seats? You know, I think it's a little Ultima. Yeah, I think we're going to be a little bit cramped. There's at least three saying. large people traveling in this thing. I'm going to be squished in the middle of the back seat, aren't yes, I? Yes, you are. <laughs> My knees are going to be, like, right up on that uh, middle Preemptive. armrest. Shotgun. <laughs> That's right, listening world. I'm calling shoddy for the entire trip over the airwaves. Four days in advance. I'm that good. So here's a cool news article while we uh, take a quick break, or at least prepare to. So Saints Row 4, coming out in the near future, Right. Yeah. The direct continuation of the story from Saints Row 2 and 3. 3 being probably one of the most insane games ever released. You know, featured a helicopter-assisted bank robbery in the first five minutes. and Also, yeah, the whole jumping out of falling airplane and, and, and the dodging robbery, cars. The robbery of a of National sky. Guard armory within the first hour. Of which you got to keep all of the toys that you stole during that. Including a, like... 
like satellite calling down missile strike yeah. thing. Satellite assisted missile targeting system, which you got for the entire game. Couldn't find ammo for that thing for like ever though. No, there's probably a reason for that. But Saints Row the uh, Four will feature direct porting of your character from Saints Row Three. Awesome. This is the most brilliant franchise in gaming. I love this franchise so much. It, like, has this special place in my heart. I, I, this is like, I want to have fun and do silly things. This it, is the place to do it. It's like someone took the... the and it's, like, brilliant in, like, how silly it is. Yeah, someone... It's, like, so gone so far into, like, being a farce that it's come right back around to sincerity, and it's kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. It's gone so far into this is stupid that it's come back around into being really smart. Like, I don't know how else to put it. it, it There's that one character who speaks everything in autotune. <laughs> I don't know. I still love the option of doing everything with your character in, in the zombie stupid drum. zombie voice. Yeah. They're just like... <laughs> and yet everyone else is just responding to your character normally. It's just like, just go with it. He's crazy. <laughs> this person is nuts and they have a gun. Just go along with it. Also somehow became the leader of an international organization. And you open Saints Row 4 as the president. president of the United States. Defending the country against an alien invasion. Also, I'm pretty sure we saw somebody get kicked into space in that trailer. Yes, Pierce can now actually kick someone into orbit, as was shown in the opening video of Saints Row 3 as a graphic. Pierce can now do that. You said 3. Yes. The opening of 3 has the really silly ad for the Saints Row energy drink. Ah, right. In which Pierce kicks someone into orbit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he can now actually do that. That's his superpower. It just been chugging those things for so long, or I don't know how your crew got superpowers. But suffice to say, Saints Row Four is looking like potentially the most brilliant game ever made. Willing to call that right now. Like they they just decided to take what would have been another DLC pack for Saints Row Three. It would have just stepped it up and been a little more crazy and went, you know what? We can make a whole game out of this. And that's fantastic. It's brilliant and amazing, and it's going to be a day one purchase for me. Yeah, I'm not going to argue about that. There's already some complaints out that, well, this looks like Saints Row 3.5. Dude, the game came out like People a... People said the same thing about Left 4 Dead 2, and that added a whole bunch to it. So. Yeah, there, there's nothing wrong with taking a good ga- a game that's fine graphically and and just I'm, I'm, I like, redoing the content. I'm getting to the point where it's like, I don't really think that games can look a whole lot better. Like, I don't think it's possible. Like, I think we're reaching that zenith of h- how good the graphics can get, and then, like... We really need to focus on what we really need to be focusing on is the, the, the game industry has been going like graphics, 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 and just pushing everything and dumping all the resources into that. They really ought to be focusing on okay, hiring the best writers, making a strong narrative, making a fun gameplay experience. You know, the, putting things into how the game works rather than how the game looks or what the game says rather than the aesthetics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really I, think that like our technology is advancing to such a point where we really can't do a whole lot better. Yeah, and, and we don't need to. The, the problem that you had with gaming for the longest time was you could not find a way to tell the stories that you wanted with the graphics that you had. We've gotten to the point where you can tell pretty much any story with the graphics that gaming is currently capable of. We can make mm-hmm. photorealistic graphics if you need them. At the same time, there's a lot of great stories that were told with 16-bit graphics. You know, still going to hold Final Fantasy VI, best story ever told in the game. You don't need to advance graphics further than they currently are to tell amazing stories. In the case of Saints Row 3 versus 4, a game series that is, you know, entirely about the gameplay mechanics of Let's just let you do whatever you want, and that'll be fine. 
you don't need new graphics for that. You need an engine that can handle it. And if the Saints Row 3 engine with a few revisions is able to do all this new stuff, why bother updating the graphics if you just want to tell a new story with insane abilities? So yeah, there's that. Oh, you know what else is happening today? And I don't know that I'm going to be able to crank this out in 15 minutes, but we'll try. What's up? Um, Borderlands 2 is getting a big update today. Oh, is that today? Mm Mm-hmm. It's today. With Krieg? Yes. The psycho melee bruiser type. That really doesn't feel right. What? Getting a psycho? Getting a psycho as a playable character because everyone in the Borderlands world is still going to be reacting to you in the exact same way. Mm Mm-hmm. That doesn't really make sense. Is it Craig or Craig or I don't know. I've, I think it's pronounced Craig. I think it's just Craig. Craig the Psycho. It's spelled weird. Anyhow. So, but, yeah. yeah, so there's a new character. Uh, the level cap's getting increased to like 61, I think. Yeah, they're adding a new mode. It's like super true... Yeah, it's like New Game Plus Plus, basically. Yeah, it, they have the or True the Vault Hunter mode like already. like Regen Health and... Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's designed for the people who have finished the game but are like, I want more. More reasons to use my super amped up weapons. Oh, I, I was really satisfied having just finished the game once on my character and just seeing where the story went that I I don't feel the need to revisit on harder difficulties to play essentially the same story with better loot. Uh, I'm not a very good loot hunt player. Yeah, I was, I've still got like a whole bunch of missions I haven't done, so I'm still going back and doing those, but... But I still haven't finished the story, I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you know, I, I look forward to playing what I have, and I don't know. W- would you play, the, have you played the New Game Plus stuff? Or? I, I did about 20 minutes of the true Vault Hunter mode. I, I know that the New Game Plus Plus doesn't, like, make you do any of the tutorial stuff. Yeah, it, like, I, starts you off right away. In I the was a little disappointed when missions. I immediately started off exactly where the normal game started off, because mm-hmm. it's like... I just finished this. Why do I need Claptrap explaining to me how to open doors? Yeah. Like, I've got this. Can can I just go on? Because, like, I really feel like the game actually doesn't start until you hit the first town, uh, Liarsburg. That, that's when the true game kicks off, which is after the first boss, technically. But up until that point, all you're doing is following scripted Claptrap events until you reach Liarsburg. You know, I, that's the first introduction of a major character in, uh, what's his name? The Hunter Guy. Hunter Guy. You gotta give me a little more. The ago. big game hunter. I can't remember his name. Oh, English accent. Yes. Uh, Sir Hammerlock. Yes. The, the introduction of Sir Hammerlock I see as the major start of the game. Mm -hmm. That's where we actually get going because you immediately have multiple quest givers out in areas that, you know, there are multiple things to do on the way before you run back to the quest hub to turn in the quests. That's what actually introduces you to the game. Mm -hmm. So I don't imagine they're going to start there. I think they'll probably actually start the new game plus plus after you destroy uh, Captain Flint. Actually, let me put through. Immediately when you arrive in uh or outside of sanctuary because yeah the ultimate vault hunter upgrade pack is available today so here's some of the changes da 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 uh, you begin on the southern shelf with the cleaning up the Berg mission. So, yeah, no, it starts yeah. you on in uh, Liarsburg. Yeah, because cleaning up the Berg is where you go shoot the bully mongs in the graveyard. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, it that, that's a decent place to start. Mm-hmm. 
Like, I, I don't need to go shoot that giant bully mom. Uh, you can over carry over 500 iridium instead of 99. Sounds kind of pointless as eventually you... Fi- I think you finish upgrading everything before you hit 500 iridium. Let's see. Two more bank storage space upgrades. Wait, which do you use cost. a bank in that game? Yeah. I just sell everything. Oh, because you can, like, move stuff between characters. That's not the bank, though. That's Claptrap's secret stash. There's I, a bank. There's a bank, too. Right. I would want more spaces for the stash, to be honest. True, true. Okay. So, new items on the black market. That explains it. Uh, additional ammo upgrades for each ammo type. They're going to cost 50 iridium each. Two more backpack storage space upgrades, 50 and 100 iridium. Two more bank storage upgrades, 50 and 100 iridium. So, that would be why. Okay bug fixes okay and then if you buy the pack which i won't have to because i have the season's pass which dude season pass ridiculously good deal because now it's turned out to have been a great investment oh yeah because it's like 45 dollars worth of content now and i paid 30 uh how much is the thing on its own Yeah, so it raises the level cap from 50 to 61. And unlocks the uh, this pearlescent colored weapons tier, which is the rarest of our... All of the rare guns. Which, I thought it was already pushing it, because it's like, okay, we got purple, and then we've got pink, and then we've got orange. It's like, it's all men of colors. Eventually, they're going to run, run out of colors for rarities of weapons. It's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at pictures of uh, Craig right now, and I'm just like, what person in their right mind would respond to this guy if he walked into town? Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, this is the kind of person that they would not let through the gates. There are no sane, reasonable people on Pandora, if you remember. It's true. Everyone in that world is crazy. As proven by the fact that the most successful businessman is Marcus. If you're not counting Handsome Jack. I was going to say, he seems, Handsome Jack seems pretty darn successful, but he also, like, murders everyone, so. Yeah, he's usually also not on Pandora. Doesn't he typically stay in that satellite thing? I don't even. Right. Because there's one part in the narrative where he's just like, whoop, I'm here. Yeah, sup, I believe was his quote. I don't know. I know that's Lilith's intro quote. Yeah, Lilith does that, and I think Jack does it, too, the first time you see him, Mm. like, in person. I think there's no real spoilers we can do for Borderlands, so we can probably just announce that it's when he shoots Roland. Just shows up, and then... And then you're just standing there like a lemon, which makes even less sense when there's more than one of you, like when you're playing co op, which that's how Borderlands is meant to be played. And you're all holding large weapons. You're all holding large weapons. Lil is a freaking siren. Like, how does he get the jump on you at that point? Exactly. It kind of should should be able to just kill his face. Yeah. It it kind of should have been Roland Falls and everyone immediately turns guns. Mm hmm. Nope, we need an Act 3, so get on it. And the weird thing is, right afterwards, you start taking missions from Jack. Like, while you're walking through the Iridium To go, waste. like, make sure his grandmother was adequately murdered. And don't forget the one to kill yourself. Oh, yeah, that one, too. Literally just a quest of go jump off did of this and Did you call die. the suicide line, or did you jump? I jumped. See, I kind of want to see what would have happened if you called the help line. Ah, you jumped, too. I also jumped. No, I jumped because it's like, well, I guess if you're giving me iridium that I'll use to kill you later. Yeah. I'll take you making fun of me now. Like, that was so much iridium. I couldn't not. Yeah, I I want this prize. And I'll use it later to hurt you. (laughs) Sounds like a deal to me. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's that. Yep, I believe it is time for us to take our first break. I don't know, what do you want to listen to? stuff <sighs> that's that's not like, I, I know that's the most generic response i could have given okay uh air i want to play this song and then i'm going to turn the auto seg on and we'll be back yep we'll be back shortly 
uh, after these messages on Nerd Talk. Time to nut up or shut up. And we're back. Welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And we're here for Tequila DJ here at uh, WLRA 88.1 FM, The Start, broadcasting out of Lewis University in Romeoville. We're raising funds for Advocate Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. Great cause. Um, you should totally donate. You can go to tinyurl slash Hope Children's Hospital if you want to donate online. Uh, or come find us at the studio. We'll be here till 6 p.m. Central Time tonight. Hour two, the insanity continues. Hour two, the hour two inning. I don't know. The dosening. Hour two, electric boogaloo. <laughs> no. <laughs> there will be no boogieing in this theater at all. By theater, I mean radio station. Radio station, where we actually are. It's true, we are. You have a real microphone in front of you. I'm going to box with it. Hold on. <laughs> Moving I on. I will kill you. You realize I have this thing cranked up to max because you refuse to get close enough. Come here. <laughs> this slider, it is pushed all the way up. Yep. Rare for me is usually I'm getting angrier about things. But hey, this hour we have actual new content. It's true. Rather pertaining than to our usual over duties. Old content. So yes, this hour we will be reviewing Bioshock Infinite. This will be our spoiler-free segment, as next hour we're going to spoil this thing. So if you are at all interested in playing the game and don't want the ending spoiled for you, this hour, totally safe. Next hour, should probably just go buy the game. So, are we good to go? Are we going to do a spoiler cast, or are we just going to do a generic thing this as I was saying, spoiler-free this hour as we okay. just do a straight review of the game. Next hour, spoiltastic. Everything is on the table. Can talk about whatever you want involving the game. All right. You've been warned. Listeners, skip to some point. I don't we know. We are about to spoil Bioshock Infinite. Well, later. Oh. The, this part's safe. Okay, this part's safe. She is you are not only getting this. <laughs> you are only safe for this hour, and then we're going to spoil Bioshock Infinite. I guess safety is relative, really. I suppose you could still not be safe if, like, you're being chased by bears or something. Which, if you're being chased by a bear while listening to this podcast, let me know about it. Send us a message. I may, in fact, buy you a beer. All right, then. Tell me about that time you were uh, being chased by a bear while listening to Nerd Talk. In if Vegas. you survived. I can't imagine we're very good at adrenaline-inducing... Uh, listener. Hey, guy, listening. you should totally run. That bear is chasing you. Oh, my God. There's a bear. You should be going faster. Bet you're regretting not going to the gym. All those times you decided to eat Twinkies instead of going. Yeah, those would have helped you be, you know, less bear friendly. Oh, less bear tasty. I don't yeah. Know. Right now we're saying you're going to make pretty good bear food if you don't keep running. Run faster. We should be recording anti-bear uh, motivational tapes. <laughs> distribute them at conventions here this will save you from a bear or possibly make it worse if you're laughing at us while running <laughs> of course what you know what's not funny the bear that's about to eat you I don't know the bear could be having a great time oh the bear's having a blast <laughs> <laughs> now all I can think about is bear blasting <laughs> a great new sport one that you will have so much energy to do after listening to Nerd Talk. Right? All right, so now that we've wasted enough time on amusing punnages, we're talking about Bioshock Infinite. This was released last week for the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, and for the PC. Which is unusual because the PC usually doesn't get released alongside the other consoles. Nope, but in this case, it's come out of the same. And actually, if you're looking for the best possible graphics out of your game, I've been told go for the PC version. Uh, neither of us did that, though. Nope. We both went for the 360 because, you know what? Until Pixies broke, it's the most reliable of the three systems. I know, I saw you said the three systems because we're ignoring the Wii and the Wii U still. Wait, that's a thing? I thought they were tired of that. Right, whatever. Yeah, it's gone. The Wii U, I mean. We're still... Ah, uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> that someone that bought, joke. Someone somewhere bought one. He's feeling silly as he plays... Uh, what was it? Um, Batman Arkham City looking at his stupid little touchpad to see the map. 
All right, then. It's like we took a gaming system and shoved an iPad into it. Because they did. Because they did. Well, yes, but Nintendo didn't manufacture and sell those, you see. They're selling that thing? <laughs> Thought it was a free upgrade. Moving on. So, yeah, Bioshock Infinite. What can we say about the looks? Um, I think we're definitely getting to the point where the console generation has hit its peak. Like, Bioshock... Peak in inf- what way? As in what they can get away with graphically. Okay, so you're talking about visuals strictly. Yeah, strictly in the visual perspective. It's workable, but at the same time, it it's definitely stylized. Um, there, there's a lot of problems. This, this just may be something I noticed because I have one of the older systems, but, uh, like, when you use the execute moves on enemies, there, there's definitely some problems in the, the animations, the way they occur with the, especially some of the, uh, more graphic executions. Like, the blood spray just doesn't look right on the character models, and the the way the characters ragdoll in the air, I've seen it done a lot better in other games. I mean, it's a minor complaint at best, right? Dude, I didn't. I was not even paying attention. When I kill that dude with my claw, I also didn't claw, use the melee like, all that often, to be fair. Yeah, I used melee a lot. My two primary weapons were up close and personal. In fact, that's what I named them. The pistol was up close and the shotgun was personal. What, you don't name your weapons in games? Sure. Or your turrets? No. I miss Phil. (laughs) Go home and play Mass Effect then. Yeah, I would, but you can't play it with me, so that's the point. Um, Yeah, it's definitely stylized graphics, so like you're not going for photorealism here. You're not going to be like picking out the, the dimples in your character's face. Yeah. At the same time, I'll definitely I think say, it looks freaking amazing, but... It, there, There is a lot of craft in the characters. Um, Elizabeth's dress flows and swishes beautifully as she moves. Um, the outfits change as her the hair, game Her hair as she turns her head, especially later in the game when it's shorter. Yeah, I, I remember, like, Tomb Raider made a huge deal about Lara's hair. Like, mm. there's a new physics engine just for her hair. Okay, Elizabeth's, which is stylized in in the graphics engine of the game, looks better on every occasion. Like, it doesn't need to be photorealistic to look good. It needs to blend well into the style of the game. And Elizabeth does that from start to finish. You know, in the early parts of the game where she's got longer hair that's tied back, it works for her. Later parts where she's chopped her hair and so is wearing a shortcut it flows nicely as she moves around it confused me for a really long time because in all the promotional images and on the like box and stuff elizabeth has that short jaw length bob but when you first run into her she's got this long ponytail that she's got and i was just like this doesn't look right at all so i I was just always like kind of waiting for that moment and it kind of pulled me out of the narrative a little bit right i've got a friend who was actually talking to me about that it seems like a weird complaint to make but so is your thing about blood splatter so yeah blood spatter yeah yeah my my friend was like at some point she's gonna uh get separated from you and come back looking different like why do you say that well because in all the promotional art she's wearing a different outfit and looks older Mm. and i that was the moment where i realized yeah she's not wearing the same clothes that she was Mm. in the the promotional material and her hair's definitely different. And yeah, she does look a little older in all the promotional I don't materials. know about, like, looks older, but... It, it came in the form of being just more beaten up mm. as the game went on. Because, yeah, the character model definitely changes. Mm. But, like, it, it works from an animation set point because throughout the course of the game, Elizabeth even changes in actions, like her animation switch. Mm-hmm. And when you first pick her up in the game... She has very curious and insecure animations, you know. When and then later she's all like arms folded and kind yeah. of standoffish and turning away from you a lot of the time. And then yeah, when a fight cards. breaks out early in the game, she's actually running towards you most of the time to get to cover. And then when she tosses like stuff at you, by the way, companion characters, escort missions, take note. Elizabeth is basically perfect. Yeah, I'm gonna get to that when we get to gameplay because that's a big deal. But it but it looks amazing and it never sticks out like 
terribly. Snake wanted to make sure that we mentioned it. Oh yeah, we'll we'll get to it. Um, I I love the way the characters interact with the world. Like e- Elizabeth is the prime example. When you are walking around the environment, so is she. Mm-hmm. She's not getting in your way, but she is there. And, and she's not like just kind of like standing there twiddling her thumbs either. She's like looking at stuff in the environment. She's interacting stuff. with things. She, she comes up with items for you. So just be like, hey, I found a thing. Here you go. I found money. You got. You want this, right? You've been looking around for this for bloody hours. Yeah, I found some here. Move on. Like. Items that are specifically for her in the game, the lockpicks, she'll tell you if she spots them. Yeah, she'll be like, hey, come pick up this lockpick. I don't know why she can't bend down and pick it up. Yeah, but... why she can't just do it herself. I guess her dress has no pockets. So she wants you yeah, to Yeah, but she it. can't pick it up and hand it to you like she does with all of the other stuff. Right, it's With true. the money and the salts and the health and well, the ammo. When, when you ask her to actually uh, use a lockpick, she produces it from her sleeve before she goes to unlock mm. it. She'll either do a flourish where she just through momentum pops it out of her sleeve or she'll grab it or it was in her hand the whole time but no <laughs> that that's later we'll get to that um so yeah uh combat wise all the guns are satisfying like i i was kind of sad that the guns didn't change aesthetics when you upgrade them like in the first bioshock hmm. like it was very and cool. narrative and gameplay were uh, excuse me now i'm boxing with the microphone <laughs> It was very cool that in the first Bioshock, when you took a basic shotgun and upgraded it, you Mm -hmm. put steampunk parts on the thing. Mm -hmm. Because there's no way to realistically, yeah, I attach this to the gun and it does 25% more damage. That's not a thing you can really gauge like that. But by adding steampunk parts, you can totally science fiction your way out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's something I miss from the, the original Bioshock. But at the same time, all of the guns in this game feel good. They all feel different enough that. And I cycled a through a lot of them because I was working on. I was getting basically all of the achievements for getting kills with the different guns. So yep. I've used them all. Yeah, and and they all feel different. They all have good sound to them. Um, there, there's definitely no gun that you're just like, well, this is pretty much a pop cap. Why would I use this thing? Or this is just a stereotypical blank. Like besides the basic, I pistol think one of my favorites, well, other than the sniper rifle, obviously because I love sniping things. But um, I think the carbine was one of my favorites. Yeah, that and maybe the hand cannon. The hand cannon was just mean. It, it's pretty much yeah. This is the equivalent power of the sniper rifle in a pistol. Have fun. So I, I liked that one a lot. Yeah, by too. the end of the game, that should be pretty much your primary weapon. Mm-hmm. But if you want to play it a little differently, you can. Um, and so you could carry around one weapon that you like forever because um, during combat, Elizabeth will toss you ammunition as yeah, you run she, low. she does it pretty well to keep you stocked. So I never really went, crap, I'm out of ammo in this gun. I cannot use it. I did on, like, one occasion, but that was specifically part where you didn't have Elizabeth with, with you. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the times where I realized I, get, most, I got really sad when they took her away from me because I was like, oh. Yeah, my primary mechanic for doing well is gone. <laughs> so there's that, but there's also like the narrative like being like, I'm kind of sad because I miss her, but... Right. Um, I, I will definitely say the environments in this game are a huge draw. The city of Columbia is gorgeous to look at. Um... The whole, it's a steampunk pseudoscience early turn of the century city in the clouds is amazing. You know, it's got all the old timey buildings. There are uh, phonographs sitting around the city playing pseudo old time music. It's like old timey style. They're like they're covers of more modern music. Yeah. So you mentioned the Cindy Lauper's girls just want to have fun. You found tainted love. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, uh, there's one that plays everybody wants to rule the world, mm-hmm. which is brilliant. I was just like, is that? <laughs> totally is. Yeah. The, the first time I was walking around the city and I'm standing on Battlefi- uh, Battleship Bay, and I'm just hearing an old school phonograph, and I'm like, I know that beat from some. They're playing girls just want to have fun. On a scene where Elizabeth is actually getting out and enjoying herself. Like, that's brilliant. Mm. It's like, that is a great little catch to put in the background of that scene. But, like, at the same time, you'll also hear, like, 
Goodnight Irene and like some other like legit old stuff. Yeah. There's a really beautiful scene where um, Booker picks up a the your protagonist ca- character Booker DeWitt picks up a guitar and starts like plugging at it and Elizabeth starts singing Will the Circle Be Unbroken that was really cute and she mm-hmm. like feeds an orange to like she oh, yeah. like gives an, offers an orange to like some orphan. It's kid. a beautiful scene that was just added to give character to both of them. Yeah, it's just like nobody's shooting anything. Nothing like terribly dramatic is happening right now. It's just like a little break. Yep, Elizabeth's singing, being nice, and Booker is doing the solitary man with the guitar thing. Mm-hmm. Very fitting for both of their characters. I'm. I was hypothesizing earlier what would happen in that scene if you had looted all of the oranges first. Because she grabbed one of them off a shelf, and when it was over, I could loot the remaining oranges. Oranges, which make the same sound as eating a can of beans or eating a carton of cigarettes because it plays the same noise. Booker DeWitt, eater of cigarettes. See, I didn't ever really... See, I was always like... I always had tons of health, but I needed salt more, so I never did the... You never touched those? Yeah, because that was the opposite of what I wanted. It's just something that popped in my head the first time I clicked on one. It's like, why did it make the eating noise when I did that? Just picture Booker standing there eating a pack. <laughs> Delicious. Booker DeWitt, kind of a weird guy. Kind of, he says... Um, yeah, I, I love the sounds of this game. Like, even later when the city is falling apart, mm-hmm. the, the sounds of revolution in the air, mm-hmm. amazing. Like, the giant red banners going out over the city. The, the world itself fundamentally changes between those scenes. And it shows itself in the, in the, the landscape of the game, in the sounds that you hear out in the city. Like, it's not the same place. And you'll hear, like, recurring themes. Like, uh, Will the Circle Be Unbroken gets, like, repeated in, like, background audio a few times. Yeah, it's one of the big themes of the game. Um, Towards the very end, you'll hear it, like, very, very faint, like, off in the distance, you'll mm-hmm. hear. Yeah, the, there's a lot, especially when things start going uh, there's weird There's, like, a in the game. baptism circle that, like, is humming it. Yep. A couple different moments in the game. That's just... Yeah. It should be very obvious to people from the first scene of this game that this game is out to tell a story that happens to have combat in it. It is not a combat game that the story was a second thing that got shoved in, like most modern games it is. Um, so that's it for graphics. Let's, let's talk difficulty for a minute. So obviously this being a game, there are difficulty settings that you can set. Um, I played on normal as mm-hmm. a standard for us. Um, it's the way the creators recommended playing the game. I really don't feel like playing on easy would necessarily take anything away from this game, though. I played it on easy just because yeah. I wanted to blast through the narrative. Yeah, I I don't. But th- I still I still felt I I felt like you know a veritable badass. But I also didn't feel like it was just a cakewalk. Right, you're still definitely playing the game. The only difference is. How dangerous are the enemies? But let's be very clear on something. I don't feel like you, dying more would make me get anything out of it. Well, you can't die in the traditional sense of a game mm. in Bioshock Infinite. It's a lot like the first Bioshock. If you die, you're going to be revived a few feet back, but with the same progress that you made intact. Uh, no, you're you're going to get some health back, but so are the enemies, actually. The enemies yeah, they get a little get back. And you're going to be expected to defeat them, but... It's more of a, hey, try this again. You like, do lose some money, too. Yeah. It, it's not a huge penalty, though. It's not mm-hmm. like a game where, yeah, we're going to completely reset that previous area. It's basically like dying in Borderlands 2. <laughs> hmm Yeah. Only I mean, when you die in Borderlands 2, you get set way it, back physically. Yeah, and I think that fits the narrative of this game, because the point of this game is to get you through the story. I, I don't think the point of this game is, yeah, intense combat scenes. I mean, the combat definitely feels secondary. I don't know. I felt like it was a really good merger of both. Mm. Yeah, I, I wasn't unsatisfied with the gameplay. I I enjoyed the... Like, the combat had narrative reasons to be there, and, like, they just complemented each other really Yeah, well. if there was a fight scene, I didn't feel like, well, the enemies were just standing around waiting for me. Usually it felt like the enemies were doing their thing, and I just happened to show up. 
Mm. And you could hear them talking to each other sometimes before you. Yeah, if they didn't notice you. Pop one. Yeah, it, it was very well done in that, yeah, you are the interloper here. They're, they're, the guards are walking around their usual patrol routes. The, the revolutionists are going about their revolution in the city, and you just happen to show up. Like, at no point did I feel like there were about 50 dudes just standing on the street waiting for me to walk down it. Like, right from the first enemies in the game, they're responding to something you did in the city. And I feel like that's appropriate for this. Like, the, there are actually parts in the game where the game will tell you, you know, you can avoid combat here if you don't feel like fighting. And in fact, it says sometimes it's better to avoid combat. Um, there's a really early segment in the game where you're just walking down a street of the city during this uh, celebration day and you have the option to steal from a shop. No, uh, where the shop runs on the honor system. Well, even before that, when you walk into the first shop of the game, the candy shop, there are people in that shop watching you mm -hmm. and the game gives you the option of stealing. It will well, tell you there are consequences. Yeah, if you do that, the cops will show up and you will have to fight them. Which at that point, all you've got is your little pistol. Spe speaking of, I can't believe we forgot to mention this in the sounds. Did you notice who was voicing Rosalind Lutess? Oh, yes. Uh, Jennifer Hale. Yeah. I didn't get that till way late. Yeah, I, I noticed her pretty early, even with the accent that they gave her. Yeah. I, I felt like, whoosh, that went way over my head. Being as short as I am, though, it's kind of expected. <laughs> no, they, they did a fantastic <laughs> yes, job. Yes, I, too, can make short people jokes. <laughs> it's all right. Some people think you have a reason to live. Not Randy Newman, though. Not a fan. So, yeah. Um, if, if you really feel the need to get more out of the gameplay by cranking up the difficulty, go ahead. But I don't think it's necessary for this game. I, I, I don't feel like making the combat portions harder would improve the experience of playing Bioshock Infinite. So I, I guess we can move on. Um, gameplay. This I thought it was nice of them to offer you an achievement for playing it on easy. Yep. All, all of the... Uh, Each of the difficulty settings is this one or higher. Yeah, it's Tin Soldier for finishing it on mm -hmm. easy, isn't it? Yep. And then I got the, the one for playing it on normal. Um, Gameplay-wise, this is a first-person shooter. At no point do you ever leave the first-person uh, perspective of Booker DeWitt. Mm -hmm. You are in him from start to finish... Um, bow chicka bow wow any of the game's events are handled from his eyes uh, there are no like out of body cutscenes like are pretty common in games these days you're not going to be given like a Metal Gear Solid where here watch the scene for 25 minutes um, in fact I think the longest time I was out of control of my character in this game couldn't have been more than a minute during those scenes when people are talking to you, you're typically able to move around freely. Like, even during major uh, interactions with characters, if your character is not able to move, chances are that's because your character's actual physical body is being held. Mm. And I think that's great. That's the same thing that Half-Life 2 did that I think was handled so well. Um, I th as we already covered, the gunplay, super responsive, very open to interpretation. Um, a lot of the combat scenes in the game have multiple angles you can approach them at. Uh, one of the best mechanics in this game is the terror mechanic, at which point you can decide how you're going to fight the encounter by having Elizabeth open multiple tears in reality that bring in different things to help you. So for instance, if you're uh, on a direct confrontational approach, you can have Elizabeth open up a tear that will have medkits in it. So that you can go refresh your health when you need it. Mm -hmm. Or you can have her open tears that bring in gun turrets or cover if you need it. All kinds of things just around the environment to protect you or help you get through these strategic fight scenes. Uh, also available are the skyhook systems, which are amazingly fun. And you're all like, whoosh! Yeah, so if you don't feel like doing the fight crouching behind a chest high wall as you take cover behind it you can jump up on the sky rails and swing around the map 
Uh, mm-hmm. You can also, like, there's, like, stationary hooks that you can just latch on to and use those to get to, like, higher ground. Yep. Or just kind of chill there and shoot things. You cannot use your Vigors, which are basically plasmids from previous Bioshock games. Yeah. What I thought was really interesting, and I guess we'll talk about that when we get to narrative, was how little direct tie to the previous Bioshocks there was. But mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's pretty clear that Bioshock, much like System Shock before it, mm. the Shock franchise tries to have as little involvement with the previous entry as possible. It is a thematic sequel rather than a true sequel, mm-hmm. which I'm okay with. Um, the reason being you can't use your plasmids or uh, vigors because your other hand is holding the hook. Yeah, so it makes sense. It, it's there for a reason. It's not just, well, we have to weaken this guy while he's hanging in the air. Um... I liked actually doing the the leaping lunge attacks off of the sky hooks. Those are stupid fun. Those those are super fun because your character is whizzing around on the skyline, just seeing the whole area from a from a height, and then you just see an enemy and it like puts a targeting a reticle over him. And it's like sky hook attack. You get to see your character leap at the person with their hook out as you jump at them at high velocities and typically send them flying. It's usually a one hit kill. Unless you do it on the bigger enemies, at which point you're being silly because they'll punch you right out of the air. But yeah, um, so I think now's the time where we get to talk about Elizabeth's role in the game. Uh, Elizabeth basically covers you the entire game. There's a really amusing image macro that I was showing Sen before the show started. It was like, the, it was a picture of Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite, and it had the caption damn escort missions this guy keeps running out of health and ammo and salts and guns <laughs> and that's exactly what she does elizabeth during combat she keeps you stocked on everything she'll like she'll take care of cover the first time you enter into a combat situation once you acquire elizabeth i don't know how else to put it once she joins your party yeah um the, the game will tell you elizabeth can take care of herself you don't need to protect her in combat so she will get behind cover. Best message a game has ever given its players. And so she'll get behind some cover and keep line of sight to you so she can keep throwing you things as she finds them. Yeah. Um, later on in combat situations, there'll be like locations where you can see tears and you can have her open them up. They'll be able to produce things like cover for you to stand behind, hooks to traverse around the map and in, um, automatons or turrets, like little helpful machines to... Yep. Dispatch enemies for you. Yeah. Elizabeth is super great. She's not like your usual NPC where she gets in the way, where she gets kidnapped by the enemies, uh, or she's just a hazard to have in the fight with you. No, she is incredibly useful and great to have around. She, The game figures out how you're fighting and tailors Elizabeth's aid to help you specifically. So, for instance, my character used two things primarily, a shotgun and the electric power. Elizabeth produced two things, salts and shotgun ammo. And she had a habit of producing them right before I ran out of either. Like, it's on a timer. Uh, It's not a fixed timer, but it's there when you need it to help you out. It's entirely possible to not use it. You can you have to specifically hold the uh, the blue X button on the Xbox controller to activate her when she calls out to you that hey I found this. You cannot, but it would be silly and it would be missing half the point of the game. You know, this is an escort mission where the escort saves your life constantly. It's 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 kind of like a who is escorting whom thing, which is the point of that joke. Oh yes. Um, she makes the game better for having her around. And those scenes when she's not there are really more scary because of it. Mm-hmm. It's like, I could run out of ammo with this gun. Where's Elizabeth? Where's my ammo? Where's my salts? You mean I can run out of this stuff? This isn't fair. But yeah, it... This is the best case of an escort quest in a game that I have ever seen. It it is handled extremely well. Elizabeth is great to have around. Like, even when she's not giving you stuff, she points out things. 
different options. You, she can be like, well, we could go over here or we could go over there. Like the the like game guided, like this is where you need to go for the narrative and also the optional paths. Yeah, like we could go check out that bar or, hey, I found this uh, coded message written on a wall. We should probably try to find the code book for that so that I can figure it out. And the cipher. Which there's like four or five of those in the game and they're always worth finding. There's always good stuff in those. Like, they, the game makes it clear that, hey, go find these objectives, and then we'll do the rest. Like, I, I know a lot of games where you'll find a Well, clue. no, because, like, you'll decipher the thing, and then you still have to figure out, okay, that's still a code for something. Yeah, the very it, first one, tip the it, hat to the go box. go find these things. And then you have to go figure out, okay, there's a hat rack over there's here. If rack, I tip I that, there's the a secret rack. room. Yeah. Likewise, the second one is um, set the clock to midnight. And you have to figure out which of the clocks isn't working, and then you set it, and then the wall safe opens up. Mm. Uh, definitely worth doing. So yeah, gameplay-wise, it's a shooter, but if you think it's only a shooter, you're missing the point. Honestly, I shot a whole lot less and used my vigors a whole lot more. Yeah. It's like... I can shoot fireballs from my hands. Why limit myself to guns at that point? Well, whereas my strategy was, I'm going to use this uh, vigor to stun the enemies. Murder of crows? No, the the lightning one, shock mm. jockey. I'm going to shock jockey them. I've got. Oh, because see, I got the upgrade where murder of crows would set another murder of crows trap. trap once the enemy died. Yeah. And so the other guy, I could, I could then use undertow to pull more enemies towards that guy, right onto the trap, and then kill them, and then that'll make another trap for me, and it's like just very loop much endlessly. A game be great. of options. Because where we're, we're specifically talking about just two of the powers, there are eight vigor powers in this game, and you can use them in all kinds of combinations. Right. I I didn't play around <laughs> with like with at least four of the different powers. The later ones that you acquired, the, the ram ability, the undertow ability. I didn't use ram at all. I um, never, undertow is super helpful, though. I never equipped undertow. Really? Never even used it. That's That, that was one of my staples. Yeah, and, but that's the point I'm making. Yeah. There are so many different ways to play also, this Also, I tried towards, at the very last fight, I used the, I don't know what it's called. The shield? Yeah, but you, like, hold it, and it makes a shield in front of you that, like, drains your salts, and then, like, you let go, and it, like, is basically grabbing all of the bullets they're shooting at you, and then you can release them right back onto there. Yep. Yeah, that, there are a lot of different ways to play this game, and none of them are necessarily wrong. Which is why I might go back and play through it again. Yeah, if anything, just with the knowledge of the narrative now, mm -hmm. playing the game again seems to be worth it. Mind explosion. Yes. Your mind will be blown by this game. We all like, whoa. Um, so I guess we can get into narrative then. Uh, at its simplest level and most spoiler-free level, you play as Booker DeWitt, a guy who is in a lot of debt in New York, who is told that if he goes to this city of Columbia, this floating city in the sky, and retrieves this girl and brings her back to New York, that all of his debts will be repaid. And those are the exact words that they use. So, Bring us the girl and wipe away the debt. You are sent into an ultra right-wing nationalist fundamentalist religion it's, it's city. The, it's, a, it's very much a theocracy. Yeah, where the but, thing they're worshipping is God first, and then the Founding Fathers. Well, it's their prophet. Yeah. As well. Zachary Comstock. Yeah, Zachary Hill Comstock is like the theocrat in charge. And he can presumably see the future for whatever reason. Or well, at least he, he has says convinced... God tells him. Yeah, that he's, you know, convinced everybody else that, yeah, some archangel's been able to, like, give him the inside dish. And, um... And then, yeah, the Founding Fathers, so you've got, like, Washington, Washington Franklin, Franklin, and Jefferson. Jefferson. Wasn't there a fourth, fourth one? No, the, the fourth was Comstock. Oh, uh, it might have been. So, yeah, you've, you've got those three as the sword, the scroll, and the... Was it shield is the last symbol? Yeah. Key. The, oh, and the key. Thank you. The scroll, the sword, and the key. And, yeah, it... 
I have to say it's kind of terrifying walking around the city in those first uh, 20 or so minutes before yeah, you were, actual you combat were, breaks out. Yeah, you were like, the first 20 minutes of Bioshock are like really scary, and I was like, I haven't played this yet, but you know, whatever. But now I feel I have to. Like, it, it's amazing the world that they've built. And it makes you want to explore more. There are, there are constant pickups around the city. Uh, Voxophones, which are the standard gaming pre-recorded messages that you find now as pickups. Yeah, those are your audio logs. That are everywhere in gaming these days. Um, so those are around. There's also uh, kinetoscopes. Neat little optional things that, you know, give you backstory. Yeah, they're just little quick videos that show something about the history of the city. Whether it's the founding of Columbia or um, how on earth they keep the buildings of Columbia in the sky. Quantum mechanics, apparently. There, there are just little things around the city that establish its backstory. And, like, you go through the, the big monuments of the city in the first tour. Like, the, the moment you arrive at Columbia is kind of weird because it's this temple that's completely filled with water where you go through a baptism ritual to get into the city proper. Like, you literally can't get in without it. Yeah, they, they make the guy dunk you, and then they wash you out of the river into... The he doesn't just dunk you, he almost drowns you. Right. You pass out. Yep, and then you wake up in the city. And then you wake up and you're all like, what the heck? And the dude that you find at the other side is all like, oh yeah, you know. They do that to everyone. Yeah, they do that to everyone. It was like, they deprive us of oxygen so that our lungs learn to love it better when they get it back or something. I don't even... It's like, you know I like oxygen to begin with, right? I, I really like oxygen. I didn't need to learn to love it. But yeah. Um, I, I do truly like oxygen, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it's an interesting society, and I liked exploring it. I liked seeing it fall apart even more. Like, when you're confronting these people with the possibility of forced revolution, it it gets really brutal. And as any revolution does, the city gets torn to shreds. There are bodies in the streets. There are people picking through them mm. to try to find any means of staying alive. You know, later in the game, you started to see the word hoarder written around the city for people who... For, for what I imagine for us was a hint for, hey, go loot this building... But for what in the game was, you know, a punishment and a brand against them. Mm. No, it, Snake would like to uh, mention the hummingbird. You want to go there? The hummingbird? Right at the beginning. It's, it. I saw a hummingbird. I don't mm -hmm. know if we're talking about the same thing. Well, you try and we'll piece this out. Go right ahead. at the very beginning? That's like right when you wake up. There's like little hummingbirds everywhere. Yeah, the, the All garden. All over the... the they call it words are escaping me i need to the little garden that you walk through right after your baptism yes. yeah there are hummingbirds in it i don't know what else you want me to get to i just thought the animation was really impressive oh yeah the the whole thing is beautiful like any of those scenes where it's yes this is supposed to be like also snake apparently just thought it was significant i don't know i'm gonna wait for him to finish his thought here okay yeah the the environments are gorgeous walking around the city uh, he says have you ever seen a hummingbird in a game before <laughs> No, and I have not seen one rendered well enough that it actually struck out in my head as, yes, this is a good-looking hummingbird. Like, Because you hadn't seen one prior to, so you have nothing to compare it to. Yeah, still. properly animated. The animation is smooth and gorgeous. I suppose now that you mention it. Yes, I have seen one in a game before, but... Okay. Those old, like, Disney movie tie-ins. Gotcha. <laughs> At that point, they were probably trying to kill you because <laughs> everything in those games hated you. Um, so yeah, narrative-wise, the story is worth following. It It's definitely one of those, like the original game, where it has the, oh my gosh, moment of, of realization. The difference is where Bioshock, the first one, gave you that moment then was like, psych, there's still two more hours of gameplay. This one, it's at the end. Yeah, this one is... Oh my gosh! And then they give you no time to process the information. It's like and scene, and, and you get credits. and you can do nothing about it. Which is honestly what they should have done with the first Bioshock because it's those, a, those last two hours of gameplay felt incredibly weak after that turn. It was very uh oh, what's the word? 
God, I don't know. The word's escaping me. Okay. It'll come back to me in like 10 minutes and you'll have long since forgotten what we were talking about. Fair enough. No, it, it had the finality that I wanted from this. I don't need to go on and see the character react to the big turn if the big turn is what to find the thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to fondly remember Bioshock Infinite as that's how it ended. Not that's how it ended and then I got to shoot things for 20 more minutes until some stupid boss fight ended the game. I don't... Or the choose your ending button. Looking at you, Deus Ex Human Revolution. Looking at you, Mass Effect 3. Thanks. (laughs) Which color do you want to walk to? Do you want the blue sucker? Or the green sucker? Or the red sucker? They all taste the same. Or you can have this pile of poop that's represented by a small child. (laughs) They all taste the same. Oh, wait, we should probably go back and add flavor to them later. Can we add flavor later? Guess we can. <laughs> There's like the troll baking thing where someone sent them like 500 cupcakes they all sent frosted a cupcake in different colors. for every cover. employee at BioWare. <laughs> They're all frosted in different colors. There's a little card in there that said no matter which one you pick, they all taste like vanilla. Yep. I don't know. I, I guess I'm the only one who was okay. We with... got new endings. We got the endings plus. Apparently, Snake, we already went there. <laughs> oh, I I really feel like the ending of Bioshock Infinite was well-crafted. Like, it told the story it wanted. It was one of those things where it was like, I immediately texted you and wanted to talk to you about this, and then I knew that I could not in any way talk to you about this, or we would have nothing for the show. Right. And that's definitely the case, as it were. Like, yes... Talking about the end of Bioshock Infinite is important. It is a game that had a lot to say, and it said it well. At the same time, you can't talk about it without spoiling the game for someone. If you talk about the game before they finished it, you are taking away a fundamental part of that experience. And this is another one of those things where Pyrosim asked me to tell him what the ending was, and I'm like, I can do this, but you won't appreciate it if and when you finally play it yourself is this thing's going to be sitting in the forefront of your mind the whole time you're playing it and you won't get that oh now suddenly things make sense moment yeah and and I had a friend in Bloomington ask me to do the same thing and I went ahead and told him and his reaction was huh that sounds kind of neat but he's not going to get the same experience of playing through that with the confusion of what's going on the why am I doing this because even Booker himself during the game is questioning how did I get here why what am i doing again like even booker's questioning what's going also, on also we will always have this joke now for every time someone gets a nosebleed yeah you're remembering that mhm oh there are a lot of really well crafted scenes in bioshock infinite that are designed to create mystery and through doing that they deepen the play experience of i'm getting involved in this world and these characters So, I guess that brings us to our final point. Is it fun? Which I suppose if you've been listening to us at all for the last 50 minutes, yes. Yes. This is a great game. Um, It's It's absolutely fantastic. I think it's probably the best game I've played this year. It's probably 12 hours of gameplay, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're taking it at a casual pace, you can burn through this thing because anytime... Yeah, but I like exploring all the little side stuff. Anytime you're lost, you can hit the up button on the directional pad and it will give you an arrow telling you exactly which direction you should be heading in but if you do that you're kind of missing the point um towards the end of the game i was trying to get ready for work and i started rushing through the last open exploration section of the game and i really regret that now because there were a lot of things to explore in that section and i'm glad i had time to go back and replay that like i reloaded that whole section of the game because you can go back and load up chapters yeah, I, in the main menu. Having burned through that portion of the game to get to the ending as fast as I could because I didn't think I would have the time I did yesterday to play through this. Because you were like, surprise day off. Yes. My, my work was like, it's super slow in our restaurant and we really don't need you tonight, so it's optional if you want to be here. I was like, nope, Bioshock Infinite, bye. Um, 
So yeah, I went home, I reloaded that portion of the game, and I got more out of that than I think I would have had I just burned through it the way I did. Like, there are rifts and things to find that are specifically only there to enhance your feeling. Like, uh, I'll give one specific note that I don't think is too spoilery. You find the house of the person that's been making all of these songs that you've been hearing around the game world. And when you jump into his house, you realize he has a machine that lets him see rifts. All he's been doing is previewing things through the rifts and then writing that music. Which explains why they're cover songs. Yeah. And it's it's just a little detail that you can you can walk right past because it's so easy to go past it. Like uh, when you're walking past the Memorial Gardens, you take this little dip where part of the road has fallen away and there's a house that's just floating precariously over there. And you have to time your jump properly, but if you do, you land inside this house and you hear Elizabeth say behind you, oh, this is uh, Alexander Fink's house. He writes all the music for, or he writes the most popular music in the city. And then that just comes together. You can totally miss that if you're not paying attention. It's just a little hole in the wall that you can walk right past. I don't yeah, because this is set in like, what, late 18, early 1900s? 1912 yeah. is the exact year. But yeah, it there's a lot of brilliant details in this world that you can move right past. And I'm not just talking about collectibles or pickups. Things that define the game world. But yeah, it, it's totally fun. It is a great game. It's one of my favorite games of the year so far. A year that's already had some pretty excellent games released. The, this is one that I think is going... I would not be surprised if this took game of the year. Yeah, the, it definitely deserves it. I mean, it's still early, like we're still only in the first four months, but, you know, I I wouldn't be surprised. This is definitely one to remember, and it's great that it's doing that for not only great gameplay, but great narrative, great storytelling, great characters. Elizabeth is definitely going to stand out as one of the best written female characters of this gaming generation. You know, it, it's amazing to see this character change and grow during this game. All right. And on that note, we need to take a break real quick. Um, we'll come back in a few minutes with more of uh, To Kill a DJ on this very special episode of Nerd Talk. And we return to Nerd Talk's very special To Kill a DJ episode, uh, where we're on the air until 6 p.m. Central, uh, 7 Eastern, to raise money for Advocate Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. Great charity. Um, you can donate at tinyurl.com slash hopechildrenshospital. Um, so yeah, we're going to be here. Uh, now is your warning. We are about to, to spoil Bioshock Infinite. Yep. Everything Switch off your radio. Go open. do something else for the next hour. At 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, uh, you can come back to us and we'll be talking about something else. But uh, yeah, for, for right now... We are about to spoil the living daylights out of Bioshock's plot. Yep. Uh, everything is open. We're spoiling this thing. So if you haven't... Spoiler, uh, spoiler, it spoiler, yet, spoiler warning. Yeah. Find something else to do. If you've beaten it, hey, come listen. Come chat with us. Call yep. in. Call in. 815-836-5000. That's 815-836-5000. So yeah, we've, we've been waiting to chat about this for quite a while now. Like, Pixie finished the game like earlier week. this week, and has been like kind of on silent mode and I'd been trying to figure out why about it like this I've heard this was kind of a big deal why is she not talking to me about this like I'm surprised I'm not hearing more oh she's trying to make sure it's a surprise okay and saving discussing it for the show so you're hearing it live and all that not so yeah hers. we have not talked to each other about this really at all and we started to like we we kind of accidentally started to like on the drive over here I was like nope la 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 we're not doing this <laughs> Despite the fact that, you know, I uh, so want to talk about this. So, yeah. So, yeah, now we get to. Yay. Mass Effect Infinite. Um, brilliant. Did you just say Mass Effect Infinite? I did. I want that game now. Make that game. What? Bioware. Irrational. Make, make that game. Make me Mass Effect Infinite. I want, I want the Mass Effect universe with infinite cross, uh, crossing timelines. So you want to see the Asari civilization in 1912? I, I want to see what would happen if, like, 
Javik had been the Asari uh, representative from the Protheans. Because that wouldn't have gone over well. Well, I guess we're doing Mass Effect spoilers as well. Jeez. Yep. Mm. Spoil it all. Okay. So. So, yeah. Um, the first big hint as far as... like Picking this up, I wondered about the title of the game. Because Infinite just feels like one of those catchwords that you can just throw on a game box. Where it doesn't mean anything... But it's just there to differentiate it from the previous ones. Because this didn't get called Bioshock 3. This is Bioshock Infinite. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's Infinite's kind of like extreme. You can just slap it on something. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. And that's what I was kind of worried about. But like, I'm glad tying it into to the ending of the game. Like, I'm, I'm Can assuming, we tell I was born in the 90s? I go with extreme. I, I'm assuming anyone listening to this either has no idea what we're talking about or has already finished the game. So like... The, the concept of infinite ties into the realities that are at work here. And the string theory, many worlds thing. Yeah. The m- many worlds that all stream from a single event. Like, the, the the first clue of infinite comes right at the beginning of the game where you see the, the twins, well, not twins technically, the, the two scientists sitting in the boat with you. Yeah, it's really... Um, Rosalind and Robert are really the same person the same person from alternate universes she just went and found a male version of herself and brought it yep which he had a, a big hint that he then had to deal with that the same way Booker's dealing with the multiple timelines I guess nosebleeds are just a thing that you get and um and he's the one therefore that's more motivated to like we have to put this right later mm-hmm. with uh, other events that happen yeah, the the twins are the characters that follow you around for the entire game. They're, they're the things that launch the plot for you. The helpfully enigmatic. Yeah, who just mess with you for the entire game. Like, I absolutely love when they show up just to test theories. You know, just like call this heads or tails, pick one of these charms, do something. Yeah, the 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 beginning of the game when they show the the heads or tails he's got a board on his chest that has like what it on the front it's like eight check boxes that show heads and zero that show tails and when he turns around you see that the head side is actually completely full so that that's kind of what showed me that this game is not going to be one of those you decide where you end up yeah, the the um, the ending is determined. The, from the false start. presentation of choice. Yeah, and and that's part of the th- theme of the game. These things are going to happen regardless of what you choose. The choice of whether you picked the cage or the bird necklace for Elizabeth meant nothing, really. Yeah, completely irrelevant. Like other game companies would do. This is a streaming morality choice, and at the end of the game, this is going to play as to whether you get this ending or this ending. I was kind of worried we were going there, because that leads to a weaker story overall. I mean, stories... No, it was really, which one do you think looks prettier? Yeah, it's, which one do you think this person would like to wear? I went with the bird, not like it matters, but figured the cage was a little cruel. Even though cage had later significance to the story. Yeah, the uh, C-A-G-E, it being song notes. The songbirds uh, song, if you would. I am disappointed, though. No one dropped the line, would you kindly, in this game. Yeah, there was, I was saying this earlier, but I wanted to wait until we got to the spoiler part. There was surprisingly little tying this to the uh, previous Bioshock titles. You can tell it happens kind of in a similar I don't know you can't even it, say si- similar time in the universe because you're jumping so many yeah, but the, like you go to Rapture at one point you walk through it in about 20 seconds but and, and that's kind of what they were describing that it's it, just you show up you see like a sign advertising blood bids that's the, really well at the end of the game when you're walking with Elizabeth she mm-hmm. flat out says it you know it, it always works the same way there's a city and there's a man and there's a woman and there's a songbird. In, in Bioshock, the songbird took the form of the big daddy. The woman was the little sisters. The story's always the same, regardless of what the variables are. 
And that's kind of the brilliance of and this. That there are Comstocks everywhere, despite the fact that Booker, in the one universe that you've been playing in, bashed in his head on a birdbath. Right, which was similar to the main character of... Uh, or was it a baptism basin? I don't um, know. It was actually a baptism basin. Symbolism. Yeah. Um, it's the similarity to when the control was taken away from Jack in Bioshock, and you bashed Andrew Ryan's head in with a golf club. You know, that, like I was saying earlier, that's one of the few times in the game where direct control is taken away from you. Because this event has to happen. Constance. Yeah, it. it's an interesting play on the theory of infinite dimensions mm -hmm. that all of these... Some things are going to always be the same. Yeah. There's variables and then constants. It's kind of neat. Yeah, this ending was going to happen no matter what you chose. You didn't. You Died, couldn't have done dies, anything to affect die. it. You know, even and he's like, I don't want to. And there's like other choices that like Elizabeth is walking him back through. We have to go find Comstock at the very beginning and get rid of him. Otherwise, you know, these versions of me that I can see and experience and all these other tears that I can see and interact with now are going to still be tortured. Yep. And so to stop that, she's like, we have to go back and find Comstock. And so we're going back to Booker's really um, morally troubled past in that she's like, okay, this is back to the beginning. In every one of these realities, Booker, you sell your daughter to get rid of your gambling debt to Robert Lutess. Mm -hmm. yep. And he's like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to. So she takes you back to the moment Comstock not, was born. Yeah, you're not leaving this room until you do it. No, she's still got to travel down the timeline. Okay, find out where the change was. Mm -hmm. So and yeah, you eventually end up at this river for a baptism. There's a born-again thing happening. Booker changes his mind in the middle of it and goes, no, I don't want to do this anymore and leaves. Yep, that version of him, mm -hmm. at any rate. And multiple the versions of him that are still Booker. Yeah. But then there's the version that goes, or the versions that go through with it and choose the name Comstock. Zachary Hale Comstock. And so there's like... And the first interpretation that I had was, oh, in order to keep... In order to, you know, preserve Elizabeth's integrity in... Um, and freedom in these other realities we have to kill booker but what happens is in that moment where the other elizabeths show up and they're like one takes one arm and says he's zachary hale mm -hmm. comstock and the other one says he's booker dewitt and he goes i'm both yeah and so they put him down like for the baptism and drown him there yep in that moment, though, before he's submerged, he he's it's like a Schrodinger's cat thing. He is simultaneously both people. Mm -hmm. Drowning him kills that one version of him. Therefore, only Booker remains. Yeah, but if you saw immediately afterwards, all of the other Elizabeths start to fade. Yeah, the ones that were suffering at the hands of Comstock, because that reality doesn't happen. Well, part of the issue is... She brought you back to the exact moment that those paths diverged. Mm -hmm. When. The yeah, so you killed the Comstock realities, and therefore those Comstock controlled Elizabeths go away. I don't know. It really Anna. And the, and the one Elizabeth you, you see is still there. Yeah, it, it's one interpretation and, that you can draw because of. What but if you watch after. all the way through the credits, this is what makes me think that Booker's still alive. That there's and still that those, Booker those that realities made. are still there. Because remember, Booker do never goes underwater. Yeah. In his realities, the guy takes him by the shoulders and he fights him off and goes, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And he runs off. And so by being under the water, that is Comstock right there. Right. Comstock drowns. Uh, my interpretation was more But if you watch all the way through the credits, you find right at the end, you're back in Booker's, I don't know, office apartment. Yeah. And you can hear a music box, and he goes in and checks on Anna. 
Mm -hmm. Which clearly, it means that there's some version of Booker that is not only still alive, but in which there's been a baby room set up Mm -hmm. with presumably a baby in it. Yeah, so that Anna and Booker are still together. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a more uplifting note it's on that one, uplifting. I think. The the utter down note ending, which is what I kind of took the, away which from is it. Which was my first imp- impression before I watched the credits was yeah. all of them had to be killed in order to that, that you to pull it up by reality. the root in order to, yeah. Because yeah. they talk about weeding a garden like that in the story. Like, I believe specifically that's one of the dark Elizabeth's lines, that you weed a garden by pulling it out by the roots. Daisy Fitzroy also says it about the founders. Ah, yeah. So the the dark interpretation of the ending is that Elizabeth effectively committed suicide in order to stabilize all of the timelines to make sure Columbia never existed and that these tears and realities never happened by killing her father in all of his forms before he could diverge. But likewise, could you just fix the problem by making a version where Booker never went to the Battle of Wounded Knee? Well, apparently that is the point where the diversion happens. Yeah, all of those other things one. will always happen in all of those realities for Booker. Yeah, it, the, just like how Booker always has a daughter, always sells her to Lutas. That's that's really depressing in and of itself. That every single reality out of the billions of realities that there are, where he Booker will exists. sell his yeah. daughter, his infant daughter, out. Right. Every time, 100% of the time, that is not where the diversion lays. No, there, there's the diversion where he goes and tries to get her back versus where he doesn't, which creates the Elizabeth paradox because part of the, her ended yeah, up existing in multiple realities. And then the older realities. Elizabeth, which existed because Booker kept trying to rescue her and a songbird would always stop him, which is why old Elizabeth had to bring him into the future, give him the controls to songbird, and then send him back. Yep. Now that that was a brilliant scene. That was really like terrifying and sad being in the asylum in mm-hmm. the like seeing dystopian what that society world. became. And the, listening to those audio logs of the tired and old and beaten down Elizabeth after she succumbed ang- to her father's torture the angry and propaganda. Indoctrinated Elizabeth. Yeah. But she just sounds so tired. Appropriately. It takes a lot of effort to, you know, destroy the world with a religious fervor. This is exactly what she was doing. Like New York on fire. Yeah, that that's But then happen. she realizes that, you know, all too late, of course, that I, I actually didn't want to do that. Well, she mastered her abilities. When she was no longer under the influence of those machines. Like, one of the scariest moments in the game was when Elizabeth broke free of those machines and summoned a tornado just connected their reality with one where there was a tornado raging through a cornfield. And then you go down there and you're like, I'm not going to let you go kill Comstock. And she's like, really? Opens up the tornado. You're going to stop me. He's like, no, no, I'm going to do it for you. I mean, one of the absolute... It's like you have like all these great little bonding moments and like Booker gets so defensive of Elizabeth that it kind of becomes a duh thing when you find out that she's technically Anna DeWitt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... Oh, there, there's that great line that they used in one of the trailers. You know, Elizabeth says, are you afraid of God? And Booker just responds to her looking flat at her. No, but I'm afraid of you. I think, doesn't she say good in the trailer? I don't think she responds to it. She doesn't respond to it in the game, but I think in the tra- in the early promotional trailers, I think she does. Which wouldn't felt right for the character. Mm-hmm. Like, admitted, at that point, Elizabeth was on a dark spiral. She wanted Comstock dead. And it wasn't until she had, or you had killed him that she kind of opened her eyes as to what was really going well, on. Well, it was in the middle of you killing him, going, yeah. oh, God, what are you doing? Stop. Com- Comstock's last line of, you know, f- figure out what happened to your finger, and then you'll know the truth, seemed to have opened Elizabeth's eyes. Because it's, it's right after that that the game effectively goes, let's start experimenting with these infinite realities. And it, even at one point, you see yourself walking with a, a different Booker and a different Elizabeth. It just makes me think, is, is there a reality where Booker had a rave party with, like, hundreds of other versions of himself? Oh, well, there's definitely the one that died, you know, as a martyr for the Vox. Yep. Which, always cool when Booker gets the memories of himself dying. 
Like the flood of the realization that you've lived alternate lives causes nosebleeds. It's that point where you remember the alternate realities of yourself. There's like a lot of people like you'll be going through an area and you'll have like shot some guards and stuff and they're dead. Yep. Obviously. And then you go through, you get to the bottom of the, the building. It's like, oh, well, the thing we need isn't here. So I'm going to make a new reality and we'll where back it up is. Out. We'll back, yeah. back out. You go back up the stairs. Those people are standing around, but they're like convulsing and they've got these terrible nosebleeds and they're just kind of mumbling and like they seem to be in a lot of pain and confusion. They're remembering being dead. Yeah. That's really messed up. Yep. And likewise, the same thing was happening to uh, to Chen Lin, the gunsmith. Mm-hmm. The multiple times you run into him, the first time you actually find him, he's dead in a basement. Mm-hmm. You go back, and you're in a reality where he's alive again, but all of his machines have been stolen from him. And he's, like, running around in his workshop like the machines are on, telling you to speak up. He can't hear you over them. They're not there. He's just crazy. Well, yeah. What's actually happening is his memories are telling him, one, you're dead. Two, your machines are still here, so you can be working. Like, his brain can't process those three different realities that have occurred. The one where everything's fine, the one where he's fine but his machines are gone, and the one in which his machines are there but he is dead. Like, yeah, that probably would drive someone crazy. Um, and likewise... The same thing happens to Booker constantly. I mean, as you do things in the game, you encounter alternate realities where different things have happened to you. And so some of them you'll end up bleeding because you were dead. Uh, The one with old Elizabeth, you don't end up bleeding because you didn't die in that reality. You just failed a lot. You would think Songbird would have killed him, though. Wouldn't if Elizabeth asked him not to. I mean, Songberg's one instruction was protect Elizabeth, keep her uh, in her place. Never said anything about killing Booker. In fact, she asks him not to on multiple occasions. Yeah, but he was gonna before she gets captured. Like, he's all like, grr, rawr, and then she Launch goes... back. Yeah, yeah she, she like, him. Yeah. And then she goes, okay, well, I'll just go back to my tower with you. Yeah. So he was gonna kill Booker there. I don't see why he wouldn't if Elizabeth isn't physically there to do anything about it. I'm guessing she was every time. He got to her, he tried to save her, and then she stopped him and went back. I suppose that might make sense. So yeah, Booker never bled during that encounter. It was... And one of, one of the mechanics, I love alternate dimensions and time travel as, like, mechanics and That's definitely what was in this game. That, that, so I'm all like, yay! That was what this game was. Getting pulled into the future where Elizabeth was indoctrinated, took over for Comstock, and then destroyed the city of New York was totally time travel and alternate dimensioning. Now, I I honestly want to say that leaving me in the player experience, even when they were delivering the endgame narrative, the, the section of walking between the lighthouses, which I guess now we've defined exactly why the Bioshock series uses lighthouses as their launching off point each time. That they are points of light in a in a sea of nothingness. Like it, it's very interesting to to go by the take. I, I really want to know if the next game Irrational produces is also going to follow this path of reasoning, or was this kind of like the swan song for the the shock series that we've defined. There's always a man, a city, and a woman, and it starts with a lighthouse. Like, they, they could really just leave it here. And they might. I don't know. Let's see. Do you suppose the wiki would have anything to say about a possible sequel? Um, they haven't announced anything yet that I've heard of. Mm-hmm. And I really don't think they need to. Um, mm-hmm. it, it was very powerful, I, I'd say. Like, it... The closest comparison I could draw upon finishing the game was Looper. Because that's another series of time out of sync, multiple people in places where they're not supposed to be, and it ending with the action of a man being killed to resync the timelines, to fix things. But I'd say this was 
a lot more powerful because you were in the perspective of the characters. Like, you'd spent over 10 hours interacting with Elizabeth as Booker. I mean, you were a part of the actual confusion of Booker exploring these multiple timelines until you finally came to the one convergence point and realized what needs to happen to fix things. I mean, the other question I think we have to bring up, hmm. there's a brief moment in the game where in order to be rid of the songbird, Elizabeth takes you to Rapture. Mm -hmm. And so the pressure outside kills the songbird. Yep. Apparently any dip in water just breaks this thing. Well, no, it's just the pressure from being at the bottom of the ocean. Really? Because even when the thing came at you on Battleship Bay... It pressure. was the intense water pressure. Yeah, it shattered its its uh, eyes. Mm. So, like, I could understand... That was what killed Songbird, I could though, understand why the... being at the bottom of the freaking ocean. Yeah, Rapture could kill it. That makes sense. But why did its eye break just from Battleship Bay's water? I don't even... Yeah, because its eye shattered there and it flew off again, which is why it, it let you have Elizabeth for so long then. Um, why did like in the original Bioshock the rationale for the doors opening for Jack was that they were coded to Andrew Ryan why did the doors open for Elizabeth in the player character she could yeah was it just that tears. Elizabeth could have whatever she wanted at that point oh yeah she she could open tears and in another reality she has a key remember so she just kind of walked key yeah I mean th those big bulkhead doors were coded to Andrew Ryan and would only open for him Elizabeth just walks right through them. Elizabeth's basically got at this point so yeah there's there's no question about that <laughs> why do I have this key it was always there I just didn't know it. Hmm. Yeah, the the moment Elizabeth becomes all existential, I'm like, oh no. This can't end well. We are not going for a straight happy ending on this one. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I'm totally okay with that. Now... What else is there to discuss? There there were a lot of just character moments in the game that I think stand out. I mentioned the the uh, guitar playing singing duo from earlier, which wasn't particularly spoilery, so I left that. But Right, but like the moment when you first arrive on Battleship Bay and mm -hmm. just you, you search the beach for Elizabeth because she obviously ran off while you were trying to recover from near drowning. And her concern. It's yeah, so powerful. You find that she's given up on you and has gone dancing. Yep. But, like, there, there's so much character just in that moment of her just running around. Mm -hmm. it, it's really beautiful because no game character she, has done that. And she's like, that. cotton candy, woo! I've never had cotton candy. This is amazing! Right. And, like, that's what I love about this. Even when you're in combat, there's so much character in who she is, uh, who they developed here. And it, it's something to be said for the fact that the game creators motion capped one actress and did the use the voice of another to create this character. And, and a lot can be said of the other people, not just Elizabeth. Um, Comstop's uh, booming voice, whether over the voxophones or his direct announcements in the game, always have that that sense of authority to them uh daisy fitzroy every time she talks to you and when you go back and hear like one of those first voxophones where comstock is like recounting his first interaction with the archangel that gives him his prophecies Columbia. cough cough um and uh he's talking about well i'm not a virtuous man and i've I'm, I'm, you know, done all these terrible things and then you realize that's you know alternate universe booker and you're like oh my gosh it yeah. all makes sense well he's specifically talking about the battle of wounded knee mm -hmm. and everything before that in his life yep whereas you know 
the booker that we know went on to be a it was called a pinkerton someone who you know destroys workers who are trying to unionize that Comstock went on to, you know, take over a religion and found Columbia. Oh, this is cool. I found somebody has translated the sc- uh, screen cap of right when you first run into Elizabeth and she opens that tear to Paris. You yeah. can see on the marquee. Yeah, Revenge of the Jedi. Yeah. Uh, and this takes place in like the 1980s. I was like, oh, that's really neat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she opens a door to 1980s uh, Paris. I was watching her and not the background at the time. So. Oh, yeah. It, There's like all this little stuff in there that you might miss. Definite attention to detail that will give away a lot of the plot. Um, the Marquis says "Revenge of the Jedi," which yeah. was apparently which was the original yeah. name of the third movie. They ended up changing it the week it came out because revenge doesn't sound like something that's very Jedi-ish. Nor does dealing in absolutes. Yeah, part of why the sixth movie was re- appropriately "Revenge of the Sith." Mm. Man, we are all over the place today. Yeah. Well, it, it's an important thing to note in the game. Um, yeah, so she's taking you to alternate dimensions. Probably one where that title got kept. Since it's released in the theater. Hmm. Oh, it... I, or it's in an alternate universe where the title didn't get changed. Dun, dun, dun! That's what I was just saying. Yeah. It... I... I can't express how much this... I appreciate the fact that this game respects the intelligence of its audience. Mm -hmm. That there are details all over that world that give away so much of the game that are just there to find them if you find them. If you don't, okay, we'll let you keep going. Like, the only definitive in this game that you get for playing it is you are eventually going to hit the end, and this ending is set in stone. Mm -hmm. You will get here. I... I think there's something to be said for game creators yeah. trusting their own skill. Going past the, I don't want to do this, this isn't my choice, you already have. Yeah, you're, you're going to do this. The twins tell you constantly that they know what you're going to do. Because, well, the, the tense of things, the when, yeah. is more important than the what. Yep, and it's not if it is going to happen Died, it's dies, as if it will has die. happened or has had happen yeah that those are all more important than if like the the twins know from the start of the adventure where this is going like there's that comment at, at the boat at the end of the game you know he doesn't seem to be taking this very well well he's not going to like this next part even more the moment Elizabeth takes you to the uh, the baptism scene for the first time mm-hmm. to show you when you ran away, mm-hmm. when she's trying to discover the divergent point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because she doesn't exactly know that she's not omniscient. Yeah, just, she's just, just like it's somewhere between this point and this point. Yep. So she experiments trying to see if going back to the moment you made the deal for Elizabeth or for Anna was the point. Mm-hmm. No, it's not. You're going to give these away. And she flat out says, you can stand here as long as you want. You're going to do it. You're going to eventually give him what he wants. Yep. It's fantastic writing for the end of that game. And when she finally takes you back to the baptism and sees that that's where it is, she takes a few more minutes of roaming around to realize that that's the final point. That's the moment of Comstock. And she doesn't exactly tell you this right away. It's just, you know, Booker goes, I'm going to go back and kill Comstock as an infant. We're going to go back to the beginning before any of this can start. And she's like, are you sure about that? And even she's not sure that this is the answer. It's it's even more or less. The other Elizabeths drown her and then disappear, leaving only the one. Yep. I imagine that's because the other healthy, well-adjusted Anna Elizabeths didn't show up to that particular yeah, moment. They didn't would, have emotional well, investment in those that. Those ones wouldn't have had the ability. Yeah, that's true, too. And it was so, only the Elizabeth that got her finger sliced off mm-hmm. that would have had that power. Which is why I think that once the credits faded, that Elizabeth disappeared, too. Because she couldn't have existed with her finger cut off with her abilities if that baby hadn't been given up. Mm-hmm. So it's 
entirely possible that there is an existent Booker and an existent Anna that you saw after the credits. Yeah. But that Elizabeth is is gone. Mm-hmm. She faded out of existence. Yes, man, the transdimensional stuff is so fascinating. <laughs> so much fun. Multiple dimensions. Woo! Yeah, you you can't have that Elizabeth with that power without Comstock, without Booker, without the event in that alley that sliced her finger off. You can't have the Columbia that brought them there, and you can't have the twins. Because the twins only gained those powers from experimenting with Anna. Well, it was when um it was when Comstock killed them that yes. they became like that they got well, severed from time and stuff. space. Yeah. <laughs> Which you'd think they'd then note that going quantum sounds like some kind of weird version of like a going medieval, you know. I could say worse. I know you could. <laughs> but yeah, um it it's really powerful the way they decided to end that. That you know, effectively, yes, this person ceased to exist. There, there is what the game confirms is there are hundreds of alt, hundreds and thousands of alternate dimensions. So yes, there is a dimension because of what Elizabeth did, where a version of Booker Dewitt had a daughter named Anna and held on to her, so she could live a normal life. Because, because uh, no, I would delusion. imagine I would imagine that there are more now. The that the, the, everything before that point is fixed yes. because there's no Comstock to break the tears in reality to and go back her. and take her. Yes, that got fixed. Mm-hmm. But that version of Elizabeth that you know from the game. So all of those versions where 100 percent of the time he would have given her up mm-hmm. doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, that can't happen. Now you've got ch- all of those bookers that raise all of those Annas. Yep. How well they do it is up to question. It's a little bit probably questionable. Infinitely divergent. Let's just hope she's got a good maternal figure. Or no, paternal. she died. We confirmed that every time. I was going to say you never know. Like Booker could like. Yeah, but we've confirmed that her actual mother died one hundred percent of the time. He could remarry. He could. He could do the second half gay. We don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of infinite realities. Why am I seeing terrible fanfic in this game's future? Infinite reality fanfic. It Oh yeah, it's the slash fic writers, you know. Perfect dream job. Oh man. Well, we've got something for Mark to read in the future. Are you going to write it? Nope. No, I prefer to... Invent- oh, that's something we did since the last show, isn't it? We can I talk about that, that later. Mm. But yeah, um... I think I think there's a lot to say in Infinite, especially from a writer's standpoint. So much symbolism. Yeah, like, this is how you do writing correctly in a visual medium. You need to be constantly giving hints of the theme. Like, right from the beginning, walking down the street, when you hear Tainted Love playing, that that's a key in your head that... Things are a little off here. The writer's intended for me to note that. And to think about this later. There should always be... Like, good night, Irene. This is set in 1912. Good night, Irene came out in 1933. Yep. God only knows this is from 1966. Girls just want to have fun. It's from 1983. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everybody wants to rule the world. That's an 80s tune. 85. Yep. Which I played before we came back from the break. I thought it was appropriate. Definitely. Um, But yeah, I want more games like this. I really do. I don't know how like this we would... I want games that want to tell me a story that I get to think about. That I get to experience and enjoy. That are more than just, yeah, the Marine shot that dude. That include more colors than brown and kind of beige. And and then I got to the end of the game and where there was supposed to be a big last boss dude that I fought and then I'd get to see a quick ending and then the credits. It asked me to think for longer and there wasn't a big And walk around inside your, you know, virtual world for like 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, effectively, 
the game didn't have a last boss. The last challenge of the game was fighting on the deck of the airship trying to protect the generator. That was the final combat sequence. Yeah, being able to protect the songbird or being able to protect the generator using songbird to take down airships that I could never fight. That was the last combat challenge. But then I got a mental challenge of trying to piece together what was going on. Which, frankly, you'd been doing the whole time, but it seemed a lot more straightforward at the beginning when it's just, okay, show up, save damsel. Go save girl from tower. It's like, Get out of city. It's friggin' Rapunzel at that point. And then yeah. you go on and it's like, oh, this is a lot more nuanced than that. Yeah, there's a lot more going on than just this dude is evil, I must stop him. Granted, though, that dude is pretty freaking evil. Oh, yeah. Comstock's a monster. And Lady Comstock identified that. And pretty much anyone who listens to him outside of his own city could identify that. So basically anybody who hadn't been brainwashed from birth with his propaganda. Yeah. Even Elizabeth, who he had sent away, knew there was something wrong with him. I mean, there, there's that scene right when you walk into the arcade of Elizabeth going, looking at the segregated restrooms and going... Why would you need these? Mm -hmm. That's another weird thing. Like, it brought back, like, a lot of those antiquated... Um, Notions of race and sexism that yeah. were prevalent at the uh, early centuries. And, you know, yes. are still kind of prevalent in the most fundamentalist part of the countries. The yeah. Parts of the country. Yeah. That was, that was really awkward walking through. And, I mean, it's, it's kind of comforting going, looking at that and going, these are definitely the bad guys. I was like, glad you made that very straightforward and clean cut game. Everything yeah. else is just going to get more confusing game, from there. The game does not play around with the notion that there, there may There's, be some merit to these arguments. No, no, it presents these as ugly and horrible and things that are a part of a society. And even Elizabeth is walking around looking at this going, you know, this has always been kind of seen as normal, but this is kind of messed up. Like later when you're seeing like the... Um, well, was it, it the Duke and Dimwit live play? Yeah, it, which, she, you know, she actually she says goes, that she enjoys those at one she point. She used to, like, when she was a kid, she used to love watching those as a kid, and she's like, looking at it now, it's kind of messed up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, there's, the, there's the separate... They had the racially segregated stuff, and then they had, like, the, they also tossed the Irish in there, which I thought was kind of weird. Which, no, that... That was totally something from the turn of the century. That was a thing, okay. That people were racist against Irish people, too. Because they were seen as lesser people. They were coming over to take jobs and be lazy and drink around, and... No. Like, yeah, there, there's specifically the one video uh, that you find in the city of solving the Irish problem. Of basically putting them to work at the Fink and, industry. Like, it's justified that, uh... How come you don't give them any breaks or, like, vacation time or any of this? It's like, oh, well, you know, they're just naturally lazy and mischievous, and therefore we keep them working all the time because that makes them be productive. Right. That's they just terrible. they would just terrible. cause trouble. Like, wow, that's messed up. Like, it, it's very obvious why there was a mass social revolution in the city. A very violent one, Which, still. unfortunately, then decided you were an enemy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Fitzroy, for that one. Because in that world, Booker DeWitt had been a martyr for their revolution. Well, she decided that that didn't fit her narrative very well. Right, so she sicked her troops on you. Mm -hmm. Which, even with her dead, they were still declaring you the enemy. Now, you know, that's kind of like how I, I had heard about this story about some guy out in, like, some island near Japan who, like, didn't know the war was over and was still ransacking villages. Right. They had to, like, go get his old commanding officer who was like now a school teacher get him to put on the uniform and go out and be like you can go home now we're done here thanks <laughs> you just stop killing their pigs like uh, i imagine it's 1912 word doesn't get around that fast right you're on a flying city but you're still on a flying city in 1912 that doesn't have cell phones You'd think they would have put an effort into inventing those. Those are phenomenally useful. Like, remember, those solve every Seinfeld episode. However, however, um, the problem with that is authoritative dictator. Yeah, wouldn't want those. Would not want those because um, he's not going to want 
people to, people collaborating on ideas and stuff tend to, you know... Right, he did kill the two people who were, you know, developing the things that kept his city running and put him in power. Mm-hmm. Oops. That, like, other people being able to share ideas is one of those hotbeds of democracy thing. Right. And uh, That's if I- part of part of the problem that other aut- autocracy is that the word i'm looking for i think so that um other di- dictatorial based governments are having problems with is that oh we have this global community now where people from all sorts of other lifestyles can talk to each other and explain you- just how wrong this is and well like you can even look at okay um might be oversharing but like I grew up with one abusive parent and so you you from within the situation you see that as normal until you go over to somebody else's house and be like oh yours don't do that huh and then you can kind of put that together and be like oh this situation I'm in is no bueno I suppose so it's not even a matter of other people needing to tell you that that's messed up, but you can generally figure it out if you can see enough other people who live differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As, you know, I said earlier I would like to play more games like this, but I, I don't think you could get more to come around very often. Like, I can't think of the last game that's that's told a narrative that's this strong. Because you can't even claim like Bioshock or Mass Effect or the uh, the and Bioware the narr- games. And the narrative, the marriage of the narrative to the gameplay is really great. But if you are going to steal anything from Bioshock Infinite, let it be Elizabeth's mechanics because those are great. <laughs> Making the escort quest likable, mm-hmm. <laughs> not just likable, useful as well. Yeah, I'm not just escorting this person; she's keeping me alive. Because mm-hmm. those scenes where you don't have her. Are they really are rough. painful. Yeah, going through the asylum. And of course, the whole time I'm like, Elizabeth, <laughs> come back. Yeah, not just because of the game mechanics, but because you want this character. You want to you want this person back. You know, as as much as you can see her commentary, figure out what in the environment she's gonna mess with next. Yeah, I mean you can you can make the mistake of speaking. I would have like loved to see her try on that hat in that box bar that would have been awesome yeah there were a lot of there needs to be more dress up montages there were a lot of scenes of her just playing around that totally uh, were great Mm -hmm. like the first time I noticed it was when you were in uh, the basement where Chen Lin was being held and Elizabeth walked up to the fireplace and just started warming her hands there without any input from me, without me walking up to them to make her come over. She just did it. Now, I I was kind of disappointed that uh, they cut out the scene that was in the preview material that uh, showed Elizabeth trying to resurrect the horse. Mm Mm-hmm. Because by the time Elizabeth had fully realized her powers, there were, you know, thousands of dead people around the city. And I don't think she would have necessarily cared about the horse anymore. Like, that that scene showed a very early, naive Elizabeth Mm -hmm. flexing her powers to save a horse's life. Now, anything more on Infinite that we should discuss? Yeah, no, I don't know. I think we've pretty much covered most of it. Yep, we have run this into the ground, I think. Perhaps we have. Uh, what are we going to do next hour? Next hour, we will be discussing Tomb Raider, as you have recently finished that. I suppose we can. I don't know how long we'll go on that. I don't think we can fill a whole hour. We already discussed a lot of it when I reviewed it when it, you know, came out. Yep, I've got other stuff after that. Um, probably League, maybe, or are we going to give that a We'll be doing hour? League later today. Uh, so any of our fans interested in League of Legends, feel free to call in. We will gladly discuss League of Legends with you. Uh, what else have we got? Preparations. The future. 
alternate realities. Is there an alternate reality where Vegas is sooner? Because I'm already tired of this week and it's only Tuesday. Uh, I'll work on that. You got three days to go. Deal. Two of those days are work days, so good for me. More Vegas money. Nerd Talk, where we teach you how to win at blackjack. No. No, we really don't. (laughs) Nope. Might teach you how to lose at it. (laughs) Probably. All right. So, I don't know. What do you want to listen to? I've got Manson's Tainted Love. In honor of Bioshock, I could play that. I think we should start with that. We'll go from there. We'll be back. On Nerd Talk. And we return to Nerd Talk's very special To Kill a DJ episode. Um, We are on the air for the next three hours until... 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, that's 7 on the East Coast. And was it 4? I don't know. I'm bad at my conversions going backwards. Do we think people on the other coast are listening to us? That'd be I just figured we're being listened to the one guy on the driving around Romeoville whose radio got stuck on our station. That would be comical. Hi, guy whose radio is hypothetically broken. <laughs> we're talking can- directly to you. Yeah. That's you. right, Steve. Steve. Typical Why Steve. Why is every guy that gets a condescending uh, tone made about him named Steve? I don't know. I was going to do Adrian, but I don't actually know any of those. So I don't think I've ever met any of those. Adrian Brody. Spray <laughs> bottle man extraordinaire. <laughs> no, the man that you wanted to hit with a spray bottle, as I recall. Splice 2, let's hope you never get made. I really don't think it will. Moving on. This hour, we're going to be discussing Tomb Raider, which Pixie recently finished. I did. It It was was a thing. thing. That was creepy. (laughs) Are you looking for places to store that Cadbury egg? No. (laughs) Moving my ID cards out of my front pocket because they are jabbing me uncomfortably in the thigh. Okay. Okay, I can see that. It was like she's opening her pocket and holding the Cadbury in the other hand. Is she going to put that in her pocket? Because that probably <laughs> won't keep well. No. Just... I was. I had my driver's license and my press badge in my front left pocket, in my pants, and they were jabbing me in the thigh. And so I put them in my pocket in my jacket. And why are we talking about this on the radio? This doesn't seem terribly interesting. Because we have three hours to kill. Right, so we are raising funds with our scintillating conversation about the storage of Cadbury eggs if you have a Cadbury egg storage solution you should call us at 815-836-5000 anyway we're raising funds for Advocate Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund a great charity that helps sick kids and the families who love them uh, here in the Chicagoland area Uh, you can donate online at tinyurl t-i-n-y-u-r-l dot com slash hope children's hospital h-o-p-e C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N-S-H-O-S-P-I-T-A-L. So, there you go. I'm never going to spell that out again, by the way. I, I'm going time. to now assume that you know how to spell all of those words. Do you want me to just Your smart cookies. spell random words for an hour? I can do that. I'll just spell M-I-C-K-E-Y. out M-I-C-K-E-Y. <laughs> to be fair, that one's to help children. You said you just wanted to start spelling random stuff. You were a cheerleader. I think you can spell the word rowdy. Oh, wait. No, they can't. That would just be in my uh, my particular home down whose uh, public education system, as you can tell, is severely lacking because I apparently didn't know that racism against the Irish was a thing. <laughs> and there's your... Uh to kill a DJ face palm dude I've been doing them for the last three hours it's about time you picked up the slack because pressing yourself against the soundproofing wall just isn't a thing when it isn't three in the morning when we're doing this you did look rather comfy on those two to be honest they're all soft the joys of having a better time slot it's true we don't have to get up stupid early and we didn't have to stay here stupid late 
and didn't have to call anyone from security to let us in and question whether or not we should have been here. Which, I'm going to just say straight up, at 6 in the morning on a Sunday, why would we be here if we did not have to? We like you. We don't like you that much. You can listen to us at normal times, unlike us who had to be here at obscene times. It's true. All right. So yes, Tomb Raider. How was the continuing adventures of Lara Croft? Human pincushion. Man, Lara sure got the crap kicked out of her. Um, Builds character, apparently. According to game developers. Ho ho, I see what you did there. Um, yeah, I don't know what else can be said that we haven't already talked about. I finished it. Sam continued to be useless. She was the picture of a damsel in distress. She just yeah. kind of sat there and whined. All right, and didn't so, really do anything to try and rescue herself. She didn't have to succeed. I would have liked it if she tried, or at least didn't just sit there or walk off with strange men or something that wouldn't have contributed to her being, you know, almost set on fire. Cultists who will most likely kill me? They might have candy. And then later when it's revealed for the purpose of a uh, ritual that they need to have her alive, why didn't you just run away? It's not like he was going to actually stab you. It's true. When they need you alive and they're holding the knife at you, you can just politely remind them, uh, counterproductive. You didn't even have to get very far. You could have just run around in circles until I showed up. It would have at least stalled me for time. I had to climb a mountain. I really want to see the like extended scene of Lara just coming up over the ridge, looking down at the cultist campsite, and Sam's just running around in circles, <laughs> screaming as the guy with the knife is just like, not fair. <laughs> Anything would have been better. Like, they didn't even bind her feet at one point. Like, her wrists are tied at some point. But, like, they didn't bind her feet. She could have just run off. Hey, you she's know like, legs work, right? You could have just sat down. <laughs> at least then they would have had to drag you. It's like, just, just like, oh, I guess I'll just keep walking. Laura, save me. But, yeah, so Sam is really annoying. And the rest of them, the rest of the characters at some point all, like, fight. Or they fix things. Or they know stuff. And they're all super helpful. Or they, go, or they die in, like, a really cool way. Except Sam. Sam is total trash. Yeah, I've heard that the rest of the crew pretty much just has giant expiration timers over their head for they have done their ideal duty for the story. Now they can die horribly. Not really. Because a few of them make it out with Lara. Did they particularly help in the final encounter? They were shooting dudes, and one of them fixed the boat. I guess that's kind of important. When you're trapped on an island, yes, the person who fixes the boat is kind of important. Just a little understatement. It's like the oxygen tank while scuba diving. Kind of important. But yes. Uh, I don't know. So overall, how do you rate the experience? I had a blast playing it, actually. Except the multiplayer, the multiplayer sucks. Go on. Um, there's, like, different modes. There's, like, a um, capture the flag type thing where you're either the cultists or you're playing as, like, the different survivors. And you have to, like, level because up to, to level 60 in order I, to play as Lara, but you play as, like, the rest of the people in the crew. Occasionally, they all just get together to have a good old shootout capture, or capture the hill style. And then no, there's a King of the Hill home. style one. There's a Capture the Flag style one, which is the type I played, where the cultists have to stop them. Um, you shoot them down, and then you have to run up and melee the um, survivors in order to, like, get points. And the survivors have to go collect medical supplies and bring them back to a point. Okay. Um, so with the limited there's number There's Team of Slayer and Slayer. I'm basically just using Halo terminology because it's easiest. Which is appropriate with multiplayer... Uh, games like this. No, that's totally valid. Those aren't actually the names of them in the Tomb Raider thing, but that's basically what they're... That's how the mechanics work. Yeah. And I say that and you understand what that means. Yes. I don't know. They're... So, screw it. I'm using Halo as a teaching implement. I wanted to, there to be an actual, like, in-story reason for these modes to exist. Like, the best example of this I can think of was uh, Far Cry 3. 
Far Cry 3 explained its multiplayer as this is combat happening between rival factions on an island that is parallel to where the main story is taking place. So the main story is still going on. That That's there. You're, no one's playing as Jason in this. But this is how the multiplayer works. Um, Halo 4 also, they're explaining that as this is Spartan Ops. This is the training that they went through. Which is why Spartans are shooting Spartans. Yeah, I don't know. There doesn't really seem to be one. It's just... Yes, because if, Here's the characters. if the cultists ran up and meleeed these people after shooting them, they would be dead. Makes it kind of hard to participate in the narrative when you're dead. Unless no, this they is die Bioshock. and then respawn or something. Yeah, I don't know. Unless this is Bioshock. At which point, being dead, more of an inconvenience. You just get a little bloody nose. Or Elizabeth drags you out of the firefight and then resurrects you with the super needle. That costs a little bit of money that she conveniently took out of your pocket. Well, she's been throwing all the money she found to you, to be fair. I'm sure that paid for at least one of those. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not denying her. I appreciate her saving my life, but she couldn't have used some of the money that she had and just didn't toss to me. I know I missed some of those little quick time queue events from her. Didn't realize it was possible to miss those. Yeah, they go away if you move too far away from when she did it. Oh, well. All right, then. Right. So, yeah, the, I wish it had made sense in the, the narrative as to why you're yeah, doing no, multiplayer it's, action. And because it's so terrible, I was, like, immediately willing to, like, give it to somebody else to be like, you can play through the single player of this. Yeah, it... Rather than encouraging someone to get their own copy so that we could play the multiplayer together. Yeah, I still feel kind of bad because I think I sold you Bioshock Infinite on, yeah, it's bound to have multiplayer. Bioshock 2 did. Bioshock Infinite, totally just a single player game. Although it's good that, to hear that you're still willing to go back and give it a second run through now that you finished it. It was still a really friggin' good game. Oh yeah, definitely worth the price. Mm. I got some like passive-aggressive snark from the uh, retail store employee for not having pre-ordered it. No, pre I, I was don't like, care about your numbers. Oh no, it was. I walked in and I was like, I would like to buy Bioshock, please. And he was all like, Okay, for what system? And did you? And I was like, Three sixty. He's all like, Did you pre-order it? And I was like, No, obviously it didn't stop you from having it in stock. It's a major AAA release. You're not gonna run out. Yeah. No, I come to the game store when the game is out to buy the game. This is how stores work. This is the only business where I give you my money in advance and you maybe have a copy for me when it comes in? What other business model does that? It is supposed to guarantee that there is a copy waiting for you, but... Which isn't necessary when it's a triple A release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like you're going to get shipped tons of these anyway, and we both know it. And if you don't have them... I'll go find another store that does. Mm -hmm. Not a big deal. Like, I... Or I, just buy it online. I you can still pre-order them. Pre -order and then play movies. them immediately at midnight as opposed to having to, to drive out somewhere at 11, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, wait around for a couple of hours for you to hand me the thing right. at midnight. At which point, I still have to drive home, and I can maybe get started at about 1 a.m. Yeah, I, I thought about... If going, I was at the front of the line. I, I thought about going to the midnight release for this, and I like I really thought about it. I was at work, and I'm like, yeah, if I make 60 bucks tonight, I could go to the midnight launch and pick up Bioshock Infinite. But then part of me went, no, you're an adult with stuff to do the next day. And if you go to this midnight thing and stand in line to pick up the game, you're going to go home, set it on the table... And maybe to get to it sometime tomorrow. Which means that you're better off getting some sleep and then going and getting it sometime yeah, tomorrow. Like, or I could go home, make dinner, enjoy the rest of my evening doing something else instead of going to stand around at the midnight launch event. And then tomorrow, at a convenient time when I'm, oh, say, driving anywhere around town, I can go pick up the game then and then go home and play it at about the same time I would be playing it had I picked it up at midnight. Hmm. Guess you know which one I went with. Quite. Midnight releases suck, by the way. 
I like going to them when there's like stuff like being when given out event. or like yeah when there's like people showing up in costume and yeah like Batman and Joliet that's a thing I don't know if he still does it but if he does salute to you my friend so yeah I don't know so was Not the ending of, of Tomb Raider at least worth it it was alright she gets off the island spoiler alert I guess and uh, no, we're assuming Lara survived the adventure <laughs> oh, nope Lara died guess there's no new franchise here psych alternate universe that would be comical, actually. No, that, this um, is the universe where Lyra died during her first major adventure. No. Um, so, yeah, she gets off the island and discovers that, like... She realizes that raiding tombs is a lucrative lifestyle? Because, like, every... I don't know. There's, like, some, like... Dark PTSD vengeful thing going on where she's like, I can't go back to normal life now. I have to go adventuring, get to stuff. And this is where she gained her hatred of dinosaurs and saber toothed tigers, isn't it? Pretty much. And uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. She rescues her friend and they're all like, yay. And she's just like, grr, and like brooding. And. That makes no sense whatsoever. It's been like two weeks, to be fair, but yeah, this is what I'm remembering. You don't survive a horrible experience like that and go, you know what? I could deal with more of that. Yeah, I'll just she's need just a like, gun. I need to do this more, basically. And I don't know if it's like to give the people who died like their sacrifice meaning, but you could do that by you could do that continuing by to nice be alive. Life. And uh, she's like, well, now I understand, like, that call to adventure that, you know, took my father and stuff. So instead of resenting him, I'm going to go be just like him now. It and... killed him, too. Exactly. This... Wow. So now she gets it. Gets what? Being shot at is fun? Being mauled regularly is a great thing? Rebar through the torso doesn't hurt like heck? And then the needing to cauterize some other horribly painful bleeding wound later? Right. By hand with a lighter and an arrowhead. Right. That that scene was still, like, really uncomfortable to watch. Are we talking, like, the discomfort Now, the actual, level like, running a... around and platforming stuff, there's not a whole lot of, like, strict puzzles. There's some basic puzzles in, like, the actual tombs. The tombs are largely optional. And it's mostly, like, platforming and some basic, like, kind of splinter cellish combat or like you kind of want to take them out without them seeing you because they're they will over firepower you and you are kind of boned all right then so yeah it's a lot of the emphasis is played on is play on platforming it is not like previous iterations of the tomb raider franchise it does not play like the tomb raiders that you know and if you're gonna try and treat it like one of those you're probably gonna be disappointed but on its own you mean As pushing own- rock puzzles aren't going to be every 15 feet for some odd reason? I think I might have pushed a rock once. Like, by that I mean I shoulder-checked a door that kind of pushed a ro- pile of rocks. Yeah. Yeah. No, as opposed to the old Tomb Raiders where, you know, these people are oddly obsessed with large blocks that are just big enough for me to leap on top of that I have to push around this room a lot. Yeah, also, no. floor switches. So, so it does not switches. play much at all like previous iterations of this intellectual property. But uh, no, I think it's I think it's pretty okay. On the gameplay is pretty solid on its own right. Um, I like Lara as a character. Like I said, I really strongly dislike the damsel in distress, Sam. So we we can now set the scale on Elizabeth to Sam slash Princess Peach. Like, those are the scales right there. Actually, no, I have to take that back. Peach would be above Sam, because Peach on occasion has starred in her own adventures and done very well in them. Sam will never have a game. Sam, who cannot figure out how to walk when her arms are bound. Sam is the worst example. There it is. I haven't even ever played this game, and I dislike this character. I saw her during the opening cutscene. That's it. 
I've yeah, seen. Roughly, you haven't played any of this, have you? I've seen two hours worth of Tomb Raider. The last time I played Tomb Raider was right after you started getting face checked by the boulders in that quick time event. Yeah, I was having a hard time with boulders. <laughs> Quick time events, not a great idea in gaming. If you want to just There's quite a few quick time events, but I will say they're mostly concentrated in the beginning. Later, once you actually get weapons and stuff, it's not so much quick it time. It starts to stuff give you anymore. actual agency in your own survival besides did you press the button? Yes. It's like the first two hours have a lot I'd say the first hour and a half really have Tons of quick time events. It's all very densely packed. I'm just like, oh my god, so sick of the quick time. I can't tell whether I'm supposed to play. It this basically or hit felt like playing the beginning of Resident Evil Four. Mm. Actually, a lot of this game reminds me of Resident Evil Four. I was getting that from playing it. Yeah, right down to the cultists and so. What we're really kind of- saying is, I ask, why'd you rip off Capcom? <laughs> they had that covered. Resident Evil 4 is like over or almost a decade old now. Maybe they think you don't remember. <laughs> nope. I, I remember one of my favorite games of all time and the reason I was happy I bought a Nintendo Maybe they're GameCube aiming for a younger audience. That somehow missed Resident Evil 4? Yes. Also, the nostalgic audience, it's like, you know, Tomb Raider was a good game, right? No. No, it wasn't. Tomb Raider was an okay game way back when. Tomb Raider was an okay game because that's all we had. I, whoops. No, I'm boxing with the mic. Yeah, you're blaming me for boxing with the mic, but who's already checked it twice this episode? (laughs) I was hoping you hadn't noticed the first time. Nope, I notice all. I've seen a lot of flack on the internet for this not being a real Tomb Raider or a true Tomb Raider game. I hate to tell you, but even Tomb Raider What is it, a fake Tomb Raider game? Well, this is like people going, that's not Dante. Mm Mm-hmm. No. It's, it's exactly that, yeah. he's That's Dante because that's what the game creators said Dante is, and they own the rights to him. You know what's not Dante? Your fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now she's getting it. Yeah. <laughs> that character is Dante because they said it is. That character is Lara Croft because they've said it is. Whether or not that meets your expectations. And she's in a game, is. which means this is a Tomb Raider game. <laughs> yeah, I, I... Raiding tombs. I... Yeah. As, but the tomb raiding is really optional. You don't have to raid the tombs. You can go just go deal with the cultist that, you know, kidnapped your friend who ineptly can't save herself. There's, like, a couple of tombs that you have to do, but... There are required tombs. Some tomb raiding I can must, think of in like fact, two. happen. So it's more like tomb raider? Tombs raider. Plural. I'm trying to, like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work the word two into there, and it's not really working. No, you can't do that with spoken dialogue, <laughs> although someone's probably going to write it on a box. Maybe that's the sequel's title. So, yes, um, I don't know, was it worth the experience of playing through it? Do you feel like you understand Lara Croft more, or does this just feel like a different one? Or is this this? Or is this the proto version of the woman who clearly despises tigers, and dinosaurs, and anything else that happens to be roaming peacefully around these tombs before you arrived? I don't know about the one that comes out of the adventure, but the one that you play as in the game, I don't think takes like casual glee in rampant killing of wildlife despite the, the fact where, that after you do it the first time to quote get food mm-hmm. it's entirely optional as to it's totally optional and you get experience points for it yeah what and I, can salvage parts from them what i kind of wanted going into this was there are like survival meters like you mm-hmm. need to get fresh food you need to get water um you need to patch up your injuries mm. like i i almost wanted a snake eater kind of thing I could see that. Yeah, that could actually I be really interesting. that would have been awesome. Just let me loose in the jungle, give me an objective, and I have to survive long enough to get there. Mm-hmm. That would have been great. Yeah, the only problem being she doesn't really have much of, like, a backpack situation going on. She, there is no you place she could, you could reasonably have carry that? that. By putting a backpack on <laughs> the character. Sorry for the amount of snark in that one. <laughs> no, that made, that makes sense. Amazing! If you just changed a couple of core game mechanics, you would have had something really unique and amazing on its hands. 
You know, how how is this person raiding tombs and surviving at the same time? You know, what happens if you go into a tomb and run out of food while you're there? Are mm-hmm. you going to scavenge snakes that are crawling around? Do you need to go back out into the jungle and get more food? You know, before you I go don't back in? think I saw a single snake ever. Congratulations, you found the one island in the South Pacific that doesn't have snakes on it. The Irish chase them off, I don't know. <laughs> St. Patrick! <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't not. <laughs> Nerd talk. I promise we're not racist against the Irish. We're not. I love your Guinness. Okay, now now you're being silly. Now I'm joking around. But yes, they're... There is definitely something that I feel was lacking in the narrative of Tomb Raider. You know, how this person picked up a dark edge from adventuring and saving her friend's life, you know. There's a difference between adventure came to me well, it and was I'm more going of to a, fight my okay, way out of it. It was more of a, there's this weird mystical element that I can't explain because, like, the magic, like, ghost haunting stuff was, like, totally real and legit. The cultists weren't, like, just crazy. Right. They were actually kind of right. Yeah. They just went crazy because of it. Um, It's just rather than trying to bring back the Sun Queen's spirit, uh, Blara instead decided to just kill it dead dead rather than leaving her undead. All right. So, Lara's solution, killing things. It explains uh, a lot of her view on wildlife later in life. And, uh... So after that, she's like, oh, man, there's all this stuff that I don't understand that, you know, can't be explained and I have to go figure it out. So that kind of helps motivate the must adventure thing. I I really feel there's a difference between I was involved in an adventure because I was trapped in it versus I'm going to go out in the world and find the most dangerous places imaginable and explore them. One is you're looking for trouble. One is you're a survivor. She was and kind of going through like exploring in like tombs and stuff prior to that. You could find old like journals from Sam describing that. Yes, but usually you go to those tombs prepared for whatever mm-hmm. you're dealing with. This was a situation where she did everything all totally on the fly. unprepared. Right. I mean, at, at one point in the game, she was clearly lacking in some training that you would consider necessary for these things. Mm. You know, you had to learn how to track animals, if I remember correctly, at one point in the game. Hmm. So, yeah. It, it looked interesting. I mean, I'll give it credit as something that's coming out. I, I'm more interested to see where... This actually feels like kind of the year of the, the female protagonist, despite what comments by the... Uh, the developers of Remember Me were saying, this feels like a year for female protagonists because you've got Tomb Raider, which is kind of like the proto-female protagonist of a game. I mean, do you want to argue with me that Lara Croft is kind of the first major female in gaming? At least from a mass market standpoint? Protagonist? Yeah, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, if you want to go all the way Who back to the beginning, her own game. If you want to go yeah. all the way back to the beginning, you Samus. could probably say Samus. But you didn't know that she was female while you were playing. It. And you also didn't know anything really about the character mm-hmm. until future releases. Like you got some of it in Super Metroid. She was. You got. A you lot were just of, playing as this like robotic shell, and it was just like that happens huh, to be a woman. I guess that was a chick after the fact. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, like, any story that was attached to that character was attached by the fans. Like, Nintendo didn't officially try to give Samus a full backstory until Uh the terrible, terrible, terrible mistake that was Other M. Which, even then, most fans of the series are going, nah, that didn't happen, nah. But, like, we've already got Elizabeth established this year. Who's a phenomenal female character. Absolutely great in every way. Loved her role in the game. Loved what she did. She definitely had agency in her own adventure. 
I'd argue that she was the protagonist of Bioshock Infinite rather than Booker. Because her story mattered more. I suppose, but you weren't really... You weren't playing as her, mm. but she was always the reason for the game. Right up until the ending, she was the reason that that game existed. Yeah, although she only shows up, you know, a couple hours in. And even then, you don't really but Booker, understand what's going on. She's a key plot device, I would say, but... Booker wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for her. Yeah. Um, that game, arguably, would not have happened mm. without Elizabeth. She had a bigger role in the story than Booker did, where Booker was just the lens for the story to occur. He was the camera that it was uh, being recorded with. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth was the centerpiece. Hmm. I don't know. It's, it's, with gaming, it tends to be very tricky trying to pin down who the protagonist is. I always see it as it's whoever the story revolves around. Uh, because generally it tends to be the player character. Right. And most of the time those are the same person. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a whole lot of time. This stuff gets a little bit stickier. But even with those scenes when Elizabeth is removed from the player's direct vision, mm -hmm. she's still the center of the game. Especially in the asylum portion. Because even though she's not directly there... How does that make her any different from a plot device then, though? Well, at that point, you're... She could just be a, you know, MacGuffin. Like, you could replace her with an object that like opens tears at that point like the siphon well the fact that those don't have a personality behind them those mm. don't grow throughout the game those don't change things in the game elizabeth does so i'd say she's more of a character than booker is because even yeah. booker doesn't change all that much during the game booker just remembers parts of himself mm -hmm. and consequently bleeds because of most of it the only real change booker has is that the one you're playing as becomes more selfless where you change from the idea of well I have to get her to New York which you know results in the first time she hits you with a wrench <laughs> oh being hit with a wrench to I don't care the deal is off I'm taking this girl to Paris mm -hmm. and that being his main goal now it we're gonna have remember me coming out in July and that's that looks so awesome. Which features a female protagonist. Snake was telling me apparently they were having problems with trying well, to like get that's, a... That's what in, instituted this conversation. The idea that their producers were saying uh, it took us a long time to... Publisher, yeah. Yeah, that we had to sell this to a publisher and had multiple people saying you can't have a female protagonist. Because they don't sell. BS. Well, it, it goes into the cyclical thing where... They don't sell because you don't put as much resources into A, marketing, and B, manufacturing the things because you don't think that they sell. And then they don't get the money, and so they have weaker marketing campaigns or weaker products. This just goes round and round and round. Right. You, you can't tell me that... You have to make that investment. Some of the biggest launches of the year feature females as the main characters. The latest Blizzard release. Blizzard, biggest game company in the world is centered on a female protagonist, Kerrigan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, like, Heart of the Swarm kind of opens his leg up. It's a revenge quest, without a doubt. That, yeah, it's like she's used game. as, like, a love story type thing, you and know? Yeah, that it really feels weird. The, the is shoehorned in that she can only be important because this guy is sexually or romantically involved with her. Yeah, and that her only personal motivation is revenge. Mm. Yeah. Now, there, there's unfortunately a lot of stuff in the StarCraft mythos that gets left out and is never included in the games. That these were all added in either books or comics, just other things that aren't attached to the games that explain characters' motivations and really add depth to it. The same can be said for the Diablo universe and even a lot of the characters in the Warcraft universe. Like, walking around the world of Warcraft, you have no idea who the King of Stormwind is. Unless you read the comics about him. He's just that guy with weird hair who has the giant two swords. <laughs> 
<laughs> I really have nothing else to contribute to that description, like, which was just pure poetry. I don't know. It's it's kind of depressing in games that all of this cross media awareness that they're doing these days can leave people not knowing most of the story. Like even Tomb Raider did it. Tomb Raider mm-hmm. did backstory comics to explain Lara's previous uh, adventures. There's backstory comics for each of the Vault Hunters from uh, Borderlands 2. Yep, and likewise, well. there's tons of... The Borderlands 1, I mean. There's tons of Mass Effect yeah. backstory that's included in books and And the comics. novels and stuff. Yeah, it's like, we show up in Mass Effect 3 and go, who the heck is Kai Ling? And then some people go, oh, you'd know that if you read the books. It's like, do, or, you know what should like make me understand all of the characters in the game? Playing the game. I, I don't know. My favorite example in Mass Effect 3 was... This James guy looks like a jerk. I was going to drop another word there, but... I saw it starting like, to form on your face, and I was like, she's don't. She's going for the button. No. Um, this James guy looks like a jerk. Why would I ever bring him? And then I had someone like, oh, he's the coolest guy ever. Doesn't look like it. Uh, are they talking about Paragon Lost, the like animated? Yeah, the four episode animated series that they put out. Oh, it was an him. animated movie or something. It it got broken up into episodes. It's currently available on Xbox. Oh, all right then. So yes, there there's apparently a video series showing just how cool this guy is and why. It's like his, his knows military who this career is. thing. Yeah. He's apparently done a lot of really great stuff. I wouldn't know it. Yeah, because he just shows up in the game and starts being all like, you're not going to tell me what to do. And I'm like, I, I, fool, won't I have just saved the galaxy like twice. I will Best tell you step exactly off. what's on my mind. <laughs> Commander Shepard, strong woman, don't need no man. Actually, she needs a... Uh, needs some Turian in my needs life. Needs a Turian. So. Thank you. Or lacking that? A grell. Grells aren't bad. Drell? Thank you. One of those. I don't know. I, I would prioritize it as like Tarian. Well, Asari. that's not what your shepherd did. That shepherd no longer exists, so. True. Deleted from existence. Now part of everyone. Spoilers. Mm. I see what you did there. All right. That gonna, was a reference. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a minute. Oh, really? Are yep. we? Yes, we are. Oh, God. I didn't queue up a song yet. I don't well, know. What do you want to listen to? you a time. Uh, shoot. I don't know. What are we click, listening to? Click something. Oh, give me an artist. Something. Um, The click. Offspring. Uh, let's see. Do you, now, now I was... <sighs> Following instructions? Clearly not doing it right. Well, it was you d- didn't give me enough to go on and so I decided to uh, pick something for you and then you started saying something while I was typing Uh, talk stalling on air you didn't tell me you wanted to take a break halfway in the middle of the hour this is weird dude in your car you actually do want ice cream you should probably go to Baskin Robbins I don't know maybe you'll find some like indie mom and pop stand those are always nice you should look for one of those. This is a good place Steve. over here on Route 66. I don't know if they're open yet, though. Dude listening in your car? Pyro's going to cut this out, isn't he? <sighs> Knowing him, no. Not awesome. at all. <laughs> this has been given to the archives of the internet forever. What offspring song do you want to listen to? Whatever. Just put something on. All right, I'm fine. going to turn it down anyway. This is for the benefit of anyone listening in their car. All right, fine. I'm going to go with you're going to go far, kids. Steve, I hope you like the offspring. All right, here we go. We'll be back on Nerd Talk. Brian. I want Brian. Caboose, it's brains. Welcome back to Nerd Talk. I'm Pixie. Yeah. Yep, send. And, uh... We have Brian. <laughs> Hello, I'm Brian. We have a guest. Well, I have a student. I don't know. <laughs> Wanted to see how this whole game journalism thing goes. Is that what you can call what we do? Are, are we journalists now? Well, you officially are. I'm just the guy you bring with. <laughs> just the just having the degree makes me one? Okay. Uh, at, the, at this point, I would describe my role on this show more accurately as equipment. <laughs> also, a car- occasionally pack mule. I was going to say, if you were equipment, man, I'm going to need to get a much bigger bag for my carry-on. No, I'm self-carrying. 
I even booked my own airline tickets. I mean, I'm the best kind of equipment. Wow. Right? Self-transporting, self-sustaining, self-powering. Well, not self-powering. You do occasionally require, like, the hamburger and some beer. Yeah, but I usually get it for myself. <laughs> Just saying. Moving on. Moving on. Welcome to Kid... To... To kill a DJ. English Our bi- uh, WLRA's biannual fundraiser. We raise money uh, by going on the radio for six straight hours. Uh, we are in hour four. Uh, fundraising for uh, Advocate Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund, which helps sick kids and the families who love them in the Chicagoland area. Uh, it's pretty great, actually. So if you are of a mind to donate, anything helps, uh, you can scoot online over to tinyurl.com slash Hope Children's Hospital. Or come find us at the studio. I will be happy to take your money. I will also, but it will not go to any charitable organization. You probably shouldn't give me money. Just avoid the tall, bald man and you'll be fine. (laughs) Yep. This is good advice for most occasions in life. (laughs) All right. We can't be trusted. Just saying. Moving on. If you'd like to contact us, you can actually call us today. And I might even put you on the radio. You can phone us up here at 815-836-5000. That is 815-836-5000. Or if you're one of those poor souls who unfortunately has downloaded this, you can actually catch us online at our website. Uh, If you don't feel like listening to the remaining two hours of this show live, you can catch us later at nerdtalkshow.com, where we will have pre-recorded versions of this up. You may, in fact, even be able to send us a message, which one of us may even read and uh, respond to the rest of us about. Pyro, I think, handles our mailboxes. Uh, Actually, that would be me. Okay, Pixie actually handles our mailboxes. Pyro just edits stuff and laughs at us both. Um, And also buys the equipment. That, too. That's (laughs) also an important role. Uh... Pyro's not going to buy me food in Vegas for that one, is he? In probably fact, He's not. probably going to see to it that I starve at least one meal because of that one, isn't he? Probably. He's going to pay the restaurant not to serve me food. That would be hilarious, and I'm totally in favor of this idea. If you do this at Eggworks, I'm going to cry. <laughs> I'm just going to eat those seasoned potatoes right in front of you. As we have a bidding war for the server to serve me or not to serve me. <laughs> How much does that meal cost? Uh, ten ninety nine. I'll pay ten ninety nine for you not to give it to him. <laughs> I'll pay eleven to get it. <laughs> <laughs> All of the sad would be had at that meal. Oh jeez. The only thing I'm not looking forward to with our entourage, it is very, it is uh, exponentially harder to get a table for five people than it is to get a table for three. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I think we'll manage somehow. Somehow. You know, oddly enough, as awesome as that restaurant was, there was never a wait. Yeah, it was busier when we were there, like some days versus others, but... Never a wait. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have to visit uh, Trader Joe's again and watch Pyro eat an entire bag of cookies and gallon of milk. (laughs) He was so uncomfortable. (laughs) It's a day of awkwardness. This is entirely too many cookies. Awesome. So yes, as you can probably tell, we're going to be roaming to Vegas soon. And as again, I will remind people of the ongoing contest. If you visit Las Vegas, it's not much of a contest, but okay. I'm giving away a prize. It's a contest in my book. It is a contest that we successfully ran. As our only other contest that we have ever successfully run, we gave away an Aquaman t-shirt. No, we gave away a Nerd Talk t-shirt once for playing bingo on our website. If you remember way back, like oh yeah, someone three actually years got ago. That. I think the Aquaman shirt was better. You think the Aquaman t-shirt was better than the Nerd Talk branded t-shirt? Yes. From the fine people out at Cafe Press. Yes, because I'm still uh, going with the stipulation that if I ever see that person wearing that t-shirt, I will personally tackle them on regards that they're wearing an Aquaman t-shirt. Brian, are you wearing an Aquaman t-shirt under that? Uh, uh, Nope. All right, you're safe. We've upgraded to tackling. I thought before it was just punching. Like you, th- there was just punching happening to the. These poor days, wearer. I think I actually could tackle someone. You know, <laughs> you're getting a spry. With the increased physique comes increased violence. Suddenly, so much is explained. Yeah. 
So now that we've wasted the majority of this uh, first 10 minutes of the hour, this hour we're going to be talking about League of Legends. Feel free to call in. We'll chat with you about your favorite champ, or least favorite, or who deserves to be nerfed, who deserves to be buffed, or how sexy is Morello? You are a strange little man. You can call us at 815-836-5000. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk League. So yeah, on recent League news, the uh, LCS Gaming League continues. Uh, tomorrow, we're going... or Sorry, Thursday, we're going to be seeing matches between Complexity, Counter Logic Gaming, uh, Good Game University, yes, Curse, Vulcan, TMS Snapdragon, uh, MRN, Complexity again, and yeah, those are the major teams that we're going to be seeing. Uh, again, this is for the North American... Uh, LCS. We also have the European leagues going on. Absolutely loving Gambit Gaming these days. This would be the reform of uh, the old Moscow Five. You know, anytime you see these teams really switch it up. Like, I gotta say, this is also the most unathletic gaming league ever. Like, I'm just, I'm looking at the LCS page of the featured teams and. Who are you to judge, mister? I'm still working on getting rid of my love handles. Mm, working on it. I'm sorry, I'm looking at these, and that is not a finely tuned athletic team. Get on the right. <laughs> He's <laughs> serious I about see, his I job. Know. But his arms. Like yes. His forearm looks like like if he hit something, like he bumped a corner on something, I, he'd probably snap that. I, I picked up the keyboard and the arm fell off. <laughs> but yes, I... I have utter respect for the league players, like especially the ones that are switching Except up. Except for their body shapes. Except their body shapes. <laughs> I'll admit, the the walk between the players after a it's match like ends, I, I start taking you running and all of a sudden you become Judgy McJudgerson. Yeah. The, the walk between players at the end of a match is, I'm shaking your hand, but I really want to punch you. Stop hitting the desk. Moving on. Actual news in League of Legends. Uh, season 3 continues. They're still trying to get the formula down to anything near stable. Um, was it two weeks ago we saw the Blade of the Ruined King buffed to extreme levels to the point where it was being played on champions that wouldn't even normally run an AD item? The, this is an item that was draining 4% of a champion's health percentage with a basic attack and was restoring 2% of that as your health. Guaranteed. That item got spot nerfed so fast. Uh, the podcast that I regularly listen to uh, these days I'm on uh, man, which podcast am I on these days? I can't even remember the name of it. I've switched League of Legends podcasts so many times. Uh, but the podcast I listened to didn't have time to publish a full episode in between that item being buffed and nerfed. So at least we could say Riot's on it. Um, recent big news that kind of applies to... You don't r really do the support role. You're, I mean, you're a mid player. But I, it's when I'm not midding, I'm playing support. Yeah, you dabble in it. It's not your preferred role, though. Um, as I tend to prefer to mid, but if I'm playing with my friends, then I will be playing support. Yeah. When I'm... But they've kind of released a new champ, well, re-released a new champ that's right up your alley, though. You're uh, talking about Karma? The rework on Karma. Strong woman that she is. Leader of a country. Now that she's not, like, got that crazy inverse health damage -y thing. And the silly dress that even she said was silly. So yeah, Karma actually has been revised with a suite of damaging moves. Yeah, and her whole look and her whole visual effects and stuff, everything's different. Yeah, they... Uh, she's got, instead of like the weird bladed fans, they just got like little halo going on. Yep, glowing energy halo behind her head. Yeah, they, they really just strip that character out of the game and just put in someone entirely new that happens to have the same name. Which... Credit to them. They needed to do that. Karma was a non-working concept in the game when she came out. I mean, the, the idea that this champion is only useful 
when, when it's almost dead. When it's either almost dead or when those mantra points are up, so it can do two moves and then it's weakened for the rest of the fight. Mm. That that's unacceptable. That doesn't work in this game where team fights typically last, you know, between twenty and thirty seconds, and everyone should be using their full suite of moves at least two or three times. That doesn't work. So we've got New Karma. New Karma has upgraded from a full body dress to a battle skirt. Seems a little more appropriate. She's got the giant crest wings of glowing energy on her back, but it's actually her new move set that makes her most interesting. So, um, give me a second, I'm trying to pull up her moves. Game info, champs. Surfing the net on air. Let's see if they even updated her page yet, or if they just pulled that out too. Or page picture's still the same. All right, so here we go. Uh, no, Karma's description page on the League of Legends website is still reflecting her old stats. Good job, guys. Been a week and a half, and I think you missed that one. But oh well. Karma's old ability is used to revolve around selecting either friendlies or enemies to either do damage or do support. Mm. Karma's new style of doing things is she either or she gives herself a buff at the same time she does some kind of damaging effect with an extra debuff to an enemy. So almost all of her moves now focus on doing something to an enemy. She doesn't have ally moves anymore. What she has is extra abilities tacked onto her moves that can affect an ally, not that have to target them. Meaning that the new karma can actually really uh, survive in a solo lane. So far since the rework, I've seen karma run support. I've seen her run mid. I've seen her run top. The only thing I haven't seen karma do is AD carry because that's a terrible idea and you should feel bad for thinking about it, listener. And jungle. We're looking at you, Steve. Steve in your car there. You should just keep eating your ice cream and go about your day. That was a bad idea. Bad Steve. Good decision to get the ice cream, though. I, I appreciate hope you got chocolate, because otherwise you're boring. Well, no. You're only boring if you get vanilla. Yeah. Literally I, anything else is acceptable. I guess you can have strawberry. Is chocolate flake acceptable, then? Because, I mean, that's what I had, like, last week. It's vanilla, but it has chocolate in it. At least it's got stuff in it or okay. on it. Because there's stuff in it, just, it's okay. It's, yeah. I, it's I want the scoop of vanilla ice cream that's just like, you poor, sad person. <laughs> it's just like, what are you doing with your life that you can't come up with anything else? Hopefully Steve has a cup, not a cone. I love seeing those people drive down Drive with cones? With a cone. <laughs> Steve. We're thinking about you, buddy. We've got your back. Someone in their car named Steve is just like, how do they know? <laughs> Just we just do, phone. Steve. We just do. You should call in. We want to talk to you. 815-836-5000. If Steve calls, I'm totally going to be shocked. and <laughs> probably buy him an Aquaman t-shirt. And then promptly punch him. <laughs> yep. That's how it goes. <laughs> I'm just being fair and reasonable. So yeah, New Karma is definitely designed for... I can do multiple roles... I will be a support, but at the same time, I am my own character. Which is what a lot of the new supports are. And I commend League for doing this in Season 3. All of the new supports that have come out have had something else they can do besides just, I follow around the AD carry and make sure they don't die and, oh, spend three-fourths of my money on gold. Or on gold for wards. I spend money on gold. Not sure what it gets me, just more gold. Spend money on wards. Likewise, we've actually had a new champ released in the same week that Karma's rework came out. So essentially, it's like we got two champs at once. The new champion I'm talking about is Zack, the secret weapon. I was going to make a Lego Maniac joke, but you beat me to the punch there. I, I don't know what to think about this guy's design. And I have to assume now that League of Legends champions are named by pulling a random name out of a hat. <laughs> because this this is on the tail... Some of those aren't even names, though. Like, Karma, really? I'm sure there's someone in the world named Karma. Hippies have kids. <laughs> you mean like yours? Yeah, but they got boring and went with Jeff. <laughs> Who names someone Jeff? 
Steve. <laughs> Steve, who has a kid named Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> We're just narrowing it down here. The idea of picking Steve somewhere was it was a, a car, common name. Somewhere in a car, there's a guy who's now like crapping himself in terror. <laughs> How do they know? I was just eating ice cream with my kid, Jeff. <laughs> to Kill a DJ 2013, in which we torture Steve, who <laughs> eats ice cream and has a kid named Jeff. Do we predict the future? Wow. So, yeah, Zach is a blob creature. And also a Lego maniac, I hear. Also a Lego maniac. He's important like that. Needs to do things. Um, he's interesting in that he's a he's a manalist champ, which we haven't had in a little bit. Um, not since Zed, the previous manalist champion. Um, Zach uses his health to use abilities, kind of like Mundo. Also, he's kind of shaped like Mundo. You know what? Right, I'm noticing a trend. You guys should work on that. Um, Zach's big thing, and it's tied into his passive is that whenever Zack does a move it not only costs him health but his passive triggers which is called cell division a piece of him falls off when he hits an enemy and for a short duration he can actually go acquire that piece and regain the health that he had lost so he's losing bits of himself to do his moves but at least he can get it back mm -hmm. and then when Zack dies I'm not sure if this is on a cooldown or what, because I haven't actually played as this guy yet. I've played against him a few times. When Zack dies, he explodes into four pieces that go a, dir you a know, direction I away from him. I don't him. look at, like, a escaped lag lab experiment and go, what do we name this? I know, Zach. Zach. You name him Steve. <laughs> you name him, like, Subject 97 or something, but... Not Zach. Just saying. So yeah, when Zack dies, he explodes into four pieces that then crawl back to the place where he died. If they make it back to the center, Zack revives with health based on... I'd have on... been simultaneously terrified and found it hilarious if they managed to name him Dren, though. Dren? Splice. Ah, that would have been terrible. No one should reference that movie. No. No. Someone get the spray bottle. I'm worried about Adrian Brody's. <laughs> Multiples of them. Okay. Brought here by Steve. So yeah, um, Zach is a tank. There's there's little question about him. He His job is to run immediately into the center of the enemy team and hold them there while he uses his unstable matter ability to just do damage over time. Um... Uh, the ability to constantly be grabbing more health from his little blob things means that he actually is very survivable as a champion. His ability to use his elastic slingshot means he can actually get in very safely. And his let's bounce ability will keep him safe while slowing enemies and dealing massive amounts of damage to them. He's actually one of the safest junglers possible. Because it's like the dude almost always has flash available. Not only that, he can clear creep waves really easily by just blobbing up. He does his little spurt thing, and then he uh, grabs his globs that fly off. Wow, this sounds really terrible. I can't help it. The dude's made of gel. What do you want? There's going to be jokes of that nature regardless of what I say about this guy. Yes, he's spurting pieces of himself all over the place. Just goop and everywhere, and it makes a mess, and it's probably going to stain. It gets in Misfortune's <laughs> hair. Uh, oh, it's even worse trying to clean off of glasses. I'm just saying, Heimerdinger's going to have some problems. Wow. <laughs> I was going to go with Vein on that one, but thanks. No, no. Low hanging fruit. Too easy. It just keeps going. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Zach's backstory is really weird because, yeah, he does the typical I'm an escaped lab experiment. But then he does the whole, I was found by a couple that decided to raise me and love me. What? I'm sorry, looking at Zack, he's a destructive he's a gel monster of death. He's the blob, <laughs> literally. I'm assuming this couple was blind and had no feeling in their hands. Because <laughs> picking this up could not have been a fun <laughs> sensation. Get stuff all over your hands. It's just a mess. 
Yeah, we're going to keep going with this. Thanks, listener. This you is why we need this. a snake to be on in order to direct us away from our nope. filth. But As you said yourself, low-hanging fruit. You can't get that deadpan stare over the air, listeners, but Steve, but you there. get it. Steve with a wife named Kara. I'll just write this guy's narrative. Or <laughs> watch some poor person freak out in a car. <laughs> oh, man. I can't even. So, I don't know. The champion looks cool. Like As cool as a giant green blob can, I suppose. Very muscular giant green blob with a weird looking face. How can a couple fall in love with that thing and take it into their home? Again, yeah. <laughs> kind of looks like Majin Buu, only a buff green version of him. And, and that's exactly one thing that I heard one of the people that I play with regularly say. I, I, I'm going to probably credit Jace on this one, but I don't... I'm not sure, so I apologize if, if it was someone else... Why was the second skin for him a secret weapon, Zack, when he's just basically a purple version himself? You could have easily done Majin Buu, Zack. Yeah. Majin, Zack? That would have been a great skin. That the licensing awesome. for that probably would have been a nightmare. I don't know. That series was drawn in, like, 1984. I don't think anyone They're still, still pays attention to They're still making stuff with it. They still make video games and stuff with yeah. that licensed property. Really? I didn't yeah. think any of the relaunch stuff had gotten that deep into the franchise. Mostly to, fighting games, I there. think, if I recall. Yeah, Z games. terrible mm. fighting games. They they've only done like one like major like you know how Naruto did like the no because they did Budokai they did Tenkaichi yeah they keep going with super those. something can't remember it was back when I worked at GameStop random scramble ago. of vowels and consonants <laughs> oh gosh this is gonna drive me crazy someone threw up on the alphabet they did a they did like an uh like a RPG kind of oh I remember that one yeah. You could play as uh, what's what was Goku's older brother like the really okay, old? okay. So in the uh, 2010s, I'm gonna just go with in the 2010s. Rabbits? We had Broly. Raging Blast Broly. 2, oh, Ultimate Broly. Tenkaichi. That's the one I was thinking of. Uh, Dragon Ball Z for Connect, Budokai <laughs> HD Collection. Yes, that was a thing. We didn't review it intentionally, mainly because I got rid of my Connect. <laughs> and Dragon Ball Heroes Ultimate Mission. Hmm. Which came out in February in Japan, so it's not out here yet, I don't think. I don't Probably know. won't be because they've realized Dragon Ball games aren't popular in the States, just like Dragon Ball is no longer popular in the States. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, they've got a bunch of them on, mostly handheld games, actually. The only game I can remember playing Dragon Ball Z in was Jump Ultimate Stars, which I picked up while I was living in Japan, because the idea of using Goku to punch Ichigo in the face mm-hmm. was appealing. <laughs> that was a neat game. I got my hands on that, like like a ROM. For those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, basically this is Super Smash Brothers with anime characters. Mm-hmm. Pretty awesome. You could play as the kid from Death Note against Goku. Doesn't seem like a fair fight, if you ask me. Here, sign my book. (laughs) Goku, massive brain aneurysm (laughs) now. Eh. Sweet. Oh, he's just gonna come back, like, halfway through the season. Are you making a Death Note reference on the air? Seriously? (laughs) This book doesn't work. He just keeps coming back. (laughs) Do you realize that people at home are missing all the pantomiming you the were pantomiming doing? pantomiming of writing in a notebook? Because, you know, we're on the radio. Meh. There's cameras in here. None of them are on me, but there's cameras in here. I was going to say, you are, th- I think, safely in the blind spots of both of them. That's probably good for everyone not wearing pants. <laughs> Brian, you'll have to tell me, is he in fact wearing pants? I love that I she know, has like a screen down there. I just... love that she has to check. <laughs> you didn't see him walk in. He could have removed them in the interim, no, you know. He's just, <laughs> just, just, just in, the, in the process of getting comfy. Just know, gonna just make myself at home in off. this radio studio. <laughs> <What cha? laughs> yeah, I'll just like take it off your shoes. See, this is what Stretch. we don't get in the hour long version of our show. Time to mess around like this and question whether one of the hosts is wearing pants or not. Oh, please, that happens weekly. Well, yeah, <laughs> but at this point, we're all recording from a remote location, so it really doesn't matter if any of us are. 
In fact, it's entirely less likely. <laughs> Note to self, get pants for his own sign for house. <laughs> so yes, um, continuing with League, I don't know where you can really go from here. They're on champ like 110 now. And they've got every role pretty well covered. Like, right now, the big thing seems to be diversification. They want multiple people who do, who do the role in different ways. So they were advertising Zack as a jungler, which he does very well. But he's a jungler tank, which there's maybe three of those currently in the game, which three or four out of a cast of 111 is a, is a decent number. You can add more, give people more options. Now, he almost seems like a collection between... He's almost a mix between Singed and Amumu. He has a method of getting in and of holding people there, but he's also doing an enormous amount of percentage-based damage. Now, th this is definitely an improvement from the last champ that got added. Quinn. I forget, Pix, did you ever get to play the game since Quinn has been added? Uh, you know, I haven't played against her. So, I, I have I played it both against and as her a few times. Mm -hmm. She's got some advantages. Quinn's ability to mark an enemy champion with her bird valor, mm -hmm. and then specifically strike against them to do extra damage, mm -hmm. is great. Every few seconds, that contributes to a lot more damage on your target. Problem with that is, you have zero control whatsoever over which target valor is going to mark. If you're attacking an enemy champion, Valor will uh, uh, mark that champion. If you're attacking minions, it is entirely random where Valor is going to go. The bird doesn't like you, it seems, when you're farming. Birds that, don't like me anyway. That said, the bird is very funny when you're doing Quinn's uh, slash joke. Oh. It makes fun of the other champions from Demacia. Quinn apparently speaks bird. Much like Archer speaks cat. And uh, what's his name? Does not speak train. Yeah, and Ichi doesn't. Or Ichi does not speak. Train. That's right. That's his name. Not gonna let that one go. No, I do not speak train. Is not going to die. Thank you. People can fly. That that is a wonderful game meme that you have created that needs to come back. You know what? We should champion that meme. That should be the nerd talk meme. That and Steve. You're just really not letting go of Steve, are you? No, because you some, have like some repressed urges. Somewhere that you in need a car, there's still someone freaking out about that. It's okay, you know. <laughs> I know one person with that name. People don't go to jail for that anymore. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> if you and Steve need to have a talk, I would, but he's busy eating Steve. ice cream and driving his son home. <laughs> you are a terrible person. No, Draven is a terrible person. Segwaying into our next topic, Draven got a new skin. Oh? Gladiator Draven, which has the worst facial expression ever. I dare you to cue that up. Brian, this one's for you. I don't know, because, like... No. Oh, good lord. Yep. <laughs> well, I guess that's all the endorsement you need, folks. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that was... And he's even squatting. Yeah. That is just terrible. Yep, found it. Yeah. It's really the mustache. Yeah. That makes Draven terrible. Hmm. Draven's one of those champs that, man, they can just do anything with him. They shouldn't, but they can. Does she have a tiara? Well, He's yes. Yes, it looks like Draven is wearing a tiara. <laughs> He's a pretty mustachioed princess. Someone's going to kill us for that, aren't they? <laughs> Likely Draven fans. That's what I'm thinking. It's a crown, guys. God. <laughs> also, it's, clearly, that mustache says, I am a regal individual, commanding of respect and admiration. Isn't that every mustache on Earth? God, mustache auto aficionados are going to come at me after that one. <laughs> Says the clean-shaven man who couldn't understand why Lewis has a beard club. What? 
Yeah, we found that poster. We found a poster on the way over here. There's a little flyer advertising for the LU Beard Club. Can we not uh, make fun of the LU Beard Club on their radio station? I'm not making fun of them. I'm saying that they exist and you were in suspen- you were in a, a suspicious state of mind for it. Right. So, some concept art was actually presented at I was saying you should Pax stop East. making fun of them. Yeah. Talking about skins, some concept art was actually drawn on site uh, for PAX East. The sunbathing Leona skin. Oh. Yep. Is that what I think it is? You can do a search for that. It'll come up. <sighs> Greatly, even Draven found his way into that. <laughs> oh, God. As there appears to be an auto-add mustache button at Riot Games which adds Draven's mustache and eyebrows to any concept art. Okay, not as bad as I thought it would be, but... Because of the skirt. I like the Teemo shield. Is that an umbrella? Mm-hmm. Yes, Looks that like is an umbrella that she is wielding. Mm-hmm. Kind of fits the outfit. Yeah, as, as far as bikini skins go, it's rather tasteful. Mm-hmm. Likewise, did you find the Draven edit? I did not. Try to find the Surrender at 20 version of the page. Because that has the quick edit that someone did. They're totally appropriate. So yeah, I, I like where Riot Games is uh, going with this. Ah, found she it. found it. <laughs> I, I like that they're taking out some of the old champions that just don't work anymore. And So does that mean Sejuani's getting retired? Getting reworked. Yeah. She's, she's on the docket of champions that are being completely reworked. Because nobody uses that. First on the list, though, Trundle. Trundle okay. is being changed from the trash troll, the perpetually rotting, disgusting troll Mm -hmm. to an ice troll. Which makes a little more sense with his kit. Okay, but doesn't it make him a clone of Nunu then? Not quite a clone, but he's another ice creature. They seem to be trying to unify the champs into being from one of the areas of the game. Mm -hmm. So, the Fjordland hasn't gotten new champs lately kind of the forgotten region of the game. Sejuani was the last person that they added that was technically from there. Yeah, and you should pull up some art of her for Brian to look at me and tell me if that outfit is practical for the frozen tundra. Pig lady. Lady and her pig. Because supposedly that's where she's from. I don't know about you, but if that's where I was from, that's not the attire I would pick for a daily basis. That's much what less wears. for riding into battle. On a pig. I, I don't know. That's what I would ride in. I gotta say, wearing to wearing a skirt like that on a saddle, probably not the most comfortable Leather thing. bikini the in the winter. While riding a pig. Oh, that's really more of a great big boar. They're slightly yeah. different. Yeah. I do still like the death animation where she falls off of it and then it rolls on her. She reminds, uh, she reminds me of uh, another very risque uh, game. It's uh, called Unholy War for the PlayStation 1. Like I've never heard of this. It is, like, way out there. She reminds me of this girl named Magalyn. She rides this, like, weird dragon-looking thing, and her death animation is pretty similar. Uh, she falls off it, and then the thing gets back into its own state of mind because she was controlling it, and it runs her over. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. No, the, the pig collapses, and then it falls on uh, Sejuani, at which point, while she's laying there, like, flailing, it rolls on top of her <laughs> for her final death animation. Like, it's one of the joys that when someone actually picks Sejuani, I'm like, yes, totally can't wait to uh, take that out. But yeah, the new Trundle is an ice troll. And I think that's kind of cooler. Not to make a pun there. There was no pun. She punned that. (laughs) You said it. But yes. um, I want to see Trundle remade into something besides this is a rotting troll that uses uh, disgusting magic. Like, his ability that raises what people affectionately refer to as the turd 
is called Pillar of Filth. It's a big rock, really, but... Yeah, it doesn't look like a rock. <laughs> um, I thought it looked like a rock. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just... They're, they're reworking him to tie into the newest champ that's coming out, uh, Liliandra, uh, Lilisandra. I'm trying to pronounce her name. Let me see if I can even find her. The Ice Witch champion that will be released in a few weeks. The supposed next champ. Uh, Lysandra. I was adding way too many vowels to that. But yeah, supposedly they're tying Trundle's backstory into her. In that she cursed him. Whatever. I'm, I'm into a more tied world between the champs. I really liked when Jace came out and they tied him into Victor's backstory. That was really cool. Um, I like that they gave Sejuani and Ash a history when they came out. Um, having Leona and Diana's backstory, when those two are in a game together, feels epic. When, when you've got the moon assassin playing against the, the sun protector, that always feels cool. They're only adding to the game by giving these champs those interactions. Likewise, every time I'm playing as Vi and have a Caitlyn on the enemy team, I am gunning for that character. Despite the fact that Caitlyn's typically die horribly against Vi's without much effort. You know, oh, the whole running up and punching and then that uh, that ultimate man. Caitlyn can only run so many times and Vi can always chase. Mm-hmm. Chase, 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 chase. I do love playing as Vi. Punch, Vi. alt. Best champ ever. Got her own theme song. It's pretty great. Compliments to Ride on that one. They, they did right by picking up that song. And I found the Sejuani art practical. <laughs> we'll protect against not even cold wind. Yeah, a stiff breeze, um, ticks. Uh, what else does that uh, not leave her vulnerable to? Fleas from her pig. <laughs> <laughs> I did say ticks. We were close. Um, bit of water. There are more clothes on the new Headhunter Nidalee skin than there are on that. Huh. Which I gotta and say, she lives in the freaking jungle. That skin looks awesome. That skin jungle, looks like, I awesome. think it is a, pred uh, a uh, predator reference, actually. Yeah, all, all of the Headhunter skins mm -hmm. are, because so far we, we now have three Headhunter skins. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Headhunter Master Yi, Headhunter Rengar, and now Headhunter Nidalee. So yeah, all of the Headhunter skins are Predator references. Totally appropriate. Yes, Lee, totally exciting lately. Like, I I really wish they were going back to the idea of reinforcing the community like they were. Like, the idea of let's clean up our player base and make this better. Yeah, because uh, the infographic I was showing you earlier this morning shows more than 90% of League's players are are dudes. Yep. And I think there's something Creating a more for, welcoming space for women to play. Which we know women are gamers. Should be a priority gamers. for them. That, that's confirmed. Women are just as much gamers as men. It's just what they choose to play. And what they choose to play is partially dependent on what is welcoming to them. Mm -hmm. You yourself have made the case that you got out of the Halo community because of its players. Yep. No, you are someone who wants to be involved in games... You want to be involved in games, but if the community isn't there to encourage you to stay, why would you? No, Riot needs to get back yeah. on that. It's like, guys, gamer dudes, y'all sit around going, man, I wish I could find like someone else who appreciates me and doesn't make me get off my video games and stuff and like will enjoy my hobbies with me. And then you chase all the women out. By what making is this? sexist, ignorant comments. And then making everybody uncomfortable and harassing them and calling right. them fake when they do show up. And ugh. Now, my my biggest concern lately has been the the racism in League of Legends. That because it's, oh, it's an anonymous space where I can say whatever I want. Let me just type the most racist things possible. There we go. That's somehow okay. And Riot doesn't enforce on that probably as much as they should. Yeah. Well, I like, report all that. I and I will dodge if I see somebody has like a stupid epithet in their 
name. I had before. someone in a game Thank I was you. playing last night self identify as a Nazi. At which point Shouldn't that just get you insta banned? Yeah, that that was my thought. Just like <laughs> How has this person it's not like, been banned before that this? That and zombies are the two, like, things that we've, as a culture, decided it is 100% okay to hate these people. Yes. And kill them indiscriminately in our video games My, my response upon this person like, the typing the only way this, this could be worse is if someone were to tell you they were also a zombie. <laughs> my, my response upon this person typing this was, because those are cool, question mark. And it came down to the point where the 20-minute mark hit and, like, the rest of my team, many of whom he was insulting with various... Uh, racial hate speak we're just like we can let this one go right guys yeah so despite the fact that we were at five turrets gained had lost zero and were ahead in kills my whole surrender? team just went surrender just for not wanting to play with that guy yep just do not want to play with this guy and when the enemy team what? When the enemy team started or questioned us after the game as to why would you surrender, I flat out told him because of this. Really? I, I didn't give the name of the person, but someone on the team identified as this, and they're like, "What was the name? I'll report that." So yeah, the. Why would you not identify him to the opposing team? Like, there's no point in protecting a Nazi. My theory was because they did not personally see what was typed, that their reports would carry less weight than mine did, because mine are going to flat out say, this person said this, look at it. Like, that's one of the things I check when I'm doing my, uh... Well, yes, but if you're in the tribunal... Like, it's going to see, oh, this got, like, flagged by so many different players in the game. It's, I don't really think it's going to get... Yeah. Well, I don't think it's going to matter who said it if you they can see the whole they can, they can. team chat. So it doesn't matter once it gets to tribunal. Mm -hmm. my, my issue is, if someone tells me in a game, this person said this, and I can't see it because they're on the other team, mm -hmm. I don't report. Because I have no way of knowing that. Yeah, but I mean, there's no reason to deliberately shield that person's identity. Right, which is why I didn't when they asked. Yeah. They asked and I'm just like, it's yeah, just it was like, this I'm not. I'm just questioning why you would do it to begin with. I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. My thought like, was... Like, it's a Nazi? Like, that's jumping the shark there. It, that, it's a person that, that self-identifies as this. We can probably go ahead and punish this one. I'm just saying, if, if, if you want to jump on somebody, that's the person. That's a pretty safe target. Is that what we're saying here? Oh no, somebody got, they got reported on an internet video game. This right. is not the worst thing you could do to that person. Well, my basic thing was, is this someone I would ever want to play this game with again? No. No. No, it's not. Nobody should be subjected to that. Nope. Yeah, when it's to the point where four out of five people that were on this person's team were like, we don't want to play this game. The fifth person being that guy. Being that guy. <laughs> Clearly, there's something wrong. Yeah, no. I don't know, man. I don't even know. Can we even top that story? Probably not. Just like... Go to break? Yeah, we can go to break. Breaking. All right. Um, we'll be back at the top of the hour on Nerd Talk for Tequila DJ 2013. Last hour. Woo! Coming up. One more hour. Woo. All right. Welcome back to Nerd Talk, our very special To Kill a DJ episode, uh, raising funds for Advocate Hope Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. Uh, I'm Pixie. I'm Sun. And I'm Brian. And uh, Brian did not have his mic on. Oh. There we go. And I'm Brian. So <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, yeah, this is our last hour, raising funds. Uh, great cause. Helps uh, sick kids and the families who love them in the greater chicagoland area if you would like to donate any little bit helps you can scoot on over to tinyurl.com slash hope children's hospital uh or you know kick something our way over here at the studio and we'll put that in as part of our donation fund towards them uh every year wlra ed, as a group we all do these marathon broadcasts at a minimum of six hours and we usually put together a good few thousand dollars. 
for charity. You know, I think the big burrito guys do like 5K by themselves before we even start. But so. they're syndicated. Um, yeah, and they sell like little sketch cards with pictures of boobies on them. So I don't know how we can compete with that. There was that t-shirt idea we had a few years ago to promote our show. Yeah, that's true. I guess it's not too late, but... We are going to Vegas. We are, but we would have to find someone to print the shirts first. I could just write on white t-shirts with permanent marker. <laughs> with your handwriting, those will never go anywhere. We don't need them to go anywhere. We just need them to go off. <sighs> you are a wicked man. Anyhow. So, we are on the final leg. This is our sixth hour. And we're going to introduce this hour by reading from our mailbag. Can I get the mailbag song? Mailbag song? I think he wants us to invent one. I just oh. want to see if she will. <laughs> I will not give him the satisfaction of dancing like a little monkey, no. Okay, so let's check in our mailbag. Oh, wait, it's empty. But if you'd like to send us mail, we have an email. Uh, you can send mail to pixie at nerdtalkshow.com and it will get to me. Um, we may even write a jingle for it. If I get enough of it, sure, I will write a jingle. <laughs> see, that's a commitment. This is going to happen. Snake? I'm putting this on you, not only to write a dozen emails to Pixie in the next 15 minutes, but also to help her come up with the mailbag jingle. Because you He's can do sick. that. Plague victims have fingers? How insensitive are you? I don't even. I think I just blew her mind, kids. <laughs> and at the rate you're going, that's... Uh... Yeah. Moving okay. on. Welcome if you'd like to give us a call and give me someone besides this schmuck to talk to, you can uh, hit me up at 815-836-5000, and uh, I'll gladly put you on the air. It's got to be better than anything that comes out of Sen's face hole. <laughs> I'm five hours into a podcast, I don't care anymore. <laughs> Dude, you pull that I don't care anymore like half an hour into most podcasts. 20 minutes. Oh, hey, how about that? Uh, you guys, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> okay. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. All right. Yeah. So what are you looking forward to playing this year? Um, I'm looking forward to uh, playing uh, Monster Hunter Ultimate. Did you want to talk with the host? Which is already out. Yeah. So, I don't know, what's drawing you to the Monster Hunter franchise? Because we tried to review one. It didn't go so well. Uh, um, yeah, cool. Just the uh, hours of gameplay. And, like and, uh, You can literally just keep playing that game until, uh, well, until you get really to a certain point. Game. Point. And then it's just the online experience, like just, right. you know, like any online game where you interact with other, other people. Well, hello, caller. How you doing? Hello, Yeehaw. Hey. So uh oh. Pixie, how's it going? Awesome. Uh, Welcome. I figured I'd give you guys. I, I heard uh, Pixie's call for being uh, somebody to call in, though. Yeah, well, my trolling was just too strong. Yeah. Goes. Uh, it's been quite a while since I've actually participated in the show. I, when was the last time? I think I we have many friends, show. right? So, how's the arcade scene going? It's um, it's going. <laughs> it's going. It's kind of still the same arcade scene as it has been. Uh, most of the stuff that's being released lately is all redemption games. So, if you want good video, you still have to buy old. All right. Redemption games being, for those not informed, the games that specifically dispense tickets for the miscellaneous prizes that arcades hold. You know, the, the stuff like Ski Ball. Now, I'm not saying Ski Ball is bad, but, you know, for the most, everything that's coming out now. I did say a uh, bank game that is actually a ticket game as well. Okay. It was at the most recent show, which was actually in Las Vegas, which I believe you guys will be at, what, next week? Yep. yep. We're heading out this weekend for the National Association of Broadcasters Convention. Ooh, fun stuff. I was in, actually in Las Vegas back in October for United States Pumped Up Festival. I was uh, doing commentary on stream for that tournament. That but, sounds awesome. Well, it would have been better had I been Bruce Hill. I, I, was, I was commentating through just some of the worst sinus stuff I'd have had. So. Fun stuff. Oh, no. Um, there's a, a extremely local university and another Galloping Ghost style arcade actually opened up. Uh, it's called D&K Arcade 
if you leave the university, hang a left and go to the strip mall behind the Burger King, it's in there. It's actually underneath the China Buffet sign. They never actually signed the report. You know, so that it's a like secret a, arcade. That sounds like a great way to promote. We're the secret arcade under the China Buffet sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I still got a lot of hey, what happened to the Chinese buffet? But then again, we still get It's in the walk. back near the dumpster. Enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> you should just start serving Chinese food at the arcade is what people should do. No, that's a terrible idea with people playing dance games. Oh, well, man. There's a dance game there. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's open up. An all-you-can-play dance game yeah. is not uh, something you combine with Chinese food. No, you, you, you never, <laughs> never at all. Uh, their admission is $12. They're not open quite as late as, uh, as Galloping goes. I'm oh, sorry, how much is the admission? A dollar. A dollar. Twelve. Twelve dollars. Okay. Sorry, the, the signal is cracking up, and that's why we wanted to clarify. Yeah, well, probably outside the university, ah. surprisingly. Um... They they don't have quite as many games. I think they have. I want to say they only have forty or fifty, but they also have an air hockey table and foosball tables, and a pop up and a, like a home pop a shot in there. Nice. Uh, there's tables sitting around there. That they were originally considering doing like Friday Night Magic or anything, but they started looking around and seeing that oh, there's like fifteen billion places that do that right around Juliet. So. That went their way. Um, the two most recent games that got put in there, actually, my group put in, was which was my Pump It Up, and we put a virtual on. Nice. Robot hey, Fighter remember, Simulator. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. Big fan of it. Yeah, the, the, uh, the arcade actually, auction that we had gone to, I was actually really hoping uh, to be able to pick up that machine, but had realized that there was no way I could afford that and no way I could get it away from some of the people who came to that auction just for that machine. Yeah. We uh we picked that up from a distributor near here, so nice. But uh, like I, like I was saying before about people walking in there and still expecting me to be a China buffet, we run into something similar at the, at the store in the mall that we have, which you guys saw a while ago, but it's uh, but that was before it opened. Um, we still get people. It's been more than six months now since the Verizon store that was in there closed. We still get people walking in with their phones looking for help. <laughs> Despite the fact that your store looks nothing like a Verizon I, wireless. Yeah, I don't think yeah. most Verizon stores have stuffed Pikachus sitting on the shelf. No, we don't have stuff. Of, yeah, most Verizon stores don't have stuffed Pikachus sitting on the shelf and a giant Pac-Man on the back wall. Oh, I yeah. guess they're remodeled. Uh, can I help, have help with my phone? <laughs> I'm looking for a wireless headset. We have one of those with Pikachu on it. If you don't want that, you can leave. <laughs> Well, uh, usually, usually when they look up from their phone and sort of look to the left and see a DDR and a six player X Men, they they tend to get the picture. Yeah, <laughs> and then they promptly ask you, "Where did the store go?" Where did the store, uh, store go? They stopped paying their rent to the mall. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the store went. Uh huh. So, can but, you take my phone bill money? I can. It's I not going to help your phone. <laughs> it's not going to help your phone. It's going to help my wallet. <laughs> but. See, this is why I can't work retail anymore. I'm way too sarcastic. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't exactly work shifts at the store anymore. Right. Or, I, I, I should say I, I've only ever worked one shift. At too the much store. of the stupid. Yeah, I. Uh, I can't tolerate it, and I tend to be better off being in the back reorganizing things because we uh, have problems with a lot of stuff flying in and flying out. So you've been if talking about the store. You can go ahead and introduce it to anyone oh. listening in the area. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. I forgot I was... I, I want to help there. promote for you. I really do. The, the name of the store is Animazing. It's in the Louis Juliet Mall, which is no longer owned by Westfield, thank God. Woo! Um, <laughs> it's, it's in the wing that has Panera and TGI Fridays. It's, it's, uh, the, if you're coming in that exit, it's actually the last store on the left before it lives. It's it's hard to miss it. It's got a big glass front, and when you see it, you'll see a bunch of arcade games and Pikachu and all sorts of other fun stuff. I believe we have, uh, I believe we have some wigs on display in the front, and a lot of Doctor Who stuff in the front as well. Because Doctor Who and anime apparently go hand in hand. All of that blends. You, you well, it's kind of like it's kind of like at the gaming conventions, like when we go to Gen Con Indie or something. It's like. 
I don't know how Doctor Who has like really nothing to do with this, but it has an audience here, so it's just kind of there. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. There's a huge overlap between gaming and Doctor Who, and then there's a huge overlap between, between anime and Doctor Who. And as much as some people would hate to say it... I kind of see it more with... Uh, People who watch things will also watch this other thing. I can get that. Yeah, they will well, get together and they will be that recommended. Gen Con this. Indie was a board gaming convention. Which now features video games and Doctor yeah. Who and, and sci fi comics. stuff and books yeah. and art. Yeah, I mean, it's all part of expansion like that. Right. Um, I just, I just th- thought it was amusing. Yeah. I'm I mean, not saying it's bad. Uh, Things have actually gone well enough with the with the store in Joliet Mall that we're probably going to be opening another store up in Chicago Ridge Mall. Awesome. Uh, this one won't have arcade as it's nowhere even near the size of the Joliet store. It, I would. Oh. Do I you there get a lot of regular players at the arcade in your store? Uh, we do, but they the games all still make way more money at conventions. Yeah. But it's just it's just a function of having a captive audience. Right. Mm-hmm. So, a captive I mean, audience who needs something to do with their time. Yeah, so let's face to do with it. The time and a way to waste all the quarters they get. That that sales room, you you walk through it once, and it's pretty much all of these booths have the same stuff. I will go crazy if I'm here for 15 more hours. There's a lot of downtime at cons. I yep. think yeah. unless you're like presenting there for something. There, there's quite a lot of downtime. It's a, it's. A, I'll bring up a specific example because they they got just absolutely land blasted for it. Anime Iowa a couple of years ago, I believe it was a couple of years ago, decided they wanted to completely strike gaming altogether from the convention. And they ended up managing, they still ended up having somebody come in and set up like five or six console stations. And when it came around to the feedback panel at the end of the convention, I, it was an hour long and 45 minutes of it was, why did you get rid of gaming? We need so, something else to do other than shop. Yeah. So they they actually caught hell from attendees over that. As it should um, be. Yeah. That's the purpose of feedback. Yeah, that's the purpose of uh, that is the purpose of feedback, and everybody was eyeballing them like in in the convention circles that I talked to, going, "What are you doing? Why are you doing this? This is a bad idea. People need something to do other than wait for panels, or you're going to have a lot of destruction happening." Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, well, bored people tend to, you know, do channel that energy or... into less than productive ways. I'll put yeah. it that way. We were we were actually at a small convention over on that not this just past week in the woods for it in Evansville, Indiana, and people were just going crazy over the fact that we brought uh, a couple of dance games and dance freaks and some stand ups. They're they're absolutely floored. And these were just games we left out in the hallway for people to play. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So. I always but, questioned what would happen at the miniature conventions I go to if someone just set up a machine or two just off to the side of the area. Like, war gamers get bored, too. Having a video game nearby would do great. Um, I'm specifically remembering uh, Daikon in, in uh, St. Louis. Like, two years ago, they just set up an Xbox 360 console with Marvel vs. Capcom 3 on it. Yeah. At certain points during the day, there were lines of people just watching the games and playing it, even while there were tournaments going on. That was set up for free. Imagine if they had set up an arcade machine with actual, like, quarters. Exactly. And that's uh, that's what we did at uh, Evil Con. We've, we've also kind of expanded, in the last year, we've expanded out to actually selling in the dealer rooms at the conventions it, it works out nicely given that we have the store as well so we're you know constantly churning product but we still we still do the arcade we do console setup so we had a console room at this convention and one of the things that the the mall ownership wants us to do at the chicago ridge location and i actually mentioned this to you earlier was they want us to start selling like magic and pokemon and all that stuff and instead of doing the arcade like we like we originally would have so get some tabletop gaming back in that mall. Oh yeah, that that needs to happen at some point. And actually, it's really the area that needs a refresher. Like, yes, there is leisure hour hobbies in the area, but they don't feature a play area, which is how yeah. you actually keep those stores going. Well, the, 
the trick with card gaming in the Joliet area is if you uh, there's a place called Top Cut in Plainfield. They're fairly recent. I want to say they opened up a little under a year ago. They're a pre-existing chain. Um, they hold FNMs. They do EDH or Commander Leagues regularly. They have Yu-Gi-Oh! They have uh, Kaijudo or Van- Cardfight Vanguard or whatever. It's purely a dedicated tabletop gaming store on Route 59. Which is part of the reason we didn't really eyeball doing that too much in Joliet. Because there are all there are alternatives in the Joliet area. Uh, there are there are easily accessible alternatives. Right. Believe it or not, Plainfield has two Friday Night Magics within a mile of each other. Which That's is kind crazy. of surprising because for a while Magic had all but died out in the area. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of players from the area still end up going to uh, Game Storm or Graham Crackers and Naperville, but for the most part, it's, you know, for the most part, it's picking back up a little bit, but it's not actually in Joliet. Mm-hmm. I couldn't specifically tell you why it's not in Joliet, but it, is, it isn't. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, game stores in the Joliet area don't seem to do very well for some reason. I don't. Th- it's not that there's not a market here. Clearly, there's a bunch of gamers here. It's just the stores tend to wither after a while. Yeah. Um, well, it was. I was gonna say one of my coworkers called it the uh, the inevitable Joliet screws it up. <laughs> All right, I can see that. I'm intrigued <laughs> of seeing where this theory comes from, because usually it's the game, it's the store owners that get behind the wrong game systems or yeah. invest too greatly into one thing. That that happens a lot. Um, well, I know a pixie. I know you know about the Dave and Buster's in Orland. You've, uh, you've been there. Uh, uh, yes, I've been there. I uh, yeah. shot a news package there, actually. Yeah, you, you shot the news package there after I, after I think I gave you their, informa- their contact information. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if Sen has been there. but I have visited once. Uh, originally, Dave & Buster's actually, was actually looking at opening up in Joliet. And they, in the middle of their data collection, noticed a trend for a lot of restaurants and the FECs that aren't Chuck E. Cheese to just kind of tank after a few years. Like there's, there, there's a huge surge, and then everything would just drop off. So they uh, they decided to turn their focus and and uh, actually fight the battle with Orland Park to get uh, some coin op in there. Because up until Dave & Buster's, coin, uh, Orland Park actually had an ordinance on the books that no two coin-operated devices that aren't cranes could be within, couldn't be within 50 feet of each other. That is a weird law to have. That is an oddly specific kind of law. It is. It's a law specifically designed to prevent arcades from happening. Did they just not want an arcade? Because I think I remember way back in the day there used to be an arcade in the Orland Mall. Um, Maybe I'm thinking Fox pretty, Valley. No, you're thinking Fox Valley. Because aside from the Marcus Theater... I, th- I think they had an exemption later on where if the game was uh, have one of those green stickers on it, you could do it. So you, you had, had to buy a green sticker. Part. But for the most part, they they had that law. On the, or they had that law on the books, and I don't know why they did. It's just one of those weird anti arcade laws that popped up in the uh, mid to late eighties. Kind of oh, because to... video games were destroying the children or something? Yes, yeah, because it's, it's towns didn't want to deal uh, with the establishment of arcades. Yeah, it's extremely similar to the persecution that uh, Pinball got in New York, specifically. Like I want to say that was in the 1950s or so. And it took a called shot to get help get that overturned. Hmm. So. The sordid historical uh, struggle of video games. Yeah, you, you wouldn't think there was that much history behind it. It's very dramatic, actually. Yes, quite. This makes me wonder if there was ever a uh, a video game history special on on pinball. That'd be cool to watch, right? Now, like I'm remembering back the the Icon series that G4 used to run, and likewise these days, uh, I get my gaming history from a series that uh, the GameSpot website runs called Escape from Mount Stupid. <laughs> that is a brilliant uh, name, and I wish we thought of it. First. It is a great series, and I, I will wholeheartedly endorse it on this show. They are funny. It's the the 
GameSpot. Stop endorsing things that are funnier than us. We're going to lose our audience of like three people. The GameSpot UK website hosts this show that it's it's their host, Danny O'Dwyer, just talking about one aspect of gaming history, whether it's a franchise or a specific console or a genre. Hmm. Very worth watching. If I had much time for media consumption anymore, I would probably check it out. Right. But... Well, our fair listener, you can probably check it out, Steve. <laughs> Continuing. All right, Continuing. Um, Brian actually here has to skedaddle, so I'm going to usher him out of the studio while you guys uh, chat. And I actually have to get going. I've, uh, I've arrived at my destination, and I have to do some furniture moving. I'm going to sit here and talk with myself for the next few minutes, so listener, have fun. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks for uh, joining us, Yeehaw. And uh, thank you, Brian, for dropping by. Yeah, no problem. I had fun. Guest, yeah. it was great to have you both. Well, guys, have a good rest of the shift. All Always right. will. Take, I guess we'll take a break then for a few minutes, and we'll see you for the last half hour of Nerd Talk. And we return with the final 30 minutes of Nerd Talk of a very special To Kill a DJ edition while we raise funds for Advocate Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. I'm Pixie. I'm Sun. And if you feel like donating to help sick kids and the families who love them in the Chicagoland area, you can scoot on over online to tinyurl.com slash hopechildrenshospital. Or you can uh, swing on over to our uh, station over here at, w, uh, at uh, WLRA on Lewis University's campus. And, uh, yeah, us at the station will take care of that for you, too. So, um, now that we've managed to get rid of both of our guests in one throw. Yeah, most most shows can't do that. We've got style. Cut everyone, go back to the basics. Sure. We even lost Pyro this hour. We lost Pyro for the whole show. I meant the show. Can I have Pyro back? I need my foil. <laughs> right. Nice. So, um, David Hayter, uh, not voicing Snake for uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. Fans are kind of outraged. Hideo Kojima shoots himself in the foot, takes one beloved part of franchise, removes it entirely, kind of upsets the voice actor who, you know, made the series. Well, he's been in that game. He's voiced the same character for nine games over 15 years. All the way he's, back to the beginning. He's David Hayter and Cell Snake are kind of synonymous at this point. Right. You hear the voice, and without actually seeing the character... You know who that is. Right. It, it worked in the Smash Brothers trailer. Mm -hmm. Just hearing that calm noise and seeing Solid Snake, or hearing David Hayter's voice, you know... Metal Gear, Snake, yes! Yeah. It's so, coming. And I'm like, if it doesn't look like Snake and it doesn't sound like Snake, how can we even say that this is Snake? And I'm just, I'm just, I think I'm done with Metal Gear as a franchise. I really think I am. I don't know. It, I like the idea that Hideo Kojima tells interesting stories about war in the modern world. At the same time, I just want to play a video game. I don't want to watch a movie and then play 20 minutes of a video game but and then watch another movie. That's what it's always been, though. And right. this calls back to, I think, where I grew up with games was that cutscenes were a reward for getting through the game to a certain point. Right. But candy is terrible if you're given tons and tons of candy. You eventually get you're a stomach You're saying this ache. to the woman who has literally 30 Cadbury eggs in her bag right now. And you're not eating them all at this moment. Only because I have to talk. <laughs> as soon as we're done with this show in about 20 minutes, I'm going to be all over this bag. <laughs> I'm going to have a very nutritious burger. Oh, wait. By comparison, a very nutritious burger. By comparison to chocolate and fondant. There we go. Yep. But, uh, so yeah, this is kind of like gives me sad feelings in my heart uh, reading this interview. He came out with a statement yesterday. Um, let's see. Some key quotes. Uh, can, asked if uh, Konami had attempted to hire him to reprise the role, he responded with a simple nope. Uh, now he's given a statement yesterday uh, where he s says he was told by a member of the Metal Gear production team without reason or explanation that his services would not be required for the new game. 
a decision that left him, quote, bummed. My uh, guess is Snake is mute for this game. Snake has I've lost got his vocal some other guy. Points. What's his name? I know. Uh, and it's sad. I, let's see. I really can't believe this. the guy who picked it up. Richard was, Doyle, I think, is the name of the new guy. I'm wicking this. But, um... And everybody's justifying it with, well, you know, the character's older now, and so the voice needs to be different. So what? Theoretically, Hater is also older than he previously was. You are continually in a process of becoming older. He's a voice actor. That's part of their job, is to make their voices sound different for different occasions. Well, that doesn't even make any sense. Um, another quote of his is... Uh, to be clear, I love being part of the world of Metal Gear. I admire its technological innovations, the gameplay, the political message of it all. But primarily, I love the fans of these games. Two grown men burst into tears upon meeting me at the Vancouver Fan Expo last year, Hater wrote. Now that is a rare and excellent role. You know you're making an impact, and I love doing it. If it were my choice, I would do this role forever. To hear anyone else's voice coming from Snake's battered throat makes me a little ill, to be honest. But the truth is, it's not my choice. Any and all casting decisions are the sole purview of Hideo Kojima and Konami itself. And that's fair. And I'll get by. I am not lacking for employment on any level, but I didn't want anyone to think that I was intentionally abandoning them. And know that I will miss this job and this character very much. It's like, oh my gosh, hitting in the nostalgia and the sympathy and the sadness. Yeah, I'm looking up Richard Doyle's uh, voice acting history. Was I right? The Fury in Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater and Big Boss in Metal Gear Solid 4. Also the narrator in Ninja Gaiden. I didn't realize there was a narrator in Ninja Gaiden. That's not what you were focused on, I'm, I'm going to assume. I was go out more, on a limb. I was more uh, Ginsuing dudes. Has apparently been in Cheers. Played voices on Ben Ten, uh, Ben Ten, Enoch. I don't because even know who that is. you totally watch that, don't you? Yeah, totally, always. Yeah. Also was in TV series such as Charlie's Angels, Dallas, Mash, Cannon, The Mod Squad. Mm hmm. He's an actor. Sorry, Mr. Doyle. I don't quite know who you are. Maybe that can. It's possible for that to change, I suppose. Look, I'm not saying that I'm not open to new ideas as far as this game franchise goes. There are people but dancing outside are the studio. I'm sorry, I can't really even. really going to have to prove yourself if you're taking this role. Yeah, I mean, like I said, this character's been around for 15 years. This is like the poor, unfortunate person who is picking up the Joker the next time he ends up Not on even, film. because there's not that much nostalgia attached to The Dark Knight. Like, like I said, this franchise makes grown men cry. Like, this is a established thing. Yes. David, I would say that I grew up on Metal Gear. David Hayter has been Metal Gear since the first game He's that been revived sick. the character. You know, before this, Metal Gear as a franchise okay. was two games on the NES. And nothing was seen again until the pl the first PlayStation. Mm -hmm. That's like, man, there are kids driving now who were born when David Hayter started doing that. Isn't that something? Yeah, and it, it's definitely a slap in the face to the guy. Mm -hmm. That yeah, just you don't meet our. We needs don't want anymore. you. We didn't even ask. Like, that has me tempted not to play this Metal Gear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is, and, you know, with Rising, I was just like, well, this is definitely not, it doesn't play like previous games, <laughs> so it's just, this isn't what I go <laughs> like there. Like, they even kept this the Raiden voice actor the same. <laughs> Raiden! And he's a cyborg now, so like what the, the heck? the worst character ever made. You'd think that voice would change. <laughs> Turning Raiden into a super cyborg killing machine didn't make him cool. Yeah, you can't... I don't know if there's any way to redeem yourself and be cool after you were doing naked cartwheels. You can't put him on a motorcycle with a guitar leaping over a flaming canyon full of kittens and be cool. Why are the kittens on fire? No, they're the... just in the canyon. 
I guess they would be on fire then. <laughs> Oops. Wouldn't they be like just maybe at the fi- finish line cheering him on? Okay, that works too. <laughs> at least in that hypothetical scenario, you're not setting kittens on fire. What is wrong with you? But I'm just saying, there's no way Sen to make... Sen gets weird when he's hungry. There's no way to make Raiden cool. Yeah. Again, super street samurai who can, like, slice a Metal Gear in half as the first boss of the game does not make this character cool. I'm just saying. That, can, can I get into my rant about the ending of that game and how sure. ridiculous it was? Go for it. I'm very convinced now. Hideo Kojima, huge pile of drugs. <laughs> Enormous pile of drugs. Because he supervised the ending of this thing. Hideo Kojima gave his stamp and said that this was okay. The last fight of Metal Gear Revenge and Engine Engineance was me getting into a fist fight with a U.S. senator who is built like the Hulk with nanites in his body, making him invulnerable. I did that. Hideo Kojima asked me to do that. That, that was what this game... Uh, games creators did you know what our fans are gonna like they're gonna like getting into this fist fight with a u.s senator who has superpowers who can actually pick up and throw a metal gear that is what hideo kojima thinks you want to play no hideo kojima that's how people's brains start bleeding That's how people go, I feel like I'm playing a 12-year-old power fantasy. Well... This is how you take what is a game plot and you not only jump the shark... This this isn't isn't a game plot anymore. This is stuff I'm pretty sure you were doodling in your math notebook in middle school. Yes. And then he punched the senator so hard, he punched his way through the Metal Gear and blew up the building behind it because that was cool but then the senator came back out and punched me so hard that I flew and blew up the building that was behind me maybe I'm not giving enough credit to middle schoolers maybe I should go down to like grade 4 keep going (laughs) and then stuff went boom and it was amazing And then the creature that is about a hundred times his size. And the cops are robots too, but they're the bad guys. They're the bad robots, so it's okay when I cut them up. All all I'm missing is for someone to go, I've got a force field. (laughs) That game series jumped the mechanical shark into orbit. And then made it a cyborg. And then, yeah, and then probably sliced it into a few million pieces. Just to say that it did. You know, for a tech demo. Like, about the moment when I started getting to a fist fight with a U.S. senator who tore open... You're still his, on this, aren't you? <laughs> who tore open his shirt to show just how manly man he was, I was like, all right, Hideo Kadima, you've played your cards. They all say crazy on them. I don't know if you can make a serious game again or a serious commentary about war with, you know child soldiers and organ harvesting I don't think you can make a serious commentary about that and end it like that this would be like if Bioshock Infinite ended with a party in which everyone just looked at Booker and went you're the Sandman now it would make just as much sense now that'd be like That'd be like if Comstock baked you a cake at the end or something. I don't know. And then just said congratulations to you and it ended? Yeah, that was an Evangelion rip. Or, I don't know. Anything that would make less sense. And that game did it straight-faced, as if this is just happening. And this is what leaves me with no faith in the story of the next Metal Gear. Because somewhere in that world, somewhere in that universe, is Raiden punching a U.S. senator with superpowers in the face. And that's okay in that universe. It, 
I have no f- more faith in the Metal Gear Solid series because Hideo Kojima has already jumped the shark. So yeah, I don't know. I think I'm kind of done with it. I think you have my opinion because I just expressed it over like 10 minutes. Yep. Which is funny because I have a I have some older Metal Gear franchise cosplay in the works. I, I, I would happily go back and accept everything Metal Gear up to uh, Sons of the Patriots. Mm. Or Guns of the Patriots. Sorry. I was going to say... Everything up to Guns of the Patriots as Metal Gear. Because that told a very cohesive story of Metal Gear... Or of uh, Solid Snake's life. And it even had to go back to the prequel to explain Big Boss's life. Mm-hmm. To give perspective to those previous two games. And mm-hmm. more perspective for the fourth game. Mm-hmm. That's okay. The moment we're incorporating cyborg super ninjas into the insanity that was Metal Gear Rising, your world is done. You have done everything. You have a person in that world who can chop a Metal Gear to bits using the weapon he is holding in his hands. Who cannot be killed even when crushed with a ship. An actual boat driving over him on land. Or, you know, stabbed hundreds of times. Like, it seems kind of to devalue yes. also the, the entire... I mean, the, fr- the franchise is named after the Metal Gear. It's supposed to be this huge deal. Right. Trying and, to destroy and one. And part of it was the horror that someone would equip this giant robot of destruction with nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. Part of the point of the Metal Gear was it is terrible that someone would come up with that. But now, yeah, you've fought like a dozen of them at the end of Metal Gear Solid 2. They were just a thing. You killed one in the opening of Rising. And so I think that kind of tends to devalue what has been previously established. I don't know. Right. Playing as Snake now in this game, it's it's just going to be, why didn't we just get Raiden? He could have just run through here and cut up everything. That's like, not even by virtue of being a strong character either. No, it's just the fact that he's he's better physically than Snake. Mm. What does Snake have? Survival skills and the ability to stand out of someone's cone of vision. What does Raiden have? He can kill an entire army with his sword with barely trying. Also produces yeah, so lightning. much for Snake being the perfect soldier, right? Yeah, no, you've just got Raiden. Raiden can do everything. Raiden can be shot directly in the face with a rocket launcher and watch it skim off. Snolid, uh, Solid Snake has trouble with bullets. Like most humans, yes. Bullets, I'd imagine you would also have trouble with bullets. Bullets don't do 0.1% of Raiden's total health. He just kind of stands there as he gets hit with them. Like, the idea of creating a new Metal Gear in a world where that character exists is just silly. Unless this is a prequel, which I hope that this is. I really, really hope that this is still going back to Big Boss's storyline. Because if it's not, there is no point to this story. Anything Snake does in this game is completely invalidated by the fact that Raiden exists. I don't want to play as him. He's not a cool character. Solid Snake is a cool character. The boss is a cool character. Raiden is what happens when a 12-year-old's power fantasy somehow survives to adulthood. It it just speaks so much to When when people say games are immature, they point they're pointing at that. They're pointing at revengeance. Devil May Cry was more mature than Metal Gear Rising. I don't even. Devil May Cry didn't try to make light of child uh, injuries and organ harvesting. Devil May Cry, or uh, Metal Gear Rising tried to make jokes out of these things. 
Yeah. That's something to think about. Anywho, so we've got like 13 minutes left in the show. What else do we want to do? We can contemplate what we're doing in the future. I suppose we can. So Big we're going to be in Vegas for the next to? week. Um, so obviously we won't be playing games really then. Well, no, there will not be a <laughs> Although you are going to drive around in Vegas and get really disappointed when you see a gaming or arcade on a sign outside a b- building before, in the like three seconds it like takes you to realize that they building. mean video poker and not like DDR. Yes. I don't know. I don't know if old me can play DDR. I haven't in years. But yeah, um, I don't know. I'm looking forward to Vegas. Uh, definitely planning on hitting GameWorks to see if anything new has come out in arcades since then, since that's one of the flagship stores in the country. Mm. And they should have some decent stuff. So that could be a thing. Oh, movies, as far as coming out, I kind of want to see the new Evil Dead. Like, I've never seen the original Evil Dead. That That's something I just deal with because I know it was a college film project. And yes, it's Sam Raimi. Yes, it's Bruce Campbell. But... I don't really like watching the old classics. Like, I am I feel like I don't get something out of them. And maybe it's just because I'm not a film major. Maybe it's because I don't have a ton of nostalgia built into me. Mm. But... Oh, hey. Uh-oh. Stall me. Someone calling to rant at me about not liking Evil Dead. Uh-oh. Did you all right? Someone's calling to call me out about Metal Gear Solid, isn't he? Hello and welcome back, Eha. I wasn't hey. expecting you to come Uh-oh. back. Uh, I wasn't expecting to be coming back either, but it would help. But uh, we got everything loaded in very quickly. Awesome. Um, I was just listening. Uh, you may be you may want to double check and make sure that Game Works in Vegas is still there. Oh okay. no! <laughs> the last I heard, they closed up. I wouldn't be particularly surprised. Uh, I wouldn't be either. Um, I don't know, if, and I don't know if this place is closed up yet. But if you're looking to go to an actual arcade, the place to go to in Las Vegas is Gemini Arcade Palace. Uh, I don't remember the specific address, but I do know it's on Sand Hill Road. Okay, um, sounds worth looking into. Yeah, uh, they have lots and lots and lots of music games. Cool. Uh, I believe they, uh, they Please have tell me there's a Tyco the- Drum Master. Yeah, oh, no, Tyco yeah, it is closed on the Las Vegas Strip. I'm, I was just looking this up just now. Yeehaw's All right. right. Gemini Game Palace. It was announced in February 2012. All right. I, I mean, like I said, I was there in October. Um, I don't know if uh, Gemini is closing temporarily. They, uh, they're going to try to find a new location. Their, their location want, wanted too much money at least. But when I was there, they have a relatively new pumped up. They have a couple of uh, two or three DDRs. They have a couple of improves. They have Beatmania 2DX. They have Tyco. They have Police Trainer. They have Marvel 2. They have just a whole bunch of games. Sweet. Definitely so be worth looking into. You'll want to check that one out. And uh, everything just runs on quarters there. All right. So, but um, I also heard the end of the Metal Gear Rising rant debate. A rant debate. Um, I didn't really get to listen to the podcast. What What was your actual opinion of the game itself? You know, I think you actually had fun playing it, but you weren't particularly attached to the narrative, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, I, I enjoyed the gameplay. I thought the gameplay was neat. The slicing mechanic was cool. Running around the environment, just feeling invincible, was neat. What I didn't like was the story that they were trying to tell. Like, I didn't appreciate the idea that they're trying to put humor into this really horrible story about child exploitation and uh, the meaninglessness of life in a world where a soldier is the most common vocation. Okay, I was because I, I didn't have the the backstory on you on that one. It was like I'm I'm pretty much in agreement with you. I love the gameplay. I absolutely love. I I can't what? stand any time a cutscene comes up in that game. Yeah. Well, so it's basically the opposite of the thing that I was saying. Whereas before cutscenes were a reward for progress, you're seeing them as like this sucks. This is dumb. It's interrupting the, me. The <laughs> cutscenes make me not want to keep playing the game. Yeah, I didn't have that problem. I, I had a little bit of a problem with Metal Gear Solid 4, but I didn't have that problem with Ryzen. Uh, I just I felt the cutscenes actually flowed with how ridiculous the game was. 
as long as you're seeing them as ridiculous. But when you pair them with the overall narrative with that's behind the, the Metal Gear franchise. With the seriousness of the material in the story. And, and admit it, every single Metal Gear has its weird, quirky moments. Yeah, but like those the are bit suppo- with the calorie mate. <laughs> the calorie mate and, uh, what's his name, uh, Private Johnny. Mm-hmm. Johnny Sasaki. And- yeah, like every Metal Gear has its weird stupid moments and it has its moments where it is trying to be funny but not at the expense of more gravely serious topics right like well, you can you can pin the entirety of rising uh, the entirety of rising story on kojima right that this is kojima's a known factor he he pushes buttons I, so. I I could appreciate the humorousness of when the game was still lighthearted and I was investigating a lab in Mexico before any of the really serious moments took off that Raiden would show up in Mexico driving his silver supercar <laughs> saying he was in disguise because he, uniform? Yeah, he was wearing a poncho and a uh, sombrero. That was funny. That was funny. That was humorous. But the moment the game turned after that where you realize they are pulling the brains out of children to put them in adult soldiers because they're easier to train. That is atrocious. All humor should be gone after that. Uh, I didn't I didn't feel that Raiden kept up on the humor. Maybe the, the, the rest of the codec calls. Because Raiden was pretty dead serious. Watching the the rest of the team still able to joke around after that was was unacceptable from the tone that the game wanted to create. If the game is using the mutilation of children and the imprisonment of children as a device, your humor needs to go away. It, there's there's a tonal shift there and you're, and having I think his problem is the inconsistency thereof yes and, and some of that might uh, some of it might have to do with the odd production cycle of the game mm-hmm. I think a lot of it also has to do with the translation and uh, yeah the translation uh, you, gotta, you do have to remember Rising was literally a salvage game yes so the storyline well, the storyline may not have worked with the game and they may have they may have had to do some stuff I don't know if you'll notice Quentin Flynn's uh, Quentin Flynn's voice acting flips out every so often. Yes, where he switches between "I'm okay, normal Raiden" and "I'm Jack the Ripper." And I'm Jack the Ripper, and he, he's doing it at points where he should be Jack the Ripper, and at points where he should be Jack the Ripper, he's talking like normal Jack. Yes, so it was there, very inconsistent. I, the, the tone is weird, but I think a lot of it, it, it does have to do with the way the game was salvaged. It's it's entirely possible. I mean, I'm not, I'm not hand waving. Let's scoop brains out of kids as, hey, that's funny. Ha <laughs> ha. No, that, that's horrible. But yeah, and and it was addressed as horrible. The problem I'm having is we shouldn't be going to a joking segment immediately afterwards. It, it's like how we do on the news here. Like when we're here at WLRA, we're doing the news. You don't go. You don't jump right from like a bunch of people were killed at this car bombing right into and the winner for the silliest dressed dog contest. Right. Yeah, you got you got to bring it down a little bit. Yeah, you got to kind of like have some semblance of order to things. Right. When when you're switching from the scene of Raiden slicing a child's arm off, immediately going to that child calling you on the phone, all bright and happy. Your tone really changed there. Well, like, I'm all for that character surviving. That's cool. Yeah, George was actually a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm glad that that character uh, lived through that encounter and got to have a normal life afterwards. But when you switch from the shift of, this character was willing to do that. Oh. That's not proper storytelling to just have everything be bright and okay less than a minute later. It wasn't a minute later gameplay. Yeah. Well, even in cutscenes, it wasn't even that long. Well, you have to assume there was some sort of time. Uh, some yeah, time there was a time game. dilation in, in the story from there, but... but they, they also actually didn't spell out... And it's odd because they don't spell out exactly what happens to George. You have to start calling on the codec to find out what's going on. Right. They, you know something happens... And then you see partially cyborg George. Yep. And they kind of leave uh, they kind of leave it up into your, into your interpretation until you actually call in. 
Yeah, a lot of that game leads to you have to use the codec and talk to your companions to get the full story. Which, I will say the codec calls in that game are actually rather well done, and, I'm, and them being relegated to you can get them if you want to status as opposed to Metal Gear, like Metal Gear Solid uh, 1. Two, Where they'd four. always I, call I you? Really played, I never really played much of 3. I, for some reason, I couldn't stand 3. I think and the I, survival system put a lot of people off. Yeah, and I, and I know Snake is probably listening, going, what is wrong with this Yeehaw guy? 3 is the best in the series. It just... It's all right. He's on drugs right now. He'll be fine. Oh, okay. Well, then that's uh, Assuming. For him. But, but, oh, I just noticed what time it is. I probably should let you guys go because it, it appears to be about sign-off time for you Yep. Guys. We're getting close now. So. Yeah. I think we will cut it for now, but uh, we'd actually be more than happy to bring you back for a debate on uh, the Metal Gear franchise in the future, especially Rising, because that seems to be the odd man out. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah, I'm definitely willing to be the odd man out because it seems like most of the crew there either is... I I can't say, really. Yeah, I I liked the older Metal Gear games, as weird as that may sound, but whatevs. Okay. Yeah, thank I will you for catch calling. you guys later. Definitely, uh, if we want to have this uh, discussion, definitely get a hold of me. We'll catch you. All right. Thanks for calling in, Yeehaw. Take care. Right. Bye. Well, that was a nice surprise here. Indeed. And now I've only got a minute to wrap this up. So um, we will probably be recording another show while we are out in Las Vegas. I uh, don't know when exactly that's going to be posted to the site, but it'll get there eventually. Um don't actually know what we're going to be talking about probably stuff we're doing in vegas whatever we feel is appropriate that's basically what we do every week son yep uh i we hope that you've enjoyed this program it's presented in conjunction with wlra's to kill a dj fundraiser um raising money for advocate hope children's hospital family assistance fund uh serving sick children in the greater chicago area and the families who love them if you'd like to donate please anything helps you can run on over to tinyurl.com slash hope children's hospital and uh yeah thanks for tuning in we'll see you next week i'm pixie i'm sun and you've been listening to nerd talk